la caixa. But then another conspiracy theory becomes the truth, my friends. And it never ends. No, it never ends.
Philippians and Aaron 51. A secret code inside the Bible said I was. I love my UFOs and paranormal fun, as well as music. So I'm singing it like I should. But then another conspiracy theory becomes the truth, my friends. And it never ends. No, it never ends. With MK Ultra, I'll be an only true aware. Did Stanley Kubrick fake the moon landing alone on a film set? Or were the shadow people there? The Roswell aliens just fought the smiling man, I'm told. And his name was Cold. But I can't believe. the dark watchers found well, in a simulation don't you worry though the black knight satellite is so Yeah, 
I got stuck inside Mel's home with MK Ultra, I'm being only two away. Did Stanley Kubrick fake the moon landing alone on a film set? Or were the shadow people there? The Roswell aliens just fought the smiling man, I'm told, and his name was Cole. The dark watchers found well, in a simulation. Don't you worry, though. The black knight satellite is so All right, I guess we're going to do a show. I hear you. Thank you for watching the After Files live stream. This is not a professional production. We don't know why anyone watches this thing, but we're glad you do. And now, to kick off the show is everyone's favorite sidekick, the one, the only, Hecklefish. Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. Can see. Our troubles are all the same. You wanna be where everybody knows your name. You wanna go where people know. People are all the same. You wanna go where everybody knows your name. The After Files is streamed in front of a live audience. It's Thanksgiving. What time is it? It's 12, 8. I'm, I'm not prepared. This is not a professional operation. I apologize. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. The glasses, it's not the right magnification, so it's going to be like the early days, a lot of this. This is my home. There's Jenny back there. There's Eric, brother-in-law. There's Chris. We'll talk. Oh, I'm on the, that's trippy. <laughs> that's trippy. What's going on in the chat? Who's hiding from their family today? That's just a given. That's just a given. Happy Thanksgiving. Fu Man's here. Good to see you. Susan Parker is there. There's Kevin Smith. Big fan of your films. Hello, Sheeple. Kelly Murph. Good to see you. I can't see. There's Brandon Thor. Jeff Donaldson. Good to see you. CJ's at work. Working on Thanksgiving. Hi, Ness. Hi, Hillfire. Leila Licato. Me oh, you're all hiding. That's fair. Hey, Recovery. So, uh, so the first... Video we're going to do. I'm, so we're six hours today, and um, I'll pop in. I wonder what what do you think they're whispering about? I don't know. It's very conspiratorial. It is. It's very, very conspiratorial. conspiratorial. So we're gonna 
I'll just pop in and say hello in between the videos. I was thinking maybe an end of the world theme since it's the holidays, right? And um, I know half of us in the chat are just begging for the for the asteroid. So I was going to start with the Carrington event. And if there's anything specific you want to see, let me know. I'll drop a poll in the chat for you. Hello, hello, Scott H. Saying hello to Lizard people. I appreciate the uh, the super chats, everybody. That really helps. If you want to support the channel, a great way to do it is to become a Patreon member. That's our favorite. For as little as $3 a month, you get all kinds of perks. Access to two extra live streams a week just for Patreon members. Another great way to support is shop at thewifiles.com. Grab yourself some Wifiles gear. And remember, all of our mugs are 100% fistable. Happy Thanksgiving, Jane. Also in between, I'm going to switch my glasses. Hey, Joe, good to see you. Hecklefish for president. I agree. Nobody would vote for him. He tells the truth. Happy Thanksgiving from Croatia. Hey, Kentucky. Pete Ryder saying hi to Jen. You're very welcome, Fluffy. Glad you guys are here. So um, it's going to be janky. Things are going to break. It's going to be weird. But we're going to we're going to do our best. So hopefully we're keeping you company on Thanksgiving today. All right. And um, I don't know if the audio is going to work. We sh we're winging it. We're winging it. Victoria, you nod if the audio is working. A few minutes later. Okay, so that's going to work, <laughs> but I've got audio doubling. Oh, boy, it's live stream amateur hour again. That hurts my feelings because, you know, we're doing our best here. All right, Victoria, were you, were you hearing double audio on the, on the Carrington event? Were you, were you guys hearing double audio? Well, she's muted, but that's okay. Thanks, yeah, Tim. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. I only heard, I only heard, only heard okay. one line. All right. I'm going to play. You Tell me if the audio is double for you. All right. Are you hearing that audio? No. How about that? Nothing, guys, huh? You were able, you were able to hear the audio through there. Not the video. Victoria, can you? No. Okay. Just us. Just you. Try again. All right. Hang on. That's there. That's there. Because I'm even hearing. Yeah. The field was immediately overpowered and created chaos around the world. Yeah. Telegraph lines were shorting right. out in Europe and North America. 
Equipment was throwing sparks now? and some burst into flames. Telegraph operators were burned or All jolted right, so with electric audio, shocks. Means... The word went out to telegraph operators oh, to shut down, down the equipment. Yes. And they did, but even disconnected from their power supplies, everything still worked. Hey, Chad. All right. Mr. Ball and crossover. I don't know if Johnny's up for it. Okay, Angela starts says start over. I think she's right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. GoPro Joe is naked. That's fine. I'm not wearing pants either. Tammy could hear. But it looks like we're getting close. Hey, kids at home, if you want to learn how to do a professional live stream, watch something else. This ain't it. If this is making sense to anyone, then you really should stop smoking. Whatever it is that you're smoking. <laughs> Yikes. You call this a live stream? How are you not embarrassed? Yeah, no, I'm not hearing this. <laughs> At all? I have faith. How about that? So unprofessional. This isn't a live stream. This is a circus. <laughs> Laura, I'm getting hungry too. All right, the Carrington event. If you follow the channel, you know I'm I'm actually literally scared of, of this. All right, I'll see you in, see you in 15 minutes. On September 1st, 1859, a gold miner in Denver started his morning routine. He felt unusually tired, but shrugged it off as he prepared his coffee. He was used to waking up at sunrise, but noticed the sky was much brighter and redder than usual. Maybe a nearby fire, he wasn't sure. A few minutes later, his wife came downstairs and asked why he was up so early. Confused, he looked at the clock on the wall. It was 1 a.m. At the very same moment, the ship Southern Cross was sailing off the coast of South America when suddenly the seas turned violent. Waves lashed at the hull and hail pounded the deck. The water, reflecting the red sky above, seemed to turn to an ocean of blood. And that morning, an astronomer turned his telescope toward the sun and noticed something strange. And what happened next? was terrifying. Let's find out why. near the North Pole were visible in Miami and Cuba and as far south as Colombia. In the southern hemisphere, Aurora Australis were visible north of Brisbane. A few hours later, on September 2nd, the most powerful solar storm ever recorded crashed into the Earth's atmosphere. Our magnetic field was immediately overpowered and created chaos around the world. Telegraph lines were shorting out in Europe and North America. Stars, some some burst into flames. flames. Telegraph, telegraph operators, operators were burned, burned or, or jolted, jolted with, with electric, electric shocks. shocks. The, word the word went out to telegraph, telegraph operators to shut, shut down, down the equipment. equipment. They, did, they did, but even, even disconnected from their power, power supplies, supplies, everything still, still worked. worked. In, fact, In fact, telegraphs were more powerful, powerful than, than ever. ever. Nobody, Nobody had ever seen, seen anything like this before. before. This became, became known as the Carrington event. event. And at that time, scientists thought this was a unique phenomenon. Was it unique? Nope. It's, it's happened, happened before, before. It's, it's happened, happened since, since, and it, and it will, will happen, happen again. again. And when, and when it, it does, it could be the worst, worst natural disaster, disaster in human history. history. In 1859, the connection, connection between, between the sun and, and the Earth's magnetic, magnetic field, field wasn't, wasn't well understood. understood. But at, but at the, the same, same time Carrington saw the eruption, the Kew Observatory in London, London reported a large magnetic disturbance in the atmosphere. This allowed scientists to correctly link geomagnetic storms with solar
pushes billions of tons of superheated plasma into space at several million miles per hour. CMEs happen all over the sun's surface, and most of the time they drift harmlessly into space. But sometimes CMEs come our way. Small ones we don't notice. On the ground, we're fine. Our atmosphere absorbs the cosmic radiation, and our magnetic field deflects the sun's plasma into the poles, which fall through the atmosphere. Weather. So, and two or three times a day, but well, once or twice every hundred years, the sun creates superstorms that hit the earth. And when they do, the effects can range from inconvenient to catastrophic. There's evidence of solar superstorms going back a long time. Ice core samples show powerful solar storms hit the Earth several times between 7,000 and 5,000 BC. In 774 AD, an extreme solar storm called the Miyake event caused the largest rise in carbon 15 levels ever recorded. In 993 AD, the storm left evidence in tree trunks that archaeologists still use to date ancient wood materials. This is one of the ways they confirmed that the Norse arrived in North America 500 years before Columbus. In 1052, 1279, more storms more spikes in carbon. In 1582, 1730, and 1770, solar storms caused aurora to be seen all around the world, turning night into day. And there are dozens of reports throughout history, but in those reports, solar storms are nothing more than oddities. I'm sure they frightened some people who thought the world was ending or the gods were angry, but the storms didn't cause any damage. But when the Carrington event happened in 1859, Civilization was doing something new. We started using machines and electricity to operate them. And that's where the story goes from science lesson to Hollywood disaster movie. A solar storm can induce current in anything that conducts electricity. This could be the atmosphere, the ocean, and even certain types of rock, though conductivity is pretty low. And electrical wires? Solar storms love those. And modern civilization is absolutely covered by and dependent on millions of miles of wires that cover the Earth. A large enough solar storm can overload power grids, destroy transformers, and cause entire grids to fail. And this actually happened in 1989. The Earth was hit by a solar storm that disrupted radio signals across Russia. Oh, the Russians had to be annoyed. Well, they were. At first, they thought American spies were jamming their signals. went down, and suddenly, millions of people in Quebec province were put in total blackout for nine hours. In 2003, another storm put millions of people in the U.S. and Canada in darkness for 12 hours. And the solar storms of 1989 and 2003 were a fraction of the strength of the Carrington event. So, what would happen if we were hit with a storm as strong as, or stronger than the Carrington event? I'm guessing uh, not good. Not good at all. Picture this. You're on a family vacation driving across the country to see, uh... over a year's dose of radiation in an instant. Astronauts in space receive an even higher dose. Chances of developing cancer increase tenfold as the radiation has already begun unwinding strands of their DNA. This was just the initial burst, called the precursor stage. These high energy particles move at the speed of light, so there's not much warning. But a coronal mass ejection moves a little more slowly. It hasn't hit yet. The worst is yet to come. Solar radiation continues to pummel the Earth. The atmosphere is saturated by high-energy particles. 
The Earth's magnetic field stretches as the plasma tries to strip it away. You look at your dashboard. Your GPS is acting weird. It can't orient itself, and it loses signal altogether. But this is happening to every GPS system everywhere around the world. As radiation tears through thousands of satellites in orbit, shorting out their circuit and frying their electronics, this is more than just an inconvenient glitch. So it's going to be it's going to be one of one of this these live stream is a mess. Shows. You should be ashamed of yourself. Shame, shame, shame on you. I'm useless, and then it gets worse. By now, a few hours into the event, governments are aware of what's happening, but there's no way to communicate with the citizens. All telecommunications, including emergency services, go offline. Back in your car, you're on a call with a friend describing what's happening. Your friend also reports weird technical issues and mentions the stock market just went offline. But you're having trouble hearing them. Your phone keeps losing the call. And as people around the world all experience these strange events simultaneously, they saturate cell towers. But it doesn't matter. Nobody's phone can get a signal. Not even satellite phones work. After an hour or so, you start to get concerned and decide to pull off the highway. Maybe this. There's chaos because credit cards won't work. ATMs are offline. Well, can I use my Bitcoin? Nope. Your crypto wallet is dark. Hard drives around the world have been wiped clean. Bye bye blockchain. During these last few hours of confusion, solar radiation has continued to build in the ionosphere. The Earth's magnetic field is stretched hundreds of thousands of miles into space. And when the last of the sun's plasma passes through the Earth, once, then things get really bad. Power stations around the world are overwhelmed. The failures cascade through every country on Earth, leaving entire continents in darkness. Power lines and transformers are set ablaze. Network cables both above the ground and deep under the ocean go down all at once. The entire internet goes dark. Now back at the gas station, someone from your family complains that the restroom water isn't working. Turns out water is It up. So everybody just give us a minute. We're working on it. We'll get there. We don't normally stream from our house, so.
So once we get this all figured out, we'll start the episode over. Well, we don't have to start it over. We can ask the chat if they want to. Realized that was a stupid question as it was asking it. We can't count on the government. We absolutely cannot. Instead, we have to rely on ourselves and our local communities, just like we do before a hurricane or a tornado or an earthquake. Make sure your family has a readiness plan. Maintain a supply of food and water. You need thermal blankets, camp stoves, propane heaters in case the heat goes out. You need hygiene supplies, first aid kits, and a hand crank radio. Keep all these on hand all the time, just in case. Ooh, so you're saying become a prepper? Well, if that's what you want to call it. But being overprepared is better than not being prepared at all. Because it's just a matter of time before the lights go out. And when they do, there is no cavalry coming. In the end, the only one looking out for you and your family is you. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. My name is AJ, that's Hecklefish. This has been The Y-Files. If you had fun or learned anything, do me a favor and subscribe, comment, like, share. And special thanks to our Patreon members. You guys make this possible, and you're the best. Until next time, be safe, be kind, know that you are appreciated. Well, re restart it? It's, it's kind of a hot mess. Sarah says restart the vid. Yeah. On September 1st, 1859, right, a gold... Here? He's gone? ...but shrugged it off as he prepared his coffee. He was used to waking up at sunrise, but noticed the sky was much brighter and redder than usual. Maybe a nearby fire, he wasn't sure. A few minutes... At the very same moment, the ship Southern Cross was sailing off the coast of South America when suddenly the seas turned violent. Waves lashed at the hull and hail pounded the deck. The water, reflecting the red sky above, seemed to turn to an ocean of blood. And that morning, an astronomer turned his telescope toward the sun and noticed something strange. What happened next? On September 1st, astronomer Richard Carrington was studying the sun when he noticed something unusual. At about 11 a.m., he was observing a huge sunspot, about 10 times the size of the Earth. Then suddenly a flash of intense white light burst out of the spot. What Carrington didn't realize was he had become the first eyewitness of a major coronal mass ejection, or CME, and it was headed straight for Earth. 17 hours later, the night sky in North America lit up like the day. Aurora Borealis. were visible north of Brisbane. A few hours later, on September 2nd, the most powerful solar storm ever recorded crashed into the Earth's atmosphere. Our magnetic field was immediately overpowered and created chaos around the world. Telegraph lines were shorting out in Europe and North America. Equipment was throwing sparks and some burst into flames. Telegraph operators were burned or jolted with electric shocks. The word went out to telegraph operators to shut down the equipment. And they did, but even disconnected from their power supplies, everything still worked. In fact, telegraphs were more powerful than ever. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. This became known as the Carrington event. And at the time, scientists thought this was a unique phenomenon. Well, was it unique? Nope. It's happened before, it's happened since, and it will happen again. And when it does, it could be the worst natural disaster in human history. In 1859, the connection between the sun and the Earth's magnetic field wasn't well understood. But at the same time Carrington saw the eruption, the Kew Observatory in London reported a large magnetic disturbance in the ionosphere. This allowed scientists to correctly link geomagnetic storms with solar activity like flares, solar wind, and coronal mass ejections. The sun's outer atmosphere, the corona, is structured by strong magnetic fields. Sometimes these fields become twisted, 
slowly building up energy like winding a spring. When these magnetic fields finally realign, that energy is released, which causes a solar flare. First, 1859, 1859, a gold miner in Denver started his morning routine. He felt unusually tired, but shrugged it off compared his coffee. He was used to waking up at sunrise, but noticed the sky was much brighter and redder than usual. Maybe a nearby fire, he wasn't sure. A few minutes later, his wife came downstairs and asked why he was up so early. Confused, he looked at the clock on the wall. It was 1 a.m. At the very same moment, the ship Southern Cross was sailing off the coast of South America when suddenly the seas turned violent. Waves lashed at the hull and hail pounded the deck. The water, reflecting the red sky above, seemed to turn to an ocean of blood. And that morning, an astronomer turned his telescope toward the sun and noticed something strange. And what happened next was terrifying. Let's find out why. On September 1st, astronomer Richard Carrington was studying the sun when he noticed something unusual. At about 11 a.m., he was observing a huge sunspot, about 10 times the size of the Earth. Then suddenly a flash of intense white light burst out of the spot. What Carrington didn't realize was he had become the first eyewitness of a major coronal mass ejection, or CME, and it was headed straight for Earth. 17 hours later, the night sky in North America lit up like the day. Aurora Borealis, typically seen near the North Pole, were visible in Miami and Cuba and as far south as Colombia. In the Southern Hemisphere, Aurora Australis were visible north of Brisbane. A few hours later, on September 2nd, the most powerful solar storm ever recorded crashed into the Earth's atmosphere. Our magnetic field was immediately overpowered and created chaos around the world. Telegraph lines were shorting out in Europe and North America. Equipment was throwing sparks and some burst into flames. Telegraph operators were burned or jolted with electric shocks. The word went out to telegraph operators to shut down the equipment, and they did, but even disconnected from their power supplies, everything still worked. In fact, telegraphs were more powerful than ever. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. This became known as the Carrington event. And at the time, scientists thought this was a unique phenomenon. Well, was it unique? Nope. It's happened before, it's happened since, and it will happen again. And when it does, it could be the worst natural disaster in human history. In 1859, the connection between the sun and the Earth's magnetic field wasn't well understood. But at the same time Carrington saw the eruption, the Kew Observatory in London reported a large magnetic disturbance in the ionosphere. This allowed scientists to correctly link geomagnetic storms with solar activity like flares, solar wind, and coronal mass ejections. The sun building up energy like winding a spring. When these magnetic fields finally realign, that energy is released, which causes a solar flare or an ejection. And they're not the same things? Well, flares and CMEs can happen at the same time, but they aren't the same thing. A solar flare is basically a flash of light. They're relatively small and take place in the lower solar atmosphere. CMEs, on the other hand, are huge sometimes bigger than the sun itself. A CME launches billions of tons of superheated plasma into space at several million miles per hour. CMEs happen all over the sun's surface, and most of the time they drift harmlessly into space. But sometimes CMEs come our way. Small ones we don't notice. On the ground, we're fine. Our atmosphere absorbs the cosmic radiation, and our magnetic field deflects the sun's plasma into the poles, which fall through the atmosphere, causing auroras. But just like the Earth's weather can vary from gentle to extreme, so does the weather on the sun. On average, CMEs happen two or three times a day. But once or twice every hundred years, the sun creates superstorms that hit the Earth. And when they do, the effects can range from inconvenient to catastrophic. There's evidence of solar superstorms going back a long time. Ice core samples show powerful solar storms hit the Earth several times between 7000 and 5000 BC. In 774 AD, an extreme solar storm called the Miyake event caused the largest rise in carbon-14 levels ever recorded. In 993 AD, a storm left evidence in tree trunks that archaeologists still use to date ancient wood materials. And this is one of the ways they confirm that the Norse arrived in North America 
500 years before Columbus. 1052, 1279, more storms, more spikes in carbon. In 1582, 1730, and 1770, solar storms caused aurora to be seen all around the world, turning night into day. And there are dozens of reports like this throughout history. But in those reports, the solar storms are nothing more than oddities. Why didn't people freak out? Humans don't like change. Well, sure, they frightened some people who thought the world was ending or the gods were angry, but the storms didn't cause any damage. But when the Carrington event happened in 1859, civilization was doing something new. We started using machines and electricity to operate them. And that's where the story goes from science lesson the Hollywood disaster movie. A solar storm can induce current in anything that conducts electricity. This can be the atmosphere, the ocean, and even certain types of rock, though conductivity is pretty low. But electrical wires? Solar storms love those. And modern civilization is absolutely covered by, and dependent on, millions of miles of wires that cover the Earth. A large enough solar storm can overload power grids, destroy transformers, and cause entire grids to fail. And this actually happened in 1989. The Earth was hit by a solar storm that disrupted radio signals across Russia. Oh, the Russians had to be annoyed. Oh, they were. At first, they thought American spies were jamming their signals. Then they noticed their satellites were unresponsive. Several satellites were drifting for hours. The space shuttle Discovery suffered sensor malfunctions. The Toronto Stock Exchange went down, and suddenly, millions of people in Quebec province were put in total blackout for nine hours. In 2003, another storm put millions of people in the US and Canada in darkness for 12 hours. And the solar storms of 1989 and 2003 were a fraction of the strength of the Carrington event. So, what would happen if we were hit with a storm as had to be annoyed. Oh, they were. At first, they thought American spies were jamming their signals. Then they noticed their satellites were unresponsive. Several satellites were drifting for hours. The space shuttle Discovery suffered sensor malfunctions. The Toronto Stock Exchange went down. And suddenly, millions of people in Quebec province were put in total blackout for nine hours. In 2003, another storm put millions of people in the US and Canada in darkness for 12 hours. And the solar storms of 1989 and 2003 were a fraction of the strength of the Carrington event. So, what would happen if we were hit with a storm as strong as, or stronger than the Carrington event? Picture this. You're on a family vacation driving across the country to see, uh... Biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. Biggest ball of twine in Minnesota. Fine. Minnesota. Minnesota. What? Might be Weird Al's best song. Anyway, you've got the radio on, but it starts to get staticky. This is how it begins. In the ionosphere, shortwave radio has become overwhelmed with electromagnetic interference. Signals aren't getting through. No VHF, no UHF. Uh, UHF might be Weird Al's best movie. You're a little obsessed. Yeah, I'm obsessed. Ship to shore communication is disrupted. Planes using VLF signals are knocked off course. 
air traffic control goes dark and planes go blind. Now it's a good thing you're on a driving vacation because airline passengers flying high in the atmosphere just received over a year's dose of radiation in an instant. Astronauts in space receive an even higher dose. Chances of developing cancer increase tenfold as the radiation has already begun unwinding strands of their DNA. This was just the initial burst called the precursor stage. These high energy particles move at the speed of light so there's not much warning. But a coronal mass ejection moves a little more slowly. It hasn't hit yet. The worst is yet to come. Solar radiation continues to pummel the Earth. The atmosphere is saturated by high energy particles. The Earth's magnetic field stretches as the plasma tries to strip it away. People around the world all experience these strange events simultaneously. They saturate cell towers, but it doesn't matter. Nobody's phone can get a signal. Not even satellite phones work. After an hour or so, you start to get concerned and decide to pull off the highway. flash of intense white light burst out of the spot. What Carrington didn't realize was he had become the first eyewitness of a major coronal mass ejection, or CME, and it was headed straight for Earth. 17 hours later, the night sky in North America lit up like the day. Aurora Borealis, typically seen near the North Pole, were visible in Miami and Cuba and as far south as Colombia. In the Southern Hemisphere, Aurora Australis were visible north of Brisbane. A few hours later, on September 2nd, the most powerful solar storm ever recorded crashed into the Earth's atmosphere. Our magnetic field was immediately overpowered and created chaos around the world. Telegraph lines were shorting out in Europe and North America. 
Equipment was throwing sparks and some burst into flames. Telegraph operators were burned or jolted with electric shocks. The word went out to telegraph operators to shut down the equipment. And they did, but even disconnected from their power supplies, everything still worked. In fact, telegraphs were more powerful than ever. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. This became known as the Carrington event. And at the time, scientists thought this was a unique phenomenon. Well, was it unique? Nope. It's happened before, it's happened since, and it will happen again. And when it does, it could be the worst natural disaster in human history. In 18... Am I double? Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me just once? Just once, huh? I think maybe we should go stand by for a minute and let me mess around with it. Or, uh, or no watch along, just hang out. Danny, I'm not drunk yet. I'm going to work on it. Hey, Alex, I see you. Rick, you want to wait? So you're hearing me once, and then about a few seconds later, you're hearing me again? I'm going to mess with it. I'm going to mess with it, and I'll be back in a bit. Devil eggs. So he's in the other room trying to get everything fixed. Like I said, we don't typically stream from our home, so it's been a little crazy. I appreciate everybody hanging in there. Hey, Lady Kathy, sixty-three. Nice to see you. I know devil eggs are awesome, aren't they, Elaine? Yes, it's a cooking show. Well, this is what doing a cooking show instead. Yeah, um, Octo, I appreciate that. It's like I said, we, we have a whole setup at the studio. And AJ has tested this um I don't know, five, six times. And then of course, right as we start the stream. But this happens, and we're not quite sure where the doubling is coming from, but we will get it figured out eventually. What's everybody? Ha, honey, James, I will kick you out. What's everybody watching or cooking in 
They're at their house. Or have you eaten? So let me tell everybody what, uh, let's, let's talk in the chat about what, what we're doing food wise. Thank you, BDWHQ for hanging in. We're trying. Benjamin made a turkey burger. All right. And you're welcome for talking to the world on our holidays. We're appreciative of every, every single one of you guys. 100% sure. You're cooking breakfast carnivore, RDL, beef and eggs. Mmm, that sounds good. Two giant ribeyes, breakfast burritos, doing some leftovers. This is good. Your turkey didn't thaw completely, Petty Possum. That sucks. Cooking a stew in the slow cooker. Nice. Sweet potato casserole and stuffing. Yeah, I got to start the stuffing here shortly. Our turkey's in the oven, um, but it's got quite a while to go. It's probably got another three and a half hours to go. Southern fried apples with bourbon. Mmm. I know AJ's probably like, when can we break out the booze? Yes, my cup, that cup is huge. This is my Diet Coke cup. Yep. No green and bean casserole, Liza Joe. We're going to make that here. Well, Chris, I'm, I'm happy to hear that for you. Oh, no, Annalisa. No, wait. Somebody fried their turkey. Uh, didn't fry their turkey, but it, it uh... sorry, I'm trying to read the chat and McDeviled eggs at the same time. Bologna sandwiches. Okay. Honestly, if we didn't have family here, AJ and I would probably be doing something super easy. Um, it's hard to cook Thanksgiving for just two people, you know? You got your plate. Oh, you know what? While I have you guys, let me talk about a couple of these things. Just a second. So we're starting our Black Friday sale in just a few, um, in, or after midnight. We have our sweater, our Hacklefish Ugly Christmas sweater. Super cute. They're going to be 20% um, off, I believe, uh, starting in the morning. AJ shaking her head. Or AJ, Victoria shaking her head, yes. So everybody, your Merry Fishmas sweater. It's super cute too because the little, the snowmen are aliens. It's super, it's super fun. And then we have, let me get them out of the box. Hecklefish slippers. Oh my God, they're amazing. You guys, these are so comfortable. So these are all also going on sale. Black Friday. 20% off. Amazing. So I'll put the sweater on later so everybody can see that. Yes, it's so cute. Hang on, I got to get a glass. Yes, Angel, it's a telethon. <laughs> I know the slippers are awesome. They they really are comfortable. I would tell you guys, they're comfortable. Um, does it come in five XXL? The sweater, I'm not sure what all of the sizes are, but they'll they're going on. I think yeah. Wait, check the site tomorrow because they're going to be 20% off. Scott, thank you. I hope you have a blessed day as well. Um, AJ, <laughs> Gilbert, AJ is over in the corner of the kitchen trying to fix the stream so that we can actually have a watch along and show you guys some episodes. Oh, well, thank you, Mush. I actually decided to fix my hair today. You're having uh, low 
is having turkey roll-ups. Um, can't wait for the slippers. Oh, thank you for the comment about the house. Jen, maybe AJ needs an old-fashioned to help figure out the... Was that Zeb? Was that Zeb that said that? Yes. Hey, Zeb. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, he might need an old-fashioned to help figure out the audio. But then after that, we won't even know that it's not... We won't be able to tell it's doubled. Um, I'm not sure if Gina will be on in a little bit or not. We'll see. Um, screen was stuck. Hi from Lithuania. Hi, Oni. Welcome. The kitty's name, well, it depends. You guys probably see Nugget. He's running around here. The other cat hides. He's not a big, he doesn't like a lot of people. CM, I'm glad that um, we were able to all be together today too. And you are very, very welcome. Dave, I see you. You don't need to comment a lot before I notice. There's just a lot of stuff going on. A lot of people, a lot of, a lot of comments happening. Um, Rustin sees a pastry bag. I am making deviled eggs and it's just easier to get them into the eggshells in a pastry bag. Um, what? Mush edits, I notice you. I see you, hello. Do we have throw blankets? Yes, we do. We just um, put up some throw blankets. I think there's at least one. Super cool. Um, audio fixed, Ray, we're working on it. I mean, it's fixed right now. The biggest problem that we're having is when we try to, to stream the episode so we can watch along. Yeah, Stephanie, I typically use a Ziploc for my eggs too, but I decided to be fancy today. Well, you know, Daniel, I'm sorry that we're losing folks left and right, but we're doing the best we can. So, Dave, thank you. I think you're amazing as well. And Robert, I appreciate you cooling your pits. Life is good. Um, Hecklefish, you know, he is such a pain sometimes. Um, he may show up later. I'm not sure if he's going to or not. It's not in his contract, so he can be difficult on holidays. Um, happy Thanksgiving, Daniel. Brandon Bell, happy Thanksgiving to you, too. You're in Denver. Uh, well, Rob, we're glad you joined us. We're going to try to enjoy our day, too, Rich. Thank you for that. The hoodie that we wear that you don't see in the shop, um, it just depends. We have a special hoodie that's a team hoodie for the people that are mods on the channel. Um, and that's not a for sale hoodie. That's a, you gotta work, work for us. So Somebody said earlier that they listened to the podcast and they really liked it. So that's awesome. Any, you guys know that we have a podcast? Y Files Operation Podcast, um, Spotify, Apple. It's super. On Wednesdays, we do like a deep dive on a topic we've done before, or we do um, something that we can't talk about on YouTube because we'll get demonetized. So I'd like to test this, but you're in the same room. Oh, well. Oh, what, cranberries? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How many people? <laughs> All, All right, right, you hear me? Oh, my. my, 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 my. Oh, I guess you're still alone. We'll get it sorted out. That's right. 
So do you want me to turn my sound off so you can test your sound? I can still hear it. I just want to hear it from double it. So if you hear me at all. I don't hear you at all. But I bet you hear that. I do. But you hear a lot. Let me hear. I just need to my mic. Yellow. 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 <laughs> so I do realize that, you know, two mics and all of that, but I had mine turned off. So I just turned it back on. No sound. Do we hear now? Me? Okay. Let's see. We are gonna get this all figured out. Happy Thanksgiving. My cat is climbing into a box. He likes to do that. Reverb. What am I hearing, AJ? I'm hearing the song in the other room. Yes, that's the standby song. Okay. I'm making deviled eggs. And now they're ready, and I'm going to chill them for just a few minutes. I'm doing a cooking show. I'm doing a cooking show. And now I'll start stuffing. I know, a Thanksgiving. <laughs> what the cranberries actually pop do they really mm -hmm. have you guys made fresh cranberry sauce before do you know that the cranberries actually pop i did not know that i typically just make the can so you know i don't know what to do there um with this I am Keith Penner. Yes, I am Mrs. AJ. For everybody that doesn't know that, I'm Jen, Mrs. AJ. Um, who's cooking the turkey? My brother-in-law and I are cooking the turkey. So we brined it for 24 hours. 
and then we rinsed it this morning and then now we're doing the um, cheesecloth butter thing where you soak the cheesecloth in butter and you put it on top of the turkey. You baste every 30 minutes. So, yes. So we're excited about that. I did use paprika on the eggs, yes. There you go. How, Johnny, how did the turkey make it through the Van Allen belt? Um, it was really far apart and it went really fast. That's how. Gilbert, I am not hecklefish. Hecklefish is hecklefish. So that's Eric. Everybody wave at Eric. It's my brother-in-law. Yes, this is Turkey Talk with Jen. Hello. Hello. John Roberts, yes, this is Mrs. Y-Files. Hello, hello. Um, let's see. Thank you, Scott W., very much. Oh, I guess I could read some Super Chats. That'd yeah, be a, Super Chats. That'd be a good idea. I could do that. Read Super Chats. All right, hang on. I'm making progress. He said he's making progress. So. Bacon chip, you like. Um, thank you. So I'll go over here. Before you start Super Chatting, how do you want the bacon pack? Um, just in just in little pieces because I'm just going to brown it. All right. So let's see here. Risa, Super Chats. Uh, Mr. Qu Quaster Hopper for $20. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. I can even put these up here. I forgot that, like, this is a whole thing. We haven't done one of these in a while. Um, Mr. Quaster Hopper for $20. Thank you so very, very much. Much appreciated. Paul Rohrbacher for $200. Woohoo! Thank you, Paul Rohrbacher. Rohrbach. I said Rohrbacher, didn't I? It's been a long morning already. Paul says, happy Thanksgiving. Save me a turkey leg. Also consider your own super chat. Well, Paul, thank you so much for putting the little link in there for everyone. Much appreciated. I want to put this... Put up whatever you want to put up. Ike Lee's. Let me, let me hear that. No. You want to hear anything? Nope. Uh, Keith Ike Lee. Oh, wait. Nope. Hey, happy Thanksgiving, yo. Keith and Tasha here. So thankful for the channel. We are thankful for you, Eichleys. Long, long time supporters of the channel. Much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Fantastic Forager. Um, Flight MH370 was another commodity exchange. Fantastic. We have been doing some research on an episode on, that's my sister, on MH370, but we can't, uh, we can't do it on YouTube. We'll have to do it on the podcast. Um, it might, the topic might be a little, a little much for YouTube, but we'll see. Um, we'll work on that. What the hell am I doing up here by myself? Hey, beautiful. Unmute your mic. Yeah. <laughs> that would help. We haven't there done these go. in a while. Hi. Woo! Everybody say hello to Victoria. Dogs say hello. <laughs> Hi, guys. Hello. Um, can, Melanie Sims says, can we do something on the Tower of Babel? You know, we really like doing the Bible stories. They're a lot of fun. We've got a good one coming up at the end of this year. Mm -hmm. um, that is like people that were like that are the real historical figures that had like, um, I don't know, they were mentioned in the Bible, but by a different name. So they think that they're the same people. So that'll be interesting. Does Hecklefish yeah. celebrate Thanksgiving? Yes, he does. He does. 
Like he loves uh he loves turkey. Yeah. <laughs> um so happy. All right. So let me try should try the missing 411 style of show. Uh Scott Boyd, so we're gonna be doing the what files starting next year, and that's true mm -hmm. crime. And we're gonna talk about uh we're gonna do missing 411 stories there, which would be a lot of fun. So, I mean, not fun. That's a weird way to describe it because, you know, it's missing people. But it's uh, it's going to be good. So that'll be the What Files. And I'm going to host that one. I'm very excited about it. You're so excited. Yay. Um, who does Hecklefish's voice? Hecklefish does Hecklefish's voice. Who yes. does your voice? He demands. So. Well, him. Mind of Mahoney. Let's see. I haven't gotten to all the super chats yet. I just started. So I'll get there. Hang on. All right. Um, let me go back over here. Multiple people reporting on a singular event differently is actually quite common during encounters. It's a feature, not a bug. Um. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's what they say, like, with crime and stuff. Like, eyewitness accounts are some of the most unreliable, like, testimony. Because yeah. people, especially when you're in a heightened state of emotion, it's very, very, you know, common for people to remember things differently. So. Absolutely. Different, different. Um, thank you, UWU. Matthew Quillen for 420. <laughs> I see what you did there. Happy Turkey Day. Stuff deeper than Mel's hole. There you go. <laughs> there you go. So question in the chat. Do you guys stuff the turkey? Do you make the turkey separate? Do you stuff the turkey, but then throw that turkey away and then or throw that stuffing away and then make set? I have a weird thing about stuffing a turkey full of stuffing and then eating that stuffing. What, what is the weird? I don't know. Something about putting the stuffing in the raw bird. Yeah. And then, then letting it cook in the raw bird. I thought you had to cook it and then put it. No? Yeah, I can't. So I just eat it. I do it separately. <laughs> so not like it. Um, let's see. We've always done separate. Yeah, me too. Okay. Christian for five dollars, uh, whatever those are, or five whatever. What is that? Is that uh, uh, pounds? What is that? Hello and happy Thanksgiving, AJ and Hecklefish at the Y Files. It's your first live. Perfect birthday present. Thirty nine years old. Happy birthday, Christian! Woo! Happy birthday. <laughs> Glad to have you have you with us. Uh, Crazy Ken's $5. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you too. Thank you very much, Ken. We appreciate that. Uh, Christian, I just did that one. That's weird. Oh, oh no. Did I accidentally touch that? No, you didn't. He gave two. Thank you, Christian, oh. for five more of those. Totally mm -hmm. hooked. Binged almost every Y Files episode the last two weeks. Best channel ever. Well, nice. thank you very much. We like it. We think it's pretty darn cool. Uh, Susan Parker, 1999, no comment, no nothing. Just here's a 20. Thank you very much. We appreciate you for that. And we like the comments too, but you know, yeah. there you go. That's Susan Parker. She's a no nonsense one. She just says, here it is. <laughs> Longhorn <laughs> Mellow for $5. Also no nonsense. Thank you very much. Uh, Sebastian, there we, you know, we've got a lot of people here just throw, throw in the dough, two uh, <coughs> of those pound thingies. Thank you. Much appreciate those you guys. Things. Really, really appreciate you spending your Thanksgiving with us and, and uh, yeah. hanging out, supporting the channel. It means a lot. Uh, Paul <laughs> is back for $10. <coughs> Sorry. Victoria, you read. I think I've done a few too many super chats because your kitchen is nicer than mine. 
Paul. Paul is a huge supporter of the channel, and that's funny. You're bad. Let's see. Phil, it's time for the Anunnaki. It is time. We've had a couple of scripts written. Um, we're we just want a certain angle, and we just we keep deciding differently every time we get the script back. And so now we're pretty we're very close to getting the Anunnaki out. Uh, that's just one of his favorites, and he's putting a lot of effort in it. Yeah, we make sure we do it right. With these type yep. of episodes where a lot of people have done them, we want to make sure we're bringing something. New and different that you're not seeing in every episode. So we will get there. And Paul, a hundred hours to do each video because we're finding that Wi Files thing. Yes. And I saw your comment. Oh, that you? Who? Me? (laughs) That was me. Well, Gino calling in. (laughs) Um, I'll check back with him in a minute. All right. Uh, Eric Couric, $5 super sticker. Woohoo. Thank you very, very much. David Gibbons. I want to, I want to try it. Try it. Try it. Okay. It's tricky since we're in the same room, but let's, let's see what happens. I'm going to mute myself and then I'm going to play the video. Okay. Video. Yes, they were flying quite high. How high we couldn't tell because we couldn't get anywhere near their altitude. But they were either very large craft way up or smaller craft still well above what we could get to. He can recall hundreds of reports made by fellow pilots that were confirmed by radar. Cooper even testified before the United Nations. It worked! Woo-hoo! Okay, so he stopped it. I was like, wait a minute. No. <laughs> All right. Nobody move over in that house. <laughs> All right. Oh, my gosh. Thank you guys so much for okay. staying around. <laughs> I knew he'd do it. We are getting there, you guys. We are getting there. David Gibbons, happy Thanksgiving to you, too. Thank you for the $5. That's amazing. No. I just got kicked out. We can't talk in the same. Kicked out. Maybe shut off. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go in the other room because he wants to get on that. Right. I got to shut this off. Yikes. You call this a live stream? How are you not embarrassed? No, I can't hear him. Don't hear you. We don't hear you. Can't hear you. Yeah, I I was telling Eva, I, I wasn't trying to be mean. It's just if we're in the same oh. room, it's, it's all echoey. Yeah. Oh. But you guys are hearing me, right? Yes. All right. I'm going to take another shot. You hearing me still? Mm-hmm. Yes. All right. Let's find that. Let's find this. That's fat COVID AJ there. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the size of that I have gotten a couple of on that. <laughs> about this now as sightings of the black knight satellite piled up over the years right, it so became increasingly difficult to deny that something was up there so the bigger questions are what is it why is it here so and what does it want test, all, we, we would get that in answer in 1973. duncan lunnan a researcher from scotland went back and analyzed all the lde data compiled from the norway this lunnan found a pattern and in that pattern a message. And in that message, nope. a map. In a 1970. 1970- oh. okay. We're gone. All right. Tell me. Tell me what you were hearing. Well, right now we're not hearing anything, but the video is not playing. Yeah, it's, right. but you don't hear me. Yes, I hear we you hear talking you. right now. 
Can't you hear me? But yes, I don't hear you. But the video was the video doubled. And not it's that not I could playing. hear. It, it wasn't. It, it wasn't. It, it was okay. Yeah, when it was playing. All right, I'm going to take another another risk here. All right, you still hear me? Yeah. Yes. Satellite. London had gone back to the LDE data and noticed variations that might indicate a code. So he put the data on a graph. On one axis was the time delay. Is that working? Yes. Yes. Okay, so here's the catch is I can't, I can't hear you girls. Oh. oh, we don't need to be up here. What? Yeah, we can go. <laughs> what? We can <laughs> leave. <laughs> we... <laughs> All right, we were in a black night satellite. Yeah. All right, let me let me see what's going on in the chat. I mean, what what, what should we play? Scott, well, I appreciate that we're all in this together. People want you to start the video over which, again. Which one? Right now we have the Black Knight satellite up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it was a Carrington event. They want you to. You want to go over. back to Carrington event? <laughs> It's cursed. It's cursed. Yeah, it's let's cursed. not do that. Y'all watch the worst it on your own, please. Worst Wi-Fi stream is better than most other channels. Best. Moon. Oh, play. Um, <laughs> the moon is fake. Can you play the 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 moon That's being one of my the favorite um, the satellite? All right, hang on. That's a good story. I love the yeah. ride. The hollow moon. Yeah. Uh, yes. Alien bases. Moon landing was moon landing was fake. Mm. Feet on your no, soul. No, it's fake way moon. back. It's it's over a year. All right, let me let me look for it. Hollow moon. I'm annoyed that I can't hear you though. There, there it is. Oh yeah, that's right. He can't hear us. <laughs> this episode. All right, you guys are able to hear that, right? Yep. We doubled? No. How about now? This is this is We're good? Yeah. Yeah. She's so nodding yes. Jen, can you say hi? Yes. All right, because I, I have to like back out one step at a time. So now I can hear you guys, and I can't hear myself. Nothing's okay. doubled. I, I'm... No. Okay, was that doubled, the surf shark? No, I, I didn't, didn't, hear, didn't hear, it. hear it. Oh. I can't hear it. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. <sighs> Stella, thank you so much. Very much appreciated. This is, it's stressful. <laughs> yeah, but we know he's working as hard as he can. <laughs> he's determined. He's good. Yeah, we can't hear that. You able to hear that? I can hear you. I can't hear the video. And now so we're Isaiah was asking what we're using to stream. It's not we're using the same setup. We always use um, StreamYard, but we're streaming from our house instead of from the studio, which we normally do. And so it's just you know gremlins hop in. Paul, thank you. You're amazing. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um Gilbert his wife wants to know who's cooking. Um I'm doing some cooking. My brother-in-law is doing a lot of the cooking. 
Uh, that's it. That's what we got. Thanks, Nicholas. We'll see you later. We're gonna we're gonna be here all day. Um. Thank you, Todd. We appreciate it a lot. Yeah, you know, that's the funny thing is that not every, <laughs> it's kind of fun to see that not everything goes the way that it's supposed to go. Like, this is how, this is how things happen. Okay, okay, that was, that was funny. Stardate 100946 .44. The After Files live stream has proven itself once again to be extremely unprofessional. You don't hear us, right? I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Is this making sense to anyone? Please punch me in the face. I want to have fun too. <laughs> right? <laughs> All right. I, 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 I got to tinker. I got to tinker. <laughs> there he goes. He can't help, but he's got a tinker. So that's why he always says, you know, this is not professional, all that stuff. It, But this is... Like, this is our Thanksgiving, you guys. So you're just, you're hanging out with us at house, at our house, and we're cooking. Victoria's at home. Um, that's what live is about. So that's why, you know, I kind of hopped on and started making deviled eggs for you guys. So you weren't just sitting there hearing the double sound over and over and over again. But um, yeah, so... Welcome uh, to to uh, the the joy. What is the kitty's name? Um, the kitty's name is Nugget. Is he around? Oh, geez, Louise. Sorry, oh, it's Nugget around. So we were Aww. digging in this cabinet for extra uh, cords and things. This is not how it normally looks. <laughs> no, it's not. Ah! What is back there? There we go. That looks a little better. Um, let's see. What else? What else we got going on? Can we have a Victoria story hour? I don't know. Can we? Oh, God. I'm not really made for the camera, okay? This is forced. <laughs> oh, that's I'm not joking. true. I know, Rob. I love watching her laugh as well. It's very, very fun. <laughs> Uh, let's see. The curse video. Somebody asked what the curse video was. We were watching a video about the Carrington event, which we were trying. I guess is a huge solar storm. Yes, that where the sun ejects a massive yes. amount of radiation and it hits Earth and knocks right. Out so yeah, so that basically ends everything. Why is MH three seventy too much for the YouTube? So. YouTube can be really picky and touchy about certain topics. So anything that gets a little too much into what they consider conspiracy or certain words you can't use, things like that, um, they will demonetize the video. Part of it is also because it's it's a fairly new thing that happened. And so, it, yeah, I mean, you just have to be careful what you put up on YouTube. That's why people are saying, no, Gino's not there. He's going to be here shortly, but I don't know that he's going to do a story hour. Um, I mean, he's going to be here at our house shortly, but I don't think uh, he's going to do a story hour today. Um, but don't miss next week's so yes, next week's going to be so good. It's going to be so good. Um, but like JFK assassination, like we can't really do that on on YouTube. And there's just a although few they're starting things. to, I'm seeing a lot more videos up about it, and I'm going. They hmm, are. I wonder they're how they're better. doing. Yeah, so mm -hmm. maybe we can at least do it on the podcast. <laughs> it's getting better. They've also eased up a little bit on some t stuff that I'm excited about for the what files because it used to be really hard to monetize true crime channels because there's certain words that you can't mention yeah you can't use there's certain other things that you can't say 
but they've eased up on that a little bit. If you are, if you have a channel where you're using, you're doing it for, you're talking about it for, um, education or informational sake, gotcha. um, they're going to allow you to, to say those things and, and still be considered what they consider, uh, advertiser friendly. So that's the yeah. hardest part is that they don't necessarily like it's it's just hard to get advertisers on the channel. Um let us know the plan for today's proceedings, Stella. The plan was supposed to be <laughs> we'll watch a video. The AJ will come on after and talk about it. Then we'll watch another video. And then people AJ will be come cooking on and Mary in the it. background. <laughs> and yeah, and you'll see us like doing thanksgiving and all of those things um but uh it's it's been a little little bit of technical difficulties so yeah <laughs> Whoops. Um, yeah but it's it's getting there it's getting better um we will hopefully hopefully get get to that point uh shortly i hear other cooking happening I see AJ looking at the computer. Danny, yes, it's the Jen and Vic meet and greet story hour. And thank you for our kitchen. saying you love the kitchen. I do too. It's really nice. <laughs> yes, Gail Barclay, there is going to be a where files. There's going to be uh, who, what, where, when, why, and how files. We're going to do all of them. So where files is going to be like a travel channel. In my mind, it's like... AJ going and seeing like the most ridiculous, like tourist attraction in every state, like uh, <laughs> the biggest ball of twine in Minnesota, you know, um, the where that, so that's the where files, the when files is history, uh, who files is going to be, uh, you know, biography. Well, probably also with that one have like, guests on and and uh so that'll be a lot of fun um what files is crime the how files is going to be uh like a science channel for kids so how to do things for kids and did i miss anything uh no who what we've where? got to get busy on making the production schedule for the what it's going to be there uh, before yes. we know it. Yes, we so do. It's going we're gonna to have be... to start asking people which ones they want to hear. Right. So um, that'll be a lot of fun. History Channel gets well. CB part of the reason History Channel gets away with JFK is because History Channel is a History Channel is just repurposing its own content. Yep. So. And, and they're also a network. So it's not, um, they're not as concerned about not being able to have Sponsored. advertisers show on their channel so that their channel can make money because they're the history channel. So they're just, they put, you know, they use their YouTube channel as basically as a, a way to get people to go watch the history channel, you know? So it's advertising for them. So they don't really care if their video gets a bunch of outside advertisers on it because they're already a channel. Um, yeah. It's for the independent creators, like what we do. Uh, yes, Charlotte, they're all going to have their separate channels. Everybody's going to, each, each one is going to have their own. Um, but hello, James. Skirm. Sky, sky, <laughs> sky, 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 sky. Anyway, so we're very excited about it. Very. Somebody said this is going to, you know, watch out. It's going to be uh, like NCIS, uh, different versions of the show is going to be overkill. But look, NCIS is just NCIS. So it's just always NCIS, whether you're in Miami or whether you're in <laughs> yeah. Los Angeles or whatever. These are all different topics. So we'll see. 
We'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um, let's see what else we got. Well, I'm glad that this made your day. So I, <laughs> I, I yay. <laughs> right. Um, at home with the Y files. That's right. Who needs football? What's my favorite video? Um, oh, I like a lot of them. Um, I really like the Nostradamus video because it's a lot of fun. Like it's a little bit different than the videos that we've done in the past. Um, I, hey, Telemaster. Um, I really like that one. I like, I really like the Kenny Beach one that we just did. I think it's a, really interesting. Um, Keith Penner, we are based, uh, based in Las Vegas. And Toka the Great, I am also in love with AJ. So we have something <laughs> in common. <laughs> yes. So... It's 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 always also fun to catch us doing a live stream in the middle of the day because by the time we do the after files, we are so tired. It's Thursday. It's like you know after the episode. Yeah. And yes, Chris, there are turkey and drinks. So the Who files already taken by Doctor Whovians. Uh, well, I mean we we have the Who files so. But we love, we love Doctor Who. Tiny pink nugget of chaos. You're my spirit animal. So look at that. That's crazy. <laughs> what a weird coincidence. Um, crop circles was a good one. I did like the crop yes. circles video. That, that was, was a great fun. one. What, uh, what about everybody else? What what are what are some people's favorite episodes? I'm I love all the science ones. So and especially the ones on fringe science with simulation theory and the electric universe theory was fun. I like all the all the science ones are my fave. Yeah. Um, let's see. James is watching from England. Madman Mike Markham, that was a fun one, Johnny. Oh, the Russian mirror fun. thing, the um, Kozarev, Kozarev mirror. mirror. Yeah, that was that was a fun one. Uh, Hollow Moon, that's the one that we're gonna have him show, if uh, once once we get there, he's working on it. Mark Durden, thank you very much for the lovely compliment. Um. The Black Knight Satellite, that's a good one. You know what you know which one I like? I somebody said said it. Um, I like the Shadow People episode. Do you? I yeah. scary. for the premiere yes. of the Crab Cat. Yes. It was scary. And it took me a while to watch it because I knew that AJ had a personal experience. So I didn't watch it for like six months. <laughs> yes. And then I finally it, watched it. I'm like, Gotta That's see a it. crazy one. <laughs> yeah. That's a fun one. Earth Singularity, thank you so much for that. Are we ever going to build one of our own mirrors? Matt, uh, Space Matt Spliff is asking. Um, uh, you know, I don't know if we got time. time. Mel's Hole, that's a fun one. Um, we just built the studio and now we might be too big, getting too big for it. Right, right. Just let's see. I'll be sharing my office. I'm fine with that. Like, don't don't make me move. <laughs> <laughs> Human combustion, the spontaneous combustion. That was a crazy one. Um. So yeah, it's it's you know the card trick episode one. Episode one. That's we funny, shot yeah. that one when we were still in Scottsdale two years ago. Uh, three years ago. In, uh, yeah, October, uh, that podcast is coming up. Yes. So that was a fun one. Gebekli Tepe was a good one. 
total some yeah. messages. Yeah, I mean, it's so many of them are so interesting. A lot of the ones that, uh, you know, a lot of the episodes we do, they're things I'd never heard of before. Well, and even yeah. if I didn't think I'd be interested, it was something I, you always learn something. And so I always, every one of them I enjoyed, I would think, oh, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to care about that topic. And then I'd watch it and be like, what? <laughs> right. <laughs> See. Okay. This is interesting. Yeah. Those stories are great. He's a good storyteller. Why ancient people didn't see the origin of the crab cat. So humans see shadow people and it's, it's, you know, what's interesting about shadow people is that people see shadow people, but they all tend to see the same like three types of shadow people, the man with the yeah. hat, um, the old yeah. crone there. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. So the crab cat is a shadow person. As if we create them. Titanium, oh. chromium, oh. and zirconium are rare. In abundance on the moon. Worked. If no, the earth on. and moon. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. And I hear you. And then what happens? And here? they're highly resistant to corrosion. If you want to reinforce Good. a structure, the show? these are the metals you would use. Very well. This structural Very well. reinforcement could explain why moon craters all seem to be the same depth, no matter how wide they are. Shouldn't craters of different sizes be of different depths? It's as if there's a resilient metallic shell just beneath the surface of the moon, preventing anything from penetrating further. They're okay. All the same could you once? Map. I mean, could you just one time conduct this live stream in a professional manner? One time. So what? So what do we do? Do we let's, start? We play the Hollow Moon, right? Can we play it? Let's do it. All right, hang on. I'm trying. I see Eric play. lurking in the background. He's lurking. Yeah. This live stream is a mess. You should be ashamed of yourself. Shame. Shame. Shame on you. This episode of The Y Files is brought to you by Surfshark. Despite it being humanity's constant companion through all of recorded time, the moon is still a mystery. Science hasn't been able to explain how the moon was formed, its unusual orbit, its distance from us, its density, its composition, its structure, these are all still questions. Now, there are theories about the moon that solve some of these puzzles, but they don't solve all of them. There's only one theory that answers every scientific question about the moon. Just one. That the moon is a hollow artificial structure brought here by someone else. Let's find out why. It's, it's, still, it's still janky over here. It's not, really? it's not, not on. Really? Well, now I'm <laughs> You're pretty funny for a human. Now you are? I thought I was. Well, I was. You think this passes oh, yeah, for a live laughing. stream? Think again. All right. I, I changed something. I have a feeling I'm going to break it again. You tell me. We're good. We're good. Let's start at the beginning. We're taught that the moon has been here forever. But there's controversy about this because scientists can't agree on how the moon was formed in the first place. The first theory of how the this is a mess, man. <laughs> but it's no, our mess. As far as live streams go, this one is this one is terrible. It's terrible. Are you hearing him? Yeah. No. Is he yelling? Oh, so you can't hear him? I hear oh, I heard Shatner. I hear you heard Shatner? Yeah. All right. Let me know if you hear this. I'm so tired, I'm a human. We've been together too long. I should have my own show. The moron says I am wrong. So while he lay there asleep, I had my laptop in bed So I logged into Reddit There was a message that read Do you wanna be on YouTube? D 
Do you like to entertain? Come and be my co-host You only need half a brain If you like aliens and pyramids Conspiracies get you high Then you're the co-host I'm looking for Message me and apply All right, I, it's, it's, I, it's such a such a janky setup over here. Oh, oh, it's working, it's working. But uh, I'm willing, I'm willing to press onward. Press we, onward. Press onward. Did we say hello <laughs> to all of our super chats? No, not all. No, not all. You know, Hakovich, when are you going to come party at our psychedelic retreat? project next to Skywalker Ranch. If that don't tease, don't tease about that. Drop, drop a pin. I'll see you there. All right, we could try to watch the moon if you want. Let's watch it. Let's watch it. This is one of my favorites. This is one of my favorites. The moon became linked to the Earth is the capture theory. It says the moon was just floating along, drifted near the Earth, and was pulled into orbit. This is almost impossible. Another explanation is the accretion theory, that the moon and Earth formed out of dust clouds in the early solar system. But when systems form through accretion, they share similar traits. If the moon was formed this way, it would have an iron core, like the Earth. It would spin on an axis, like the Earth. But neither of these are true. The fission hypothesis was popular for a while, and this says the early Earth was spinning so fast that the moon was formed out of rock in the Pacific Ocean that was flung into space. But we later learned that moon rock is much older than the bottom of the ocean, so this is unlikely. The most popular explanation is the giant impact theory. This says that a large object about the size of Mars smashed into the proto-Earth. The debris field from the collision coalesced to create the Earth-Moon system. Again, these conditions would have to be so perfect that the odds are astronomical. Right. Now, a recent theory is a combination of all of these. That a large object collided with the Earth about four and a half billion years ago, essentially vaporizing it. And this vapor is called a synestia. And the synestia was spinning very rapidly, forming a torus. And the moon formed on the edge of this torus. Whoa, 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 hold on. Torus? What's a torus? Well, this shape is a torus. Uh, that looks like a donut. It does, but in geometry, if you revolve a circle around an axis in three-dimensional space, it's called a torus. Yeesh, and you wonder why you're not popular at parties. I'm very popular at parties, aren't I? So, we still don't know how the moon was created. You would think that actually going to the moon and collecting rock samples would solve some of these puzzles. But when moon rocks were brought back and studied, it only created more questions. Since landing on the moon in 1969, there... The moon landing was as fake as a teenager's Instagram. I knew you were going to do this. Look, do you like the idea that the moon is a hollow spaceship? Well, uh, yeah, I gotta admit, I, I do kind of like this idea. Okay, so for us to explore this theory, you need to concede that we went to the moon. Fine, I will concede we went to the moon. Thank you. But those were unmanned missions. The landings were actually filmed in a studio in Burbank, California. Fine, uh... I'll take what I can get. <laughs> moon rocks and soil samples brought back from the moon are strange. On Earth, the newest rocks are at the surface, and the rock gets older as you go deeper. Now, this is obvious and logical. But on the moon, the soil on the surface is older than the rocks underneath. And the surface rocks are older than the rock underneath them. It's backwards. The only way this happens on Earth is when we drill, dig, and mine, bringing older material to the surface. But we see this all over the moon. Now, if the moon was somehow hollowed out, older rock would be on top. But the list of anomalies goes on. Typical planetary structures have denser materials toward the core and lighter materials toward the surface. On the moon, this too is reversed, and no one could really explain why. The moon's surface is pockmarked by asteroid impacts that have happened for billions of years. So you would expect the rock around the impact craters to be different ages. But there is a strange uniformity in the age of these rocks. The chemical makeup of lunar dust is also very odd. 
If lunar dust is the result of billions of years of impacts, why does it have a different chemical makeup of the rocks around it? The moon doesn't have a magnetic field, yet moon rocks are strongly magnetized. The Earth is 4.6 billion years old, but the oldest rocks we found are much younger than that. Moon rocks are older, much older. Some rocks have been dated to the very beginning of the solar system, and some are said to be even older than that. Uranium-236 and Neptunium-237 are found on the moon. This is notable because those radioactive elements don't occur naturally. The only way we see those isotopes on Earth is if we create them. Titanium, chromium, and zirconium are rare on Earth, but these are found in abundance on the moon. If the Earth and moon were formed together, why such a big discrepancy? And those metals happen to be some of the most strongest materials that are known to exist, and they're highly resistant to corrosion. If you wanted to reinforce a structure, these are the metals you would use. This structural reinforcement could explain why moon craters all seem to be the same depth, no matter how wide they are. Shouldn't craters of different sizes be of different depths? It's as if there's a resilient metallic shell just beneath the surface of the moon, preventing anything from penetrating further. Now, if there were some type of instruments on the moon's surface that could detect seismic activity, we could test the hollow moon theory by intentionally colliding objects with the moon. This sounds like a setup. We did this, didn't we? We did. And is it hollow? Well, hey -o! After returning to the command module, the Apollo 12 crew intentionally released the lunar lander, crashing it into the moon's surface. Then something very unexpected happened. Seismic measurements showed that the moon rang like a bell and reverberated for more than an hour. This was with a very small object compared to the size of the moon. So during Apollo 13, an even heavier object was crashed into the surface. This time, the moon rang for over three hours and vibrations traveled to a depth of 20 miles. This doesn't happen on Earth. Reverberations last only a few minutes because of the Earth's density. And on Earth, vibrations slow down as they move toward the Earth's center, where material is denser. But the vibrations on the moon actually got faster around 40 miles down, indicating the interior of the moon is not only far less dense, but perhaps has large hollow cavities. The density of the moon is something that's difficult to explain. The moon is about 25% the size of the Earth, but it's only about 1% of the Earth's density. If the moon were a hollow shell, this would explain that. Besides the density issue, the moon has a lot of characteristics and coincidences that we don't see anywhere else. The moon is actually more like a planet than a moon. At one quarter the Earth's size, no other object in the solar system has a moon this large. This occurs nowhere else, not in our solar system or any other solar system that we found. And the moon orbits much more closely than it should. And its orbit is also a mystery. It's the only object we've ever observed with a near perfectly circular orbit. We don't see this anywhere else either. Because of this near perfect orbit and its size and distance from the Earth, the moon appears in the sky as almost the exact same size as the sun. This is what allows us to have eclipses. Our distance to the sun is 400 times our distance to the moon. And the size of the sun is 400 times the size of the moon. Could this be a coincidence? Nah. Well, when enough coincidences pile up, we may have to adjust our thinking and be a little more open-minded. And that's what happened in 1970. Two Soviet scientists looked at all the evidence and all these coincidences and came to what they felt was the only logical conclusion. And they agreed that their theory sounded crazy, but said not only is the moon hollow, but it's also a spacecraft that traveled here in the distant past. So now we have to ask, who built the moon? Every ancient culture on Earth has stories about the moon, but it's interesting that the further back you go, the fewer stories there are. And if you go back far enough, there are stories that talk about a sky before the moon arrived. Roman and Greek authors in the 5th century BC have stories about the proselytes, and they lived in an area called Arcadia. And they said they've been here since before there was a moon in the heavens. Now on the other side of the world, the ancient culture of Tiwanaka in Bolivia 
also refers to a time when there was no moon. The Tuanaka claim the moon arrived between 11,500 and 13,000 years ago. If you're into ancient theories as much as I am, you'll recognize that this time coincides perfectly with a period called the Younger Dryas. And all kinds of myths and mysteries are said to have happened during the Younger Dryas, and we'll cover them on this channel. Now, going back to Africa, there are Zulu legends that specifically say the moon is hollow and living inside is an intelligent race of reptilian extraterrestrials. Lizard people? Yep. Lizard people built the moon! That's what they believe. Lizard people are very industrious. They seem to be. The Zulu believe the moon was put into orbit by two brothers who were gods. And this legend is similar to what the Sumerians believed. The Sumerians also had a legend of two brothers, Enki and Enlil, who were called Anunnaki. Yep, Anunnaki the extraterrestrial gods who created mankind. Everything is falling into place with this one. Oh, you ain't seen nothing yet. How about this? The Zulu also believed that before the moon arrived, the climate of the earth was very different. There were no seasons and a blanket of thick water vapor covered the entire planet. And we now know that the moon does stabilize our climate. Without the moon's gravity, the earth's axis would wobble. There would be no consistent seasons, no tides, extreme weather. The presence of the moon is what allows life on Earth to thrive. So back to the Zulu. The Earth was covered by a thick layer of water vapor, and you could only see the sun through this hazy mist. When the moon was finally placed into orbit, all this water vapor fell at once, and it created a cataclysmic global flood. Always a flood. Always. Every time. Every ancient culture has a flood myth, and there's mounting evidence that this did indeed happen during the Younger Dryas. Cultures around the world have myths that are in perfect sync with each other. The coincidences keep piling up. The Zulu legend talks about how the arrival of the moon changed the tides and stabilized the climate. And this is something that wasn't understood by science until the past hundred years. Yet somehow the ancient Zulu were able to make the connection between the moon and the tides and the seasons. All of these myths and legends, plus strange coincidences and anomalies about the moon, start to add up to a compelling theory that the moon is hollow, is artificial, and was placed here by intelligent beings long ago. But coincidences aren't proof, and myths aren't proof. We need to know what's been happening on the moon lately to see if we can make our case with hard evidence. Lucky for us, the evidence is there. Science tells us that the moon is a cold, lifeless place. It has no atmosphere. There hasn't been seismic activity for millions of years. Its core, unlike the Earth's, is cold. For a supposedly dead world, there's an awful lot of activity up there. On March 7th, 1971, a cloud of water vapor appeared on the moon that covered 100 square miles, and it was there for 14 hours before it dissipated. There's not supposed to be atmosphere on the moon, but for those 14 hours, there was. In fact, six astronomers in the past hundred years have documented a glowing mist in the crater named Plato. The same mist, the same crater, over many years. Boulder tracks are seen on the moon, all over the place. And that's weird enough, but how do boulders roll for miles and then go uphill, like in this photo? And since the days of Aristotle, astronomers have seen strange lights appear on the surface of the moon, sometimes visible with the naked eye. NASA even reported that between the years 1540 and 1967, there were 570 sightings of light flashes on the moon that couldn't be explained. Sightings of strange lights continue to this day. The Aristarchus crater was photographed in 1992, and it shows a glowing blue light, now called the Blue Gem. And this anomaly has been seen by Earth-based telescopes every few years since. Some have even speculated it's a fusion reactor. And these events of mysterious light and mist happen so frequently that there's even a name for them, transient lunar phenomena, or TLPs. But things get even more weird. There are plenty of photographs of what appear to be artificial objects on the surface of the moon. Towers that reach several miles high, pyramids, symmetrical structures. These have been photographed by astronomers, probes, even the astronauts themselves. And the biggest anomaly of all? Why haven't we gone back to the moon? Sergeant Carl Wolf was working as a technician for the Air Force, and he was repairing equipment that transferred images from a lunar satellite. Those photos, according to Sergeant Wolf, 
showed artificial structures on the moon, what he described as a base. And this is corroborated by another technician working with Wolf. And Wolf wasn't a UFO ET moon theory guy. He was just a tech. He said he was excited to see the pictures on the news and have NASA explain what they were. He was surprised when the photos never turned up. The photos were found in a very early release from NASA. These structures are very large and very tall. You can even see they cast shadows. And these are photos I'd like to learn more about, but I can't, they no longer exist. Now, almost immediately after landing on the moon, the Apollo 11 crew said they saw something that shook them up. Watch the press conference they gave when they returned. These men aren't acting like they made history or had a life-changing experience. It's uh, a beginning of a new age. They look sad, frightened, uncomfortable, even depressed. Why? Is there a reason we haven't returned to the moon? And could it be that the Apollo missions discovered something that ancient cultures knew centuries ago? Something that reputable scientists believe is the only answer to this list of mysteries. That the moon is not what it seems or what we've been told. The moon is hollow, artificially constructed, and appeared in Earth's orbit from somewhere else far away. Yeah, makes sense to me. Does it make sense to you? So what can science explain about the hollow moon spaceship theory? Well, the formation of the moon is still unknown, so score theory one, science zero. The density problem is said to be because after the giant impact, the Earth's upper mantle formed the moon. The mantle is much less dense than the core. Okay, the problem with this is, the giant impact theory probably isn't what happened. And the theory about the Earth and the moon forming out of that big donut shape? Um, in geometry, that's called a torus. Taurus. Well, that wouldn't explain the density discrepancy. We're told the moon ringing like a bell is because the moon is much less dense and the moon's rock has much less water. So vibrations reverberate longer and farther. This can't be proven, but okay. The perfect eclipses? Well, here's where science wins. The eclipses aren't exact. They're close, but not perfect. Besides, the moon is drifting farther away from the Earth every year. So eclipses are becoming less and less perfect all the time. And whether the moon arrived 14,000 years ago or was formed billions of years ago, it was much closer to the Earth, so it was much larger in the sky. Now, NASA claims that we know the moon isn't hollow because of seismic observations. And that's fair, but it's still conjecture. Look, we don't know for sure what's at the center of the Earth, much less what's at the center of the moon. If there's anything at all. Right. Now, the structures are said to be shadows or optical illusions. Nope. And the lights are from meteor impacts or reflections from glassy patches on the surface. Nope. But the bottom line is this. Yes, the hollow moon spaceship theory is a wild one. I admit that. And many of the anomalies found on the moon can be explained. The explanations aren't perfect, but they're enough to satisfy skeptics. And I consider myself a skeptic, but I'm open-minded. I just want to know the truth. And when I started researching this story, I thought it would be a fun ride, a pure tinfoil hat experience that we could button up with science. That's not what happened. There's just so much unknown and unexplainable that something doesn't feel right about what we've been told about the moon. But as always, the space agencies and the governments they serve are very selective about the images and information they release. So I have a message for them. For NASA, the European Space Agency, Russia, China, Elon Musk, Richard Branson, Jeff Bezos, and anyone with the resources to put people back on the moon. The message is this. If you want us to believe your explanations, you're going to have to prove it. All right. What's this? I got a sponsor. You've got a sponsor? Why do you need a sponsor? I inflation. The fish food is costing me a fin and a fin. Besides, I I'm getting killed on Bitcoin. I told you to sell a little. Hold on. All right, so what is Surfshark and why do you need it? It's a VPN, virtual a private network. I know what a VPN is. Well, there are some shows I like to watch, but they're not available to stream in the U.S., so I, I can change my IP address to different countries to watch them. Example? Well, you, you know how Netflix dropped The Office and now it's on Peacock or Pigeon or whatever cockamamie service that is? Yeah, that, that was annoying. Well, I can use an IP address in the U.K. and still watch it for free on Netflix. Sounds kind of sneaky. I know, I love it. 
Or I can use an IP address in Australia and watch the Big Lebowski. That is a good one. The fish abides. And since my IP address is hidden, Google and Facebook can't track me. Oh yeah, you definitely don't want big internet companies having access to your data. Well, not just companies, government too. When I'm looking up information about the moon landing, which is definitely fake, none of those three-letter agencies can track me and, and jam me up. It's like a tinfoil hat for your internet. Huh. Nice catchphrase. Yeah, you like that, huh? I even got one of those code things so people can get their own tinfoil hat for their internet. Get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deals slash files and enter promo code files for 83% off and three extra months for free. That works out to only $2.49 a month. That's a small price to pay for security and privacy. That's surfshark.deals slash files. That was a pretty good sponsor read. Well, you aren't the only former radio personality on this show, you know. That was Love in the Rocks by Neil Diamond. For all you broken hearts drowning your sorrows tonight. And before that, we went all the way back to the Groove Yard for a little classic Marvin Gaye. Good evening, lovers and lovettes. My name is Hecklefish, and you're taking a midnight ride on WAVE to Wave. With 55 minutes of love songs every hour. Keep it locked into the wave, because I can go all night. This next one is a long-distance dedication from Sharon in Chicago. She writes, You've always had my back. You make me feel protected and safe. Here's I'll Be There. Just for you, Surfshark. Get Surfshark VPN at surfshark.deal slash files and enter promo code files for 83% off and three extra months for free. Eh, not bad. Thanks. Mine was better. Shut up. <laughs> Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. My name is AJ. That's Hecklefish. This has been The Y Files. I like to look if you had fun or learned anything, do me a favor and like, list. subscribe, really comment, awesome. share. I, I hate to give you homework, but that stuff really helps out a small channel. And if you have a topic you'd like... It's much smaller. That moon episode... Let me see what's going on in the chat. I, when I, someone su suggested that topic, and when I got the email, I said, this is the dumbest theory I have ever heard. And halfway through my research, I was like, eh, the moon is kind of weird. By the time I got through with the episode, I was totally moon-pilled. I'm convinced. The moon is hollow. It's a spaceship. Someone brought it here. At Rososa, when is dinner ready? I don't know, but it's, it smells good in here. John Hudson, thank you for showing up. Let me see what's going on in the Super Chats. Uh, Eric Bishop says, Jen, you're awesome, and everyone is awesome for this. Thanks so much for letting us in on a holiday. You're very welcome. Thank you for supporting the channel, Eric. Fluffy McTavish for two. Yes, the podcast is amazing. Thank you. Thank you for showing up. I'm not going to sit here and eat this whole pound of bacon right off the bat. Isn't that, isn't that, isn't that crazy? Yeah, they got, they got bacon going back there. I hear you. There's Tony Gironi for 4 dollars Prime rib. Love your channel. Don't sweat tech difficulties. I just figured out how to superchar. LOL. I appreciate that. Look, it's, it's not a professional operation. Could you once? I mean, could you just one time conduct this live stream in a professional manner? Lynn Zen for five. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone at your place from Oklahoma. Same to you. Happy Thanksgiving to Oklahoma. Billy Jean 327, I see you in the chat. Thank you for the kind words. Jim and Jelly Bean saying hi to Jen. Nick's five cents. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Verda Clamity, introduce your guests. So... You've got, you got, well, you, you, you want to introduce who they are? Should we do it like on Hairspray? I'm Jen. <laughs> um, hi, everybody. It's Jen. Who's back there? That's my sister, Chris. Chris, wave. Say hello. Hello. Hello to the fans. It's Eric, my brother-in-law. Hi. <gasps> what? I just knocked the other monitor out. Um, so welcome. Everyone, thank you. Thank you for joining us at our home. Um, Garrick says, hi, Jen. Hi, Chris. Hi, Eric. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks. Hi, see, that's hybrid in the chat, by the way. That's the hybrid. Hybrid, hello. That's the hybrid. He's always out there taking selfies with fans. Archie's had the Y files. Eric's have United. 
Um, let me know what episode you want. I'm going to do a couple of super chats. Let me know what episode you want to see next. And where were we? There's Aaron. Let's see, thank you for the two dollar super sticker. That guy wants Denver Airport episode. That's we haven't watched that one in a while. That's a good call. I think this. So this episode, <laughs> this episode got demonetized. I'm looking for it right now. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to find. All right, I, I have to search for it because YouTube will not serve it up. Denver Airport. I can't even find it on my own channel. That's how buried. That's how buried it is. Really? Are we still gonna do mushrooms? Luis Lamoria. Yeah, I can't even. Oh, there. No, that's that's the after files for it. Yeah, it's completely buried, and and I don't know why. I don't know why that's de demonetized, but boy, that hurts when they do that. All right, we're gonna have to have a plan B. I haven't covered that one, William Runner, 1933 Italian UFO crash. I have not covered that. Programmer X is here. Thank you for the five Canadian programmers. Been with the channel since the very earliest days. Very, very early days. Happy Thanksgiving, Henry Buss. If the stream shuts off, it's because the cat stepped on the keyboard. That's, 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 that's what's about to happen. Irvin wants to see the very first episode. Ooh, that's a, that's a rough. I'll play it. But it's, well, we're not, are we going to, you want to pitch those? Talk about this. It comes out tomorrow. Those come out tomorrow? Yes. So this, this, it, we, so we made a deck of cards and if there's a game, are there rules? Yep. And these are available tomorrow, you say? Yep. Okay. It's called Go Hecklefish. But what's cool is each card is a character from the show. There's Crab Cat. There's Mr. Naughty. A lot of Mr. Naughty. Uh, maybe these are in order. Uh, there's, yeah. They're a lot of fun. And, uh, and, we're, and, you know, I always promise to keep the prices down. Uh, 15 bucks? Uh -huh. 15 bucks. And they're really nice. And thanks to SMK, a.k.a. Rob, the official artist of the Wild Files, for designing those cards for us. Yes. Plum Island, Daniel, you want to see Plum Island? Kissy Cat, you have a beautiful cat. Yes, he is, and he knows it, and he's very, very bad. But then he coos like a pigeon, and you just, you just melt. Antonio, Mar Antonio Mar Margariti, happy Thanksgiving, y'all. Hope deviled eggs make an appearance. Favorite channel, De deviled eggs are on the menu. There's Scott W. from 1999. I love the channel. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Scott. I appreciate the support. Thanks to everyone who's super chatting today. Everyone who's joined Patreon. Everyone who's going to shop to the to grab merch. That's what keeps us going. Paul Rivers, AJ, let Victoria know she is such a hottie. I certainly will. Can you, can you hear my voice screaming back there? Because he, he thinks I'm talking to him. Because who else would I be talking to? Kristen Kenny for two. Happy Turkey Day to the Gentile family from, from NOLA, LA. That's Nolan's. All right. Yes. I guess we'll just do the show like this. Uh, Bill Barkley, the Mr. Naughty of Cats. Shannon's got it. Cat! Cat! Harry Toe, you want Denver? I can't even find the video. Can, if someone can find the video, link me to it, and I'll play it. Go ahead, dummy. Tell them as you found the episode, link me. I can't even find it on my own channel. All right, I can't pronounce this. Uh, General, go ahead and pronounce that name. Tiplon Makazuksu. That is correct. She is the winner. Cranberries pop because they have air pockets inside. That's true. 
That's true. There's uh, Brittany English for five. Happy Thanksgiving from my family to yours. And there's you. Un oh, the unbeliever. Thank you for the 50. Whoa. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. Human. I want you to know I said human. Thank you for all the dough tipping. As I'm sure you will find, always is a good time. Ooh, 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 it's fun to tip the F I S H. It's fun to tip the F I S H. <laughs> Right, right, right. I got it. I got it. I think it's a 60. Yeah, something like that. No, you didn't lose me. We're good. We're good. We're good. I'm back. I promise. I promise. I promise. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Sugar Bombs Destroyer. There is Maria Ortega. Happy thanks for your time in this holiday. Better than March of the Wooden Soldier. I haven't, haven't seen that one in a long time. There's KL Ryder for 10 best content out there. Thankful for y'all. Just join the Patreon. I appreciate that. And the rest of y'all should as well. Hashtag better than TV. Patreon's the best way to support the channel, and it's not that expensive. Um, and if you're not ready to join that community, hop in the Discord. Discord's free. I think we, we, I don't know how many members are in there. How many, 20,000, 25,000? Joe Santini, the holidays bring me down. Your channel's great though. Sorry to hear that, Joe. I know that they are tough on a lot of people and that's why we wanted to do this. And then we'll probably do another one of these live Christmas morning too. Because that's exactly why we're here. Is I know that it's tough for some folks. There's Eric, have you talked about the Japanese? I have not talked about that. You have to email me to remind me. Patrick George is there. Thank you for the two. Happy Thanksgiving from Shreveport. A lot of Louisiana folks here today. Roy Robinson, who does Hecklefish's voice? He does his own voice. Who does your voice? D. Fernie, thank you for the two pound. Darren for 10 pound. Love, lots of love from the UK. Your channel rocks. Hope you Americans are having a great Thanksgiving. Hope Hecklefish gets some turkey. I think he's going out for White Castle downtown after this. Hey, FS from Germany, good to, uh, Germany, good to see you. Happy Thanksgiving to Gertie the Camel. All right, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna see if I can. I'm gonna see if I can find the Denver Airport episode. What files? Denver Airport. Okay, I got it. I got it. Boy, it's hard. It's hard to find. This was hard to find. Let me. I'm just getting it set up for you. Let's see if this is it. Yep, there he is. Bernie with weed and frozen pizza for Thanksgiving. That works. Tony Fowler, no deep fried hecklefish tonight. Not tonight. Sounds tasty, though. My stomach is growling. Melissa Taylor, thank you for the five. Happy Thanksgiving, wife fam. Happy to yours as well. Does heckle eat turkey? I think he does. He's a carnivore. Paul Nava, thank you for the two bucks. What about Planet Serpo Part 2? Um, next, you might like next week's episode because it's kind of comp kind of connected to the Serpo story is uh, um, covering Project Looking Glass. I don't know if you know that, you guys know that one, but this is a, a device 
engineered from ancient Sumerian tech, which they think comes from the Anunnaki, and powered by technology from the Roswell crash. And they took the, the plans, the technology, they connected it together and created this device that allows the user, the operator, to look through time, kind of like the chronovisor. Harry Tell, I really can't find the Denver. I, yeah, when when um, when YouTube demonetizes a video, it it just disappears. I, I couldn't. I was searching my own channel. I couldn't find it. I had to go and duck, duck, go to find the channel. Small town girl excited for Project Looking Glass. It's a crazy one. It's a lot to sort through, but it's a fun story. Corey Ryder. Oh God, not Corey Good and, and Andrew Guy. He's talking about Andrew Basiago. You have to mention Basiago, but I. I went after Corey pretty hard a couple of weeks ago. I covered the 20 and back story, and I called him out. I called him out for some of his stuff. And look, he, he could be telling the truth. It's just he kind, of, he kind of contradicted some of his story when he was being deposed by an attorney. Colleen's looking forward to Project Looking Glass. Yulin Hodges for 10. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for keeping us company. I read today that there are giant sunspots spewing radiation soon and we'll be pointing our way out. That's, I'm actually afraid of it. More than, more than war, more than just about anything else. Uh, are you saying there are episodes I haven't seen yet and can find on DuckDuckDo? Duck, well, when YouTube demonetizes a video, YouTube is Google, right? So you, if, you, if you Google the Wi Files Denver Airport, if you Google that, you probably won't find it unless you, if, unless you dig. But with DuckDuckGo, you can find it. Melanie, what do you feed that cat? Cat food. Andrew Basiago is a certifiable crazy person. Yeah, I'm not a huge believer of his. You know, I, I, I try to be respectful on the, uh, on the episodes, but I'll tell you the truth in the live streams. Avatar guy, we should play all the demonetized episodes. That's a pretty good idea. The other one that I can think of off the top of my head is uh, the Michigan Dog Man. Steven has the link. I have it too. You guys ready for it? Israel Thrasher for 10. Please don't forget about the friendship case. Got it. Happy Thanksgiving to you all. Victoria, thanks for noticing me. Senpai. It's just a matter of time before it happens. Some catastrophic event that wipes out a large percentage of the Earth's population and forces the human race to reset. Maybe one of the 30,000 near-Earth objects being tracked by NASA finally hits the Earth, causing an extinction event on par with what wiped out the dinosaurs. Or Earth's poles finally shift, and without its magnetic field, the planet is exposed to the raw destructive power of the sun's radiation. Or maybe on his deathbed, a dictator decides to go out in a blaze of glory and launches his entire nuclear arsenal. It's just a matter of time before one of these or one of another dozen doomsday scenarios plays out. And when that happens, world leaders like the President of the United States and Vice President will be immediately taken to underground facilities designed for this event. Key members of Congress and the military will also be taken to secure locations. But what about civilians? There are facilities around the world designed to house many thousands of people. But who gets saved while the rest of us are left behind? Who makes that decision? And where are these facilities? Well, I don't know where VIPs go if they live in Europe or Asia or Australia. But in the United States, those chosen few, they go to Denver. The mysteries surrounding the Denver International Airport began before it was even built. A new airport was something Denver didn't really need and couldn't afford. Stapleton Airport was conveniently located and could easily handle the traffic. In fact, in the early 1990s, Stapleton Airport was expanded. Yet a decision was made to decommission Stapleton and build a brand new airport 25 miles outside the city, in the middle of nowhere, with only one road in or out. So plans were made, bids were taken, contractors were hired, and the problems began. When DIA opened on February 28th, 1995, construction was 16 months behind schedule and $2 billion over budget. 
The final cost of the airport was $4.8 billion, almost double the original estimate. The airport itself sits on a 53 square mile complex, twice the size of Manhattan. This is almost twice as large as the next biggest US airport. Now, being that at the time it was only the 20th busiest airport in the country, this amount of construction and money spent seems like overkill, unless the construction project includes something more than just an airport. And that's when people started noticing things about DIA that didn't add up. Construction workers themselves were confused. Contractors were hired, fired, and hired again. Nobody seemed to know why. Teams knew what they were working on, but very few people knew the full scope of the project. A complex network of tunnels was built underneath the airport. Officially, this is six levels, but some workers said it's deeper than this, though nobody can say for sure. 5,300 miles of fiber optics were installed for communication. Now that's enough cable to go from New York to LA and back. A fueling system was built that can pump 1,000 gallons of jet fuel per minute. This is way overkill for a commercial airport. Runway 16R slash 34L is almost three miles long, the longest runway in the country. This is also overkill for a commercial airport, unless you're planning to land even bigger planes and lots of them. All airports are surrounded by barbed wire for safety, but the barbs face outward to keep people out. For some reason at Denver airport, the barbed wire was installed the wrong way. It's designed to keep people in. Five large buildings were built, and after they were completed, they were covered up. The official report is they were built in the wrong place. These buildings range from seven stories to 15 stories tall, but rather than demolish them, they buried them. That's very suspicious. Also suspicious is the 40 foot wide tunnel that was built to connect these buried buildings to the rest of the facility. 110 million cubic yards of earth had been moved for the underground structure, way more than required. For comparison, that's about one third the amount of earth moved to dig the entire Panama Canal. So people did the math. That would be enough earth to account for a tunnel to another facility like Cheyenne Mountain Complex near Colorado Springs. Cheyenne is a bunker that in case of nuclear war will serve as a major command and control center for the United States military. Many more construction anomalies were noticed by workers on the project, but nobody had enough information to connect the dots as to who would be building a massive underground facility and for what purpose. But as various parts of the airport were completed, hints of something sinister started to appear. For example, when the runways were completed, people took notice that from the air, they formed the shape of a swastika. Concerned locals suspected that Denver International might be something more than just an airport. So when DIA finally opened, people looked for clues that might indicate that it was built by a secret group with a secret agenda. And the clues are everywhere. When Denver International Airport finally opened, it didn't take long for people to realize this place was unusual. The first thing you see when you arrive on the property before you even enter the building is the Blue Mustang. This is a 32 foot tall, 9,000 pound statue with visible red veins and glowing red eyes. I looked and behold a pale horse. Its rider's name was Death and Hell followed with him. Revelation 6. I know it's Revelation. Some people believe the statue symbolizes the fourth horse of the apocalypse. So people started calling him Blucifer and believed that he was cursed. Now this might sound silly, but Blucifer killed his creator. Whoa, what? The artist, Luis Jimenez, was killed in a freak accident when a piece of the horse fell off and severed an artery in Luis's leg. But the creepier artwork is inside the airport. Denver must be the only airport in the world that features gargoyles in the baggage area. What the hell are they doing there? Well, the artist, Terry Allen, said they're there as protectors. And throughout history, gargoyles were placed on buildings to scare away evil spirits. And scare away human children. Right. And even scarier are the murals painted around the airport, like this one. What the sh is this? This is in the airport? This is the first of four murals by artist Leo Tanguma. This is called Peace and Harmony with Nature. And we've got children in coffins, extinct animals, a forest on fire, in the back a city burns, a child holds a Mayan tablet depicting the end of the world. Yeah, nothing says have a great flight like dead people in coffins. Yeah, this isn't the kind of artwork you want to see if you're a nervous flyer waiting on your connecting flight. Well, here's another mural. Yeah, oh, come on, you're making this up. Nope. Like the runways and the murals, there are references to Nazi Germany all over the place. Here we have a Nazi wearing a gas mask, holding a rifle and slicing through a city with a sword. 
At the end of the sword, a dead dove, signifying the death of peace. There are children lying in the rubble. On the left, citizens flee the city. A mother cries while cradling the corpse of her dead child. In the lower right is a poem written by a child who died in a Nazi concentration camp. Uh, this is terrifying. A terrible idea to put these pictures up in a place where weed is legal. I know, talk about a harsh buzz. Now, to be fair, there is a second half of this painting. Here we see children from every culture in the world carrying weapons and the flags of countries to this little German boy in the center. Ho, 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 ho. So all these countries disarm and surrender their flags to the little blonde-haired, blue-eyed German boy, eh? Exactly. And nobody sees a problem with this? Guess not. Hello! This is a picture of the One World Government and a New World Order! Oh, you're not the first one to make that connection. Well, of course not. Not everyone's a sheep. So people started looking for clues as to who was really behind the airport project. Here's a clue that's extremely obvious. This is the airport dedication plaque. Freemasons, of course. Right, the Masons were involved in the dedication. But look at the name under the date. New World Airport Commission. Now, if you're already worried that a shadow government is trying to implement the New World Order, this is pretty unsettling and on the nose. Nobody had heard of the New World Airport Commission. What do they do? And why are they involved with the airport and with the Masons? And most importantly, who is behind this secret group? Naturally, concerned citizens looked into the organization. And what did they find? And they found that the New World Airport Commission doesn't exist. Ever since civilization emerged, there have been people trying to control it. Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great, Attila the Hun, Napoleon, Hitler... Kanye West! Well, aside from Kanye, these were dictators. Tyrants who crushed dissent and brutalized their enemies. They ruled through cruelty and fear. The people behind the New World Order don't operate openly. They operate in the shadows and pull the strings of the world's leaders. In the Middle Ages, this group was suspected to be the Templar Knights. In the late 18th century, there was a secret society called the Order of the Illuminati, which you've probably heard of. There are other secret societies rumored to be this ruling elite, but no secret society comes up more in the discussion of the New World Order than the Freemasons. The Masons need their own video, and if you'd like to see that, email me or let me know in the comments. But the gist is this. The Masons project a public image of piety and charity, but secretly they have a hidden political agenda to bring about a one-world government ruled only by Masons. And you can see symbols of the Masons everywhere if you look. The Masons' Eye of Providence is on U.S. currency. On the capstone at Denver International Airport is the Compass and Square. Now, even though the airport opened on February 28, 1995, the capstone was placed on March 19, 1994. And if you add up 3-19-1994, you get the number 33. The number 33 is very significant in Freemasonry. It's the highest degree a Mason can achieve. And that number is everywhere. Again, the Masons need their own video. Now, how about the mural with the Nazi? That's a very unusual sword for a soldier, unless you're familiar with the ancient Arabic order of the nobles of the mystic shrine. That's a Masonic order known as the Shriners, and this is their symbol. And the gargoyles in the baggage area? They're coming out of Samsonite suitcases. Samsonite is an anagram for Mason Sight. Yo, oh, come on, the clues are everywhere! Well, the location of the capstone is in the Great Hall of the airport. Masons call their meeting room the Great Hall. And there are a lot of suspicions about the capstone itself. It's also a time capsule set to be opened in 2094. What's in it, gas masks and MREs? Well, not everyone agrees. Some people think it's a bomb. Others think it's an entrance to an underground bunker that can be opened by touching the braille plaque in a specific way, like a keypad. Masons passing through the airport have been seen holding their membership cards next to it to see if it opens. Now, officially, the time capsule contains a newspaper, baseballs from Coors Field, coins from the Denver Mint, and a pair of Mayor Wellington sneakers. Wait, wait, wait. The mayor threw his dirty sneakers in a hole? Yeah, I guess he thought that was a good idea. Can you imagine what dirty sneaker funk smells like after a hundred years? I'm trying not to. By the way, the mayor was a mason. Of course he was. Now, part of the New World Order slash One World Government plan is population reduction. But how exactly will they reduce the population? Well, the answer to that question is right under our feet. Who's behind the New World Order? The Masons? Yes. The Illuminati? Yep. The Bilderberg Group? Yep. Bohemian Club? Mm -hmm. Nobody really knows. But when the group emerges to put the entire planet under a single dictatorship, they'll need a few methods to get everyone to comply. 
They'll implement mass surveillance, but tell us it's for protection. Um. They'll consolidate mainstream media into a small handful of corporations that will publish propaganda as an official narrative and censor anyone who disagrees. Uh. They'll disarm the population, eliminate religion, take over education from preschool to university, indoctrinating young people with their narrative. But, uh, you know... They'll need to establish a single currency. To do this, they'll need to crash the current banking system so the general population loses faith and places their money in accounts protected and managed by the state. Okay, enough. What? All this is already happening. Well, that depends on your point of view. Well, my point of view is the truth. Well... Don't be a sheep. Let's say that eventually all this comes to pass. <laughs> It will be much easier to control people if there are fewer people to control. So when the New World Order is finally implemented, depopulation will be part of that plan. But you can't send soldiers out to knock off the population. It wouldn't work. They won't turn on their own people. So it has to be done secretly in a way that doesn't arouse suspicion. According to the New World Order plan, this could be done with, say, a global pandemic. <clears throat> I know what you're thinking. This also happened. But that wasn't caused by the Illuminati. <clears throat> Let's go back to the gas mask mural. Obviously, this depicts some kind of chemical warfare. Well, on the floor near the mural is this. AUAG in a mining cart. The official statement is this represents silver and gold. It's to honor the miners who helped build the city of Denver. But some point to a more sinister interpretation. AUAG is also the abbreviation for the Australia antigen, a highly contagious and deadly toxin that attacks the liver. Once unleashed on the world, the population will beg the state for help. They'll surrender every freedom they have to simply feel safe. Then this secret powerful group can decide who lives and who dies. They'll create a vaccine, but won't allow everyone to access it. People deemed undesirable will simply be allowed to succumb to illness. While the people deemed desirable will not only have access to this vaccine, they'll be forced to take it. Again, for their own protection. Look, if you don't see it by now, uh, I don't know what to tell you. Come on, that's not what happened the past few years. Hello, it's called a trial run. Well, that's pretty scary to think about. But the Denver airport holds secrets even darker than this. And to learn about those secrets, we have to go underground. Millions of cubic feet of earth removed. Level upon level of tunnels hundreds of feet down. Large buildings constructed and then for some reason buried. The project did go way over budget, but not if that money was used to construct a secret underground facility. And when the airport project went over budget, the government stepped in and bailed it out. There is a vast tunnel system under the airport. This is a fact. It was built for a state-of-the-art baggage handling system. Allegedly. No, it was, but. But? But it didn't work very well. So despite it costing a hundred million dollars, it was abandoned. Uh, just like the buildings that were built and abandoned. Yep. The year the airport opened, Phil Schneider came forward and blew the whistle on the project. Phil was an engineer who worked on secret government programs, including underground bunkers. And this is confirmed. There are publicly available records that show Phil Schneider worked as a government contractor for years. Well, Phil Schneider and other contractors who worked on the airport has said the underground area isn't six levels deep, as is commonly known, but actually eight levels deep. And this lower area is used as a military base and covers an area of about four and a half square miles. Now, people have questioned why underground tunnels made of concrete would need so many sprinklers along the ceiling. This is supposed to be not just for water, but to give authorities the ability to pump gas into the common areas, gas to incapacitate people or infect people with something like the Australia antigen. In fact, it's been said that FEMA has a large area underground designed as a camp for political enemies and dissenters. And the rumors continue. There's allegedly an underground base where UFOs are kept for reverse engineering. Some people call the Denver airport Area 52. But the most disturbing rumor is that deep under the airport is the headquarters of a race of humanoid creatures who plan on enslaving the entire human race. And not only do these creatures use humans for labor, they breed them for food. Oh, well, what kind of creatures are we talking about? Uh, it's not important. Who's eating people down here? Is it greys? Is it the grey aliens? No, it's not the greys. Who then? The, the tall whites? The tall white aliens? No. Nope. Uh, the Serpo aliens? I, I thought the aliens from Planet Serpo were vegetarian. No, the creatures living down there aren't aliens. <laughs> is it? It is. Lizard people! Yep. The secret cabal planning to take over the world are not the Masons or the Illuminati. They're reptilian humanoids. Not long after revealing this information about the airport, Phil Schneider 
took his own life. Oh, here we go again. I know. And if you check our episode on Dulce Base, we cover the mysterious circumstances around Phil Schneider's death. We do know the last time Phil Schneider spoke in public about this was 1995. And at the end of the talk, he said at least 12 of his friends died mysteriously within the last few years. He felt like he was being watched and feared for his life. He specifically said that if he turns up dead, no matter what the official reports say, he was killed. And maybe this is all coincidence. But he said these things at a talk he was giving in Denver. Well, I don't believe in coincidences. Neither do I. Denver airport conspiracy theories have been around since before the airport was built, which is why I was surprised so many of you wanted me to cover it. But old story or not, it's still one of my favorites. But is it true? Well, let's explain what we can and then we'll see what's left. People who cover this story say that Denver didn't need another airport, that Stapleton was fine. Well, it wasn't. It was congested and inefficient. Yes, it was convenient to get to because it was downtown, but it wasn't great for the people who lived and worked downtown. Airports are noisy. So DIA was built outside the city because there was cheap, flat land away from residential areas. Now, the shape of the runway. I guess it looks like a swastika, but not a very good one. The runways are laid out this way so planes can land from any direction, depending on the weather. The barbed wire is one of my favorite little tidbits. The barbed wire is designed to keep people in. That's, it's just so ominous, but it's not true. The barbs are vertical. They don't face one way or the other. Now, videos and articles about the Denver airport will say that the New World Airport Commission doesn't exist. Now, I thought the same thing for years, but it did exist. It was a temporary committee formed to plan the ceremony around the opening of the airport. But I will concede that choosing that name was a terrible idea. Now, the Masonic symbol is on the capstone because, well, the Masons paid for it. Now, they may be planning a world takeover someday, but in the meanwhile, Masons are pretty generous. AUAG is gold and silver. That's all there is to it. But, 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 it could also be... I know, it could be the Australia antigen. I know, it could. But the Australia antigen is just a protein that indicates a patient has hepatitis B. Now, hepatitis B is pretty bad, but it does have a 95% survival rate. Still, exposure to just the antigen wouldn't hurt you. In fact, the Australia antigen was used to create a vaccine for hepatitis B. The doctor who discovered it actually won the Nobel Prize for this. Now, the murals are weird, no doubt. The artist wanted to honor his heritage as a Chicano descended from the Maya. He was trying to portray a message of peace. Uh, he tried, but he failed. Well, that's a matter of taste, but yeah, they were pretty disturbing. The murals have since been removed and are now in storage. Now, things like the murals, the horse, the gargoyles, these are all done by local artists with no direction from the airport. And I don't think the administrators at the airport were trying to give hints about something sinister, but I will say they had terrible taste in art. Now, the sprinklers and the tunnels, they're not there to spray citizens with gas. They're there because of fire code. Concrete doesn't burn, but plenty of other things down there would. The five buried buildings, I can't find any evidence that they ever existed. Now, I'm not saying they didn't, I'm just telling you I couldn't find anything. But honestly, I hope they exist because it just makes the story that much more fun. Now, as for Phil Schneider, he did die under mysterious circumstances. And I go into it in more detail in the Dulce Base episode. But in a nutshell, Phil was mentally distraught and made up a lot of his stories. And in that episode, I prove it. Now, I can't say that he lied about everything, but he did lie about some things. And when you do that, we have to question everything you say. His death was weird though. Now, if there are secret tunnels down there, I'm not sure we would know about them. So we can't completely discount the idea. Now, as you know, in case of nuclear war or some disaster, the president is taken to a bunker for COG protocols, also known as continuity of government. These bunkers are fortresses where elected leaders can coordinate military response and manage the entire country. On the East Coast, this bunker is Mount Weather, Virginia. On the West Coast, it's Cheyenne Mountain, about 100 miles south of Denver Airport. Fine, but there's something strange. In 2011, the comet Elenin was headed toward Earth. It was expected to miss us, which it did, but it had just been discovered, so NASA couldn't be sure. At the time, Elenin was between three and four miles wide, almost as big as the rock that wiped out the dinosaurs. So President Obama was rushed to a secret facility but not Cheyenne Mountain as his protocol. Instead, the president was taken 100 miles north of Cheyenne. He was taken to Denver Airport. The Denver Airport is a difficult conspiracy to research. Not for lack of information, there's plenty of that. It's the way the information is presented that irritates me. It's condescending. If you believe any of these theories, you're a kook, you're crazy. 
Even the airport itself does this. Whenever they do any work inside the airport, they put up signs of lizard people and aliens and memes of tinfoil hats. The signs say they're building gargoyle breeding grounds and preparing for the end of the world. And they find this all very funny. They even installed a talking gargoyle who spits out one-liners. Welcome to Illuminati headquarters. I mean, Denver International Airport. Did you have to buy an extra seat for your hat, sir? Sir, are you stealing a desk? Sir, you have resting confused face. Hey, look, those jokes aren't that strong, but the, when you have them come out of some creature's mouth, you can get away with it. I'm aware. Anyway, a spokesman for the airport said this. We have a CEO who really embraces the conspiracy ideas. We decided a few years ago that rather than fight all of this and try to convince everybody there was nothing really going on, let's have some fun with it. Well, it's nice they're having fun, but if you have questions about the airport, they're not laughing with you, they're laughing at you. And people took notice. Some even responded to that statement online. Cool. Instead of answering all the questions about the Freemason time capsule, the death horse you have outside, murals of slaughter on your walls, underground tunnels, etc., you make, of course, a gargoyle making fun of everything. Comedy is the best way to deflect real questions. Good job. The sheeple will fall right into your trap. Ha ha ha. Don't pay attention to the man behind the curtain, folks. See how funny this demonic statue is? Aren't the satanic global elitists so hilarious? Just keep laughing. Stay distracted. Nothing to see underneath this airport. Nothing at all. Ha ha ha. The question that always comes up is the underground area, the tunnels. And the answer is always the same. Whether it's an official response from the government-run airport or from Snopes or from YouTubers who are much more intelligent than we are, they say there's no way anyone can be down there and go unnoticed. A thousand people work under the airport every day. They would see something, obviously. Well, they never heard of the Greenbrier Hotel located about five hours away from Washington, D.C. It's an upscale resort that's been visited by 26 U.S. presidents and European royals. In the 1950s, the hotel was going through renovations. So the U.S. government piggybacked on the renovation project and installed a bunker under the hotel. Oh, that sounds familiar. Doesn't it? And they didn't install a little safe room. They built a 112,000 square foot bunker under that hotel. It has 25-ton blast doors, a power plant, cafeteria, a hospital with labs and a pharmacy. It can house 1,100 people and was the destination for all of Congress in case of an emergency. And for 30 years, nobody knew it was there, not even hotel workers. In 1992, the Washington Post exposed the facility and in 1995, the government stopped using it. Coincidentally, that's the same year that the Denver airport opened. The Greenbrier bunker had staff working there the entire time, right under everyone's nose. Some parts of it weren't even underground, and that was in a busy hotel. The area under the Denver airport is huge. So big, there are emergency phones for people who get lost. To say that you can't be fooled by a secret government project is nonsense. It's arrogant and it's annoying. But this is something we're seeing more and more these past few years. If you dare to question the narrative coming out of the government or the mainstream media... 601. Right. If you question them, you're labeled a conspiracy theorist. You're marginalized and mocked publicly. For most people, that's enough to shut them up. Why speak up if you're going to be attacked on Twitter? It's not worth it. If you do speak up, well, then they just censor you. But every once in a while, conspiracies turn out to be true. That's why I don't condescend to you. That's why I don't talk down to people who believe. I don't believe every story I cover here. I don't believe most of them. But I still want to find the truth if I can. And there have been some stories that I couldn't debunk. And when that happens, I'm honest with you about it. And if I think about the past six or seven years, I can rattle off six off the top of my head, six quote unquote conspiracies that if you talked about them would get you banned on social media, but they turned out to be true. Such as? No, I can't name them. Even though they're true, you still can't discuss them, at least not on certain platforms. But there are places online where you can talk about fringe topics and I encourage you to do it. I also encourage you to discuss these things with your friends and neighbors, family, coworkers. If they're condescending to you, don't take it personally. They're brainwashed. They'll eat whatever mainstream media lie burger they serve. Hey, <laughs> lie burger, huh? I like it. And isn't that ironic? Because they look down on those of us who question authority. They try to cancel those of us who call out lies when we see them. But when conspiracies turn out to be true, and from time to time they do, it will be us who stands between the skeptics and the tyrants trying to take their freedom. And when the smoke clears and the dust settles and we know everyone is safe, I'll be the first one to say, I told you.
Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. My name is AJ. You know Hecklefish. Hi there. Hello. And this has been The Y Files. If you had fun or learned anything, do us a favor and like, comment, subscribe, share. That stuff really helps. And like. All right. So Tesla won the, won the, uh, won the poll. Yeah, that's Gino. Gino's here. Hey. Hey, how you doing? Happy Thanksgiving. How you doing? Where's the Z? Where's the Z? Yeah, we... we we grew up eating uh, big ziti for Thanksgiving. We never had turkey. Crystal Cardoza, happy Thanksgiving. Hook sense Mel's hole. Everyone wants to get inside Mel's hole. There's no doubt about that. Paul's back for two. The what is that? The moon is a the moon is a Taurus. Didn't you used to drive before Taurus? Mike R, thank you for the five. Can Jen explain the Van Allen belt again? Jen, can you explain the how how do you get the, through the Van Allen belts? Okay, so she's gonna she come to the Van Allen belt. All right. You, scientists buckle up is that the radiation is spread really far apart oh you're going to do the whole thing okay I thought we were going to do the oh. bit there there you go alright that's how you get through she didn't know we were going to do the bit Eric Barstow thank you for the 20 the technical difficulties and made this entertaining uh, for you I I'm glad thanks for reaching out to us um, oh our age negative bloodline of Mary and Jesus episode that, that's interesting we have a couple of Bible stories coming up, which which I enjoy, and I'm not a religious person, but I just I like the stories. Johnny Erlingo, you're very welcome. Thanks for showing up today. As Farah, good to see you. Happy Thanksgiving. Mischief, giving good plugs as always. F fizz gig, we only need hand gestures, Jen. Ha. Huh? <laughs> yeah, she didn't know that we were doing a bit. She was going to do the whole science thing. There are gaps in the Van Halen belt. It's called the Hagar years. That's, that's absolutely right. It is Mojo UK. Thank you for the 20 pound. Keep it up, team. We all love your content worth the wait. Thank you very much. I'm glad you guys are here. And thanks to everyone who's super chatting today. That really helps keep it going. Uh, Mr. Mensa, bad hair day. This is just... Yeah, I, I, I was up at five. This is the best I could do. Uh, uh, Gray man, I hope you all... And especially if you're enjoying your family holiday, don't gulp the bourbon and wine too fast. Yeah, so we're halfway through the stream, but I don't know if I can hold off on the cocktails much longer. I just, I, I, you don't want to be, you don't want to do this drunk. It's not a good look. Besides, I'm a, I'm a fun, happy drunk, and I start to tell the truth. YouTube doesn't like that. Brian L, thank you for the 20. I appreciate that. There's Michael of Fevers for 10. Looks like a nested or a NAT problem on your home router that you don't have at the office. I think you'll just have to go with the video audio let the chat go during. It's, an, it's audio routing, Michael, because I'm running it all through the computer, and uh, you have to do loop back and all kinds of stuff to get it to work. At the studio, I just use a mixer, which is what I should have done today. Mysticles. Oh, I got you. For 10, happy Thanksgiving. It's also my birthday. Happy birthday. You got the best gift ever, my hecklefish plushie. It's the best gift ever. Incopotams, you're going to start to tell the truth. No, I just get, I get a little off color. No, my can Gino tell us the Thanksgiving story? I know he can. Triggered Christian, shrouded, torn, yeah. That we're going to cover um, objects from the Bible that are interesting, that may or may not be real. Shroud of Torin, the Holy Grail, Spear of Destiny. Just buy hardware better than software every time, man. Every time. John Morgan, thank you for doing this. Thank you for showing up. I know the holidays are hard, so we just wanted to give you some company. You know, I don't, I don't expect anyone to sit here and just watch this for six hours, but you put it on in the background. Maybe lighten the mood. Maybe distract that annoying uncle of yours. We all have that guy. There's Valerie Brooks. Thank you for Five Canadian. Just joined a few weeks ago, and I think I've watched all the videos twice. Thank you for spending your turkey day with us. Glitches and all. You're very, very welcome. Small town girl off color is the way to go. Brian, since you're both, thank you for the 25. This episode of At Home with the Wife House is great. Who needs boring old football? I didn't even know there was a sports match on today. I didn't even know that. Eli, thank you for the, uh, what are those? Are those rubles? Are those rupees? What are the R's? Oh, hi, I'm Elaine, Eli Elian, and I'm watching the show all oh, from South Brazil. Love you guys. Love the show. Happy Thanksgiving. 
Same to you. Thanks. And say hi in Brazil. And Earth Singularity 70. A modern day goldfish lives in style, but you haven't tipped in quite a while. Earth singularity. Uh, your love outshines a galaxy of stars of love in our galaxy. There are possibly over 400 billion stars in the galaxy. Your hope and light outshines them all. Thank you for being you. Thank you. Well, that's very nice of you to say, Earth singularity, and a very generous tip. I appreciate that. Good to see you rocking out in, in the chat with some, uh, with some rush. Marlboro, good to see you. Happy Thursday. Daniel K., excited about the rush. Hecklefish is the goat. Yeah, thanks to everyone super chatting. Um, Patreon is the best way to support the channel. It's only three bucks, and we get to keep most of that money. Super chats, we only get to keep about half. Google takes the rest. James, Neil Pert forever. He might, might have been the best to ever do it, right? You go Neil Pert, you go bottom. Tough choice for me. Happy Thanksgiving, Link. Here's Yellow Umbrella Homebrew, very reliable. Good to see you on a Thursday. Where does he read the comments, says uh, Michael. I've got the, the normal chat on the right side that you guys see, and then I have the super chats over here on the left. There's Ty Ortega for 10. Thank you for doing this. It's made my Thanksgiving great. You guys being spring, bring so much joy in my everyday life. Only watching two weeks, but watched it. I'll need more. Well, I'm glad to bring a little smile to your life. Uh, Tony Deroni. Are you all family? Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, we are. I think, I think, I think Josh from work might be stopping by. He's not family, but he's part of the Wi-Fi's family. Neil Pert stands alone. Says TF2 observer. Hard to argue with that. All right. So Tesla won the poll, right? Let's confirm it. With alien bases, a close second. Wow, Thursday night NFL takes a backseat to the Y Files. Wow. Marlboro on repeat all through the night. Gertie loves to dance because she's a camel. Daniel Schmidt for five. Happy Thanksgiving, AJ and Jen. Looking forward to the forthcoming Anunnaki episode. I think he said he was basing it on Zachariah Sitchin's work. Yes. Um, that episode's almost ready to go. I'm just spacing it out because we covered so much of it in Gobekli Tepe. And I mentioned the Anunnaki again in, in this coming episode about, um, about the Project Looking Glass. We'll bring, bring the Anunnaki back into that. Uh, what do I think about Gary McKinnon? I believe him. I believe Gary McKinnon. And he didn't really hack. They, they call him a hacker. It, it was The U.S. government just had the servers open. Gary just figured out how to get on them. He didn't do any damage in there, but boy, they chased him around for years. And you know, kudos to, to the UK for not giving him up. They didn't have to protect him, and they did. James Green, thank you for the 10. Yeah, me, God's listening. I hope so. I hope he doesn't mind the technical difficulties. Harry Tell one, nuke the moon. I, I don't recommend it. I do not recommend it. I have a feeling it is protected. James D. for 10, thank you so much for doing this. I live in a different state than my family. So it's a treat to get to celebrate with my wife house family today. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone. You're very welcome. Uh, Irvin, do you think the Anunnaki is our ancestor? I believe a lot of that story. You know, about the DNA splicing with aliens and all that. I'm not sure, but I, I enjoy the story. But we're going to get into all of that. We're going to get into it a little bit next week and then on the full Anunnaki episode. Britney English for five. You guys are amazing. Are there any new topics you found to make a great video for? I have a list of hundreds. Hundreds of them. 
which had Lloyd Campbell's Love to Dance. Does Abraham, Abraham Lincoln's ghost haunt the White House? I haven't heard that. I didn't hear that. Uh, Cresta Leon, we should do an April Fool's episode all about cryptids. That's a good idea. Small town girl, uh, Gary did not serve time. The UK protected him. Uh, Melvis, 080349, Happy Thanksgiving. Do camels eat turkey? Asking for a friend. Oof. I don't know. I think they just eat hay. Lucia, her, Lucy H. Love that you're doing this. My fam is in other states, like having Thanksgiving with my wife, house fam. Did I just read that? Did someone say the same exact thing? James, it was almost the same words. It's because it's the simulation, is why. Thanks, Winters Crow. Good to see you. Good evening. Bad take. Bo, John, Bohan. D Banks is there. Behold, I have more pie. Simon, AJ, don't make it bland. Turn strange tale and make it grand. I try. I try to make it entertaining without being too cheesy. Next week's episode has a kind of an Indiana Jones vibe, at least to the opening of it. Because they find the technology from, uh, it's ancient Sumerian technology. Matrix glitch, says Grim. Yeah, I agree. All right, Tesla is the winner. Let's see if we can get air to work. Nikola Tesla believed that he could harness the energy from inside the Earth and transmit that power wirelessly around the world. His early experiments were successful, but his research mysteriously vanished after his death. There is no evidence left of Tesla's wireless power technology. Or is there? For years, we were taught that the Great Pyramid of Giza was a tomb for a king. It wasn't. It had a different purpose. Tesla didn't invent wireless power. It's been here for 5,000 years, and probably a lot longer than that. Okay, why were the pyramids built? Uh, storage for dead mummies. Dead mummies? Uh, it's a tautology. Mainstream Egyptology says that the Great Pyramid of Giza is a tomb built for Khufu, the fourth dynasty Egyptian pharaoh who ruled 4,500 years ago. But the Great Pyramid doesn't have any characteristics of other Egyptian tombs. The Great Pyramid contains no artifacts, no hieroglyphs, and no elaborate wall art. It's been argued that the granite sarcophagus found in the king's chamber once contained Khufu's mummy. There's no evidence that a mummy was ever there. No mummy has ever been found in any pyramid, ever. Ancient Egyptians considered their pharaohs gods, the Great Pyramid is a strange structure for a god. Small chambers, narrow shafts, no markings at all. The way the pyramid was built and the materials used to build it suggest it had a different purpose. The sides of the pyramid are aligned with the compass with such accuracy that only modern engineering can match it. The Great Pyramid is a mountain made of two and a half million blocks of stone weighing six million tons, piled 481 feet high. Its footprint is over 13 acres, to align this construction within 1 15th of a degree of true north is impossible precision. The base of the Great Pyramid is leveled within three quarters of an inch. The only way to do this with modern structures is to use lasers. Even though the sides of the pyramid are over 755 feet long, made of stone blocks weighing between 2 and 40 tons each, each side is within two inches of any other. That's 99.98% accurate. Fun fact, the pyramid doesn't have four sides. It actually has eight. Each side is slightly concave that you can only really see from directly above, or when the pyramid casts shadows during the equinoxes. And yes, those angles too are perfect. Whoever built the pyramids somehow knew the size of the earth. If you take the height of the pyramid and multiply it by 43,200, you get 3,938.685 miles, which is within 11 miles of the polar radius of the planet. That's 99.7% accurate. If you take the perimeter of the base of the pyramid and multiply that by 43,200, you get 24,734.94 miles. That's the Earth's circumference at the equator within 99.3% accuracy. 
We know that the ancients were obsessed with equinoxes, when the day and the night are the same lengths. The length of the day and night on an equinox is 43,200 seconds. Now, skeptics will say this relationship between 43,200 and the size of the Earth is forced. They say, well, the planet is different sizes in different places, so this is just a coincidence. No, is this one of those episodes where we make the skeptics look like idiots? A little bit, yeah. Oh, good, I love those. Don't gloat. Oh, and the skeptics! <laughs> Most of the Great Pyramid is constructed of nummulite limestone, the reddish-brown blocks that we see today. This rock is found close to the site and is abundant. But the builders of the pyramid also used unusual materials not found locally. The exterior of the pyramid was once covered in casing stones made of bright white limestone. They were polished smooth and fit together so tightly that no seams were visible. These casing stones were cut and shipped from a quarry in Tura, almost 500 miles away. That's like carrying thousands of 10-ton stone blocks the length of the entire state of Florida. They must have been special. Unlike the limestone cut locally, Tura limestone lacks magnesium. This makes it an excellent insulator. Limestone can carry an electrical current. Tura limestone can't. Interior chambers were built with a rare type of granite called rose granite, also brought from hundreds of miles away. This granite has a high concentration of silicon dioxide, also known as quartz. When quartz is compressed or even just moved, it creates a charge called piezoelectricity. One face of the quartz will have a positive charge. The other will have a negative charge. Connect the two faces together and you have an electrical circuit. Because of this property, quartz is used in all kinds of modern devices like watches, clocks, TVs, GPS units, and on and on. To charge a watch that uses quartz, all you have to do is shake it. And if you've ever used a barbecue lighter, the voltage is created by a quartz crystal. The king and queen's chambers were built with granite that is 85% quartz. The tunnels and passageways are also lined with quartz-rich granite. If pressure was applied to all this granite, it would generate a tremendous amount of electricity, turning the pyramid into a giant power plant. And there's proof that this is exactly what happened. The idea that the Great Pyramid was a power plant is not new. It was first proposed in the 1970s. It was and, and is considered a fringe theory. Ooh, those are my favorite kind of theories. I know. The fringier, the better. The fringier, fringier. Now that doesn't sound right. Um, uh, let's... What's your problem? Oh, I'm sorry. Is the show interrupting your train of thought? No uh, sarcasm. Nice. Well, what do you Excuse expect? I'm trying me, to set up the show here, and it's not easy to do There's when no you're jumping in with comments. As more and more discoveries were made over the years, more evidence emerged that the Great Pyramid as a power plant wasn't fringe science, but actual science. One of the most compelling cases comes from Christopher Dunn. He believes the process starts in the subterranean chamber. Below the pyramid are aquifers. As water moves through the underground cavities, sound waves are created. The frequency of these waves resonate with the Earth's natural vibration. As those waves move up through the pyramid, a process is used to magnify, focus, and convert the sound into energy. The Queen's Chamber was used for a chemical reaction that created hydrogen, and there's substantial proof of this. There are two interior shafts that lead to the Queen's Chamber. The northern shaft has traces of hydrochloric acid. The southern has traces of hydrated zinc chloride. Combining these two chemicals creates a volatile reaction that generates hydrogen, a lot of hydrogen. This hydrogen gas would flow from the Queen's Chamber through the horizontal passage and into the Grand Gallery. The Grand Gallery is also made of granite. As the hydrogen gas builds up, the pressure compresses the granite, creating electricity. This electricity also ionizes the air, increasing conductivity. Within the Grand Gallery were 27 or 28 pairs of resonators that would vibrate and emit sound. The hydrogen atoms would organize themselves into waves in sympathy with the sound waves of the gallery. These sound waves further excite the stone, creating even more electricity. Oh, so let me get this straight. You stick the shafts into the queen's chamber, which gets the stones excited. Uh, that's right, but somehow when you say it, it sounds dirty. Hehe, <laughs> I'm a naughty, naughty fish. Acoustic engineers have determined the gallery resonates at 440 hertz and naturally emits an F-sharp chord. 440 hertz and the F-sharp chord have been connected to a lot of woo-woo ideas, but there's a reason for that. It's considered a sound that resonates in harmony with the Earth. The builders of the pyramid knew this. Longtime Mac users will recognize this sacred chord. 
At the top of the gallery is a small shaft leading to the king's chamber. The opening is 8.4 by 4.8 inches. This is the perfect size for hydrogen microwaves to pass into the king's chamber, which also resonates at 440 hertz and F sharp. Above the king's chamber are five layers of granite beams, stacked and separated by air gaps. This is called the relieving chamber because it was believed that this interior structure relieved the weight of the pyramid. That's not what it does. The beams are smooth on three sides, but rough cut on the top. Christopher Dunn believes the reason for the rough cut is, this is how the beams were tuned. The builders could vibrate the granite beams and slowly chip away at the stone until they resonated with an F-sharp chord, which they do. The King's Chamber is what's known as a Helmholtz resonator. When you blow air across the top of a bottle and create sound, that's a Helmholtz resonator. Change the volume of liquid in the bottle, or change the volume of stone within the chamber, you change the pitch. The entire complex is a giant musical instrument. Now, some skeptics reluctantly agree that the Great Pyramid has musical properties. But for skeptics to consider the pyramid as a power plant, they would need evidence to show that a giant stone pyramid would respond to electromagnetic energy. There was no evidence of that until 2018. Whether true or not, it's scientifically possible that the Great Pyramid was a structure for creating, harnessing, and focusing energy. The exterior was made of material that insulates electricity. The interior was made of material that conducts electricity. The chambers were made of material that creates electricity. The next piece of evidence is the pyramid's ability to focus EM energy. In 2018, scientists used radio waves at different frequencies to see if the Great Pyramid would interact with electromagnetic waves of a resonant length. Their experiments proved that in a resonant state, the pyramid can concentrate electromagnetic energy in the internal chambers as well as under its base. Resonance in the pyramid can be induced by radio waves with the lengths ranging from 200 to 600 meters. The closer to 200 meters, the more dramatic the effect. A year after that, in 2019, Eric Wilson published a paper called A Large-Scale Thermal Acoustic Generator. The paper describes how, when granite and other rocks are vibrated, electrons will migrate through the rock and up to the surface. By combining science and music, the builders of the pyramid created a power-generating machine tuned to the natural harmonic of the Earth's vibration. Vibration that primarily comes from the tidal energy created by the moon's gravity. This technology created thousands of years ago could generate unlimited clean energy. But how did they get the energy out? That brings us back to Tesla. His Wardenclyffe Tower was built on top of an aquifer with copper and iron rods extending down into the water. When electricity was sent into the tower, it was to be transmitted around the world through the atmosphere. The pyramid is also built on an aquifer and copper pipes and iron rods have recently been discovered there. If the capstone was made of gold, the energy concentrated inside the pyramid would have been drawn to the top and transmitted to the atmosphere. Tesla's wireless power distribution system used the resonance of the Earth, just like the pyramid. And just like the pyramid, the energy generated by Tesla's tower would be unlimited, clean, and virtually free for everyone on the planet. But Tesla's tower was destroyed by outside forces. There's evidence that the Great Pyramid was destroyed from within. In the year 1900, Nikola Tesla convinced J.P. Morgan to fund a project to create a wireless communication system. When Tesla received the funding, he decided to scale up the project. Rather than transmit messages around the world, he would transmit power. Tesla had already demonstrated that wireless power would work on a small scale. He famously had light bulbs scattered on the ground that would illuminate when a Tesla coil was activated nearby. Now he wanted to go bigger. He explained this world-changing technology to JP Morgan and asked him for more money to complete the project. Rather than support Tesla, Morgan pulled his funding, claiming breach of contract. JP Morgan owned General Electric, which would be made obsolete. He owned AT&T, which would also become obsolete. JP Morgan owned copper mines all over the world, and his factories generated miles of copper wire. JP Morgan owned rubber farms and factories that created insulation for wire. He owned steel companies and factories that built power generators. He owned timber mills that created telegraph and electricity poles. He owned coal mines that fueled existing power plants, and he owned two dozen railroads that transported all these resources around the country. 
None of this would be necessary if Tesla created free, unlimited wireless power. For several years, Tesla wrote JP Morgan almost every month, begging him to reconsider. He wouldn't. Instead, JP Morgan chose to finance Tesla's competitors, Edison and Marconi, who were improving on and getting rich from Tesla's inventions. And not only did JP Morgan refuse any further investment, but he also put out word to everyone in the wealthy investor class that Tesla should be avoided. He was essentially blacklisted. By 1915, Tesla had accumulated so much debt that the bank foreclosed on the Wardenclyffe property. The tower was demolished in 1917 and sold for scrap. The project was never completed. Tesla was a genius, but he was at a disadvantage. Men like Edison and Marconi knew how to bring Tesla's inventions to market. They knew how to make technology accessible. And most of all, they knew how to play the game. You don't bite the hand that feeds you. That's why 84% of the world's energy is created from fossil fuels. It's also why Tesla died alone and broke. It's possible that the Great Pyramid suffered some catastrophic event that caused it to stop working. In addition to hydrochloric acid, there are traces of sulfuric acid in the southern shaft. In the northern shaft, there's zinc chloride and ammonium chloride. These chemicals can create hydrogen without being mixed. But if you do combine ammonium chloride with sulfuric acid, you get more than a reaction. You get an explosion. Because of the structure of the pyramid, this explosion could be controlled. But there's evidence that an uncontrolled explosion may have occurred. In 2001, in the Grand Gallery, scorch marks were discovered in the ceiling above where the resonators would have been. In the King's Chamber, cracks have been found in the granite beams. At first, this was thought to be caused by an earthquake, but the damage was only found in areas of the pyramid where the flow of highly compressed, heated hydrogen occurred. The walls in the King's Chamber have been pushed out over an inch. It takes a lot of pressure to push tons of granite out that far. The Great Step outside the King's Chamber also shows extensive damage like that from an explosion, not an earthquake. Other parts of the interior also show signs of charring. When the southern shaft was discovered, it was coated with salt about an inch thick. This would happen if hydrogen was boiling and bubbling up the shaft. What caused the pyramid power plant to explode is not known. But Christopher Dunn believes it was some sort of cataclysm. Not an earthquake, but maybe an asteroid impact. There's a problem with this theory, though. The ancient Egyptians kept meticulous records of everything. There is no record of an impact during this time. Dunn believes it happened thousands of years earlier. And that brings me to this thought. Skeptics will say if the ancient Egyptians used electricity, there would be documentation, even hard evidence of it. You'll see true believers point to glyphs that look like light bulbs, but I honestly think that's a stretch. There's no evidence the Egyptians worked with glass or any components used to make a light bulb. So why is there no evidence of the use of electricity in ancient Egypt and no record of electricity being generated by the Great Pyramid? Well, because the ancient Egyptians didn't build it. There really is no debate by mainstream academics about the who, when, why, or how of the Great Pyramid. It was built by ancient Egyptians in 4500 BC as a tomb for Khufu, and that's that. But what if none of that is true? What if the ancient Egyptians didn't build the pyramid, but found it? And when they found it, it had been dormant for years, maybe thousands of years. Graham Hancock is a proponent of the Orion constellation theory. This says the Great Pyramid complex is almost a perfect match for the stars in the Orion constellation. But they don't line up to where Orion is today. They line up with where Orion was in the sky 13,500 years ago. We've discussed how the builders were obsessed with equinoxes. The Sphinx faces due east. And on the vernal equinox, the constellation that rose due east 13,500 years ago was Leo. Now, I'll concede the astronomical evidence could be a coincidence. But there is hard evidence that these structures are older than originally thought. You can't carbon date limestone. But there are clues that the pyramid and the Sphinx have been there for a long, long time. Robert Schock from Boston University believes the Sphinx and Giza complex is about 13,500 years old. Giza has been an extremely dry climate since the time of the pharaohs. But the Sphinx shows signs not only of wind and sand erosion, but also extreme water erosion. The erosion patterns around the base of the Sphinx could only occur if huge volumes of water were washing over the plateau at violent speeds. 
There's evidence this happened at the end of the Younger Dryas, which marked the end of the last ice age in 9700 BC. Glaciers were thought to have melted rapidly. Within a few centuries, sea levels rose 500 feet. This is fast in geologic time. But as more evidence was gathered, melting appeared to happen in a matter of decades. This would cause dramatic changes in the Earth's climate. But when recent ice core samples were studied, things got even more dramatic. There's evidence that the last ice age didn't end over centuries or decades, but ended in one single day. Some claim that an asteroid impact caused the last ice age to end. A worldwide disaster like the Chicxulub impact that wiped out the dinosaurs. That's not what happened. An impact causes cooling. Recent studies show that there was a major solar event that happened around 9700 BC. Basically, the mother of all CMEs. A violent plasma storm hit the Earth and overwhelmed the Earth's magnetosphere, which is our defense against solar radiation. Without the protection of the magnetosphere, massive lightning strikes happened all over the Earth. Lightning that was orders of magnitude more intense than anything we've ever seen. This lightning was hundreds or even thousands of times more powerful than anything from a thunderstorm. There's evidence in over 120 countries of rock melted and turned to glass during this event. This is called vitrification. There's evidence of vitrification in moon rocks. We know for a fact large mammals like saber-toothed tigers and woolly mammoths were wiped out at this time. They didn't slowly go extinct. They instantly went extinct. During the four or five days of this event, the Earth was also awash in lethal radiation. Only animals that can go underground survived. Most of the human race died during this event. Only humans living near caves were able to find shelter and survive. If glaciers, which covered 30% of the Earth's surface, melted in a day or two, think of the speed, volume, and pressure of water that would rush across the Earth's surface. This water would act like a power washer on stone constructions like the Sphinx and pyramids. Meanwhile, a sky full of plasma and lightning and radiation would have severely damaged the Great Pyramid if it was using a volatile chemical reaction to create power. Every culture has a flood myth that served as a reset of civilization. All those stories seem to point to a cataclysm at the end of the Younger Dryas. Myths of lost continents like Atlantis also fit into this timeline. Now, I'm not claiming anything I've said today is what happened, but I am saying there's evidence that it was possible that an advanced civilization existed thousands of years ago. That civilization had the technology to create unlimited clean energy. Then the glaciers melted, a great flood came, solar plasma and radiation destroyed a significant amount of life on the planet. The civilization then disappeared. Then thousands of years later, as the great Egyptian culture was forming, they would have utilized the pyramid, not for power, but for ceremonial or religious purposes. They would have altered the Sphinx, carving away the original design and replacing it with a design of their own. And we know this is what they did. Mainstream scientists are still not convinced, and that's okay. As time goes on and more secrets are revealed, sooner or later, we will learn the truth. And I suspect we'll learn that the pyramid power plant theory was right all along. Whoever built the pyramids created energy that wasn't harmful to the earth, but resonated in harmony with it. A suspicious person might wonder why, if this theory has been around for 50 years, nobody's tried to replicate it, even on a small scale. Unlimited clean energy for everyone on earth sounds like a way for the entire human race to take a huge step forward. Think of the technological advances that could be made if electricity was free. Think of the political strife, economic instability, and the endless wars that could be avoided. But maybe what's happening now is what happened to Tesla a hundred years ago. In Tesla's time, nobody was interested in creating technology that would make power free for everyone. Empires owned by JP Morgan, the Vanderbilts, and the Rockefellers would have been devastated. The Carnegies, the DuPonts, and the Mellons all would have seen significant losses. These families owned all the energy production and distribution in the United States. Their companies were the lifeblood of American industry. The families were American royalty. If Tesla was able to achieve his vision, not only would the wealth of these families be diminished, so would America's standing in the world as a great new industrial power. Tesla said he wanted to bring abundant electrical energy to remote, underdeveloped parts of the world, to foster closer communication between nations. This couldn't be allowed to happen. 
America and the corporations that controlled it would never have given up their advantage. They still won't. When Tesla died, the FBI and agents of the OSS were, for some reason, close by. Tesla's documents were stored in 80 boxes, all organized and numbered by Tesla himself. Only 60 boxes were discovered. And since then, a few scientists have stated that Tesla's invention would have never worked. But that's what scientists said of most of his inventions. Viewers of this channel know that most science is bought and paid for by corporations and governments. This is especially true in the last couple of years. Get the jab! Right. Another jab! Another jab! Another! Yep. What do those jabs work or not? You human pincushions are making people rich! Oh, there's no doubt about that. 80% of the products we use today can be traced back to Tesla. But the technology that we really need, now more than ever, is inexpensive, clean energy. Sadly, that technology died with Tesla. Instead, the world went in the direction of coal and oil. And nations fought and continue to fight wars to control these limited resources. Oil, coal, and war may be terrible for the planet and the people who live on it, but they're great for business. And for all his genius, that's something Nikola Tesla never understood. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. My name is AJ, that's Hecklefish. This has been The Y Files. If you had fun or learned anything, do us a favor and like, subscribe, comment, and share. I hate to give you homework, but that stuff really helps. And like most topics we cover on the channel, today's topic was recommended by you. Thank you for the kind words. Simon, that's naughty. Yeah, that's one of my favorite episodes too. I agree, Ancestral Arts. Uh, Small Town Girl, which episode won the poll? I missed it. I had to go. It, uh, alien bases on the moon. Thanks, Dan. good to see you. Alien bases on the moon is what is the winner. And, uh, this live stream is a mess. You should be ashamed of yourself. Shame. Shame. Shame on you. Mr. Stu, thank you for the £4.99. Happy Thanksgiving. All enjoy your turkey. Gotta wait till Christmas for mine. I, we grew up eating ziti. Turkey's fine. It's what the wife wanted to do. Dr. TBKE499, would you ever cover Stefan McCallick? Grid pattern burns on his chest. Falcon like a I don't know that story, but if you email me that, I'll look into it. Sounds like a good one. Make Atlantis great again. Love it. Be a, that'd be a cool hat. Uh, Stan, I see a lot of ham radio symbolism in your videos. Are you a ham? What's your call? I haven't passed the test yet, Stan. I, it's something I, I just never seem to have time for, but I'm just a, I'm a fan of it. One day. Cybertech, but thank you for the two. Love your ads with Hecklefish, best channel ever. I try really hard to make the ads fun. Because I, there are some creators I follow that are great, and then when they, in their video, when they get to their ad, it's just it comes to a crashing halt. So I try to make it entertaining. And that's the ads is where we learn a lot of the history about you know the characters on the show. Shadow People episode. All right, we'll put that in the next poll. Huckleberry, thank you. He loves the ads. JDM never skips the ads. I appreciate that. I mean, here's the secret if you want to skip. The ads are usually like two and a half, three minutes, sometimes four if I'm feeling crazy. The first minute and a half are just jokes just us setting up a problem for the sponsor to solve, and then that's about a minute, and then we wrap it up in a few seconds. So once, once you hear me say, hey, is that today's sponsor? Then you, then you can skip. <laughs> then you can skip. Well, Shell's favorite is the respawn about gravity versus electricity. Very interesting. Cat AMH370, that episode is coming up. Aerofoam 1, happy Thanksgiving to you. I'm going to call you Ia. Happy Turkey Day, guys. Hard at work, huh? Can we get some classic eps? Year one eps. You know what? Next poll, I'll throw a couple of those in there. It's weird to see some of those. Ty Ortega. And they're, they're playing trivia back there, and it's hard for me to... It's distracting because I know it's a lot of the answers. I, I, like, like, I know this answer. It's fun. Did you get it? No. No, this is Nemo. It's Captain Nemo. No. Name of the captain at 20,000 leagues. Name of the captain at 20,000 leagues. Uh, it's Nemo. Yes, it is. 
Yeah. I was, I'm telling the chat it's distracting because when I know the answer, oh, I'm, I'm like, ooh, ooh. No, 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 it's okay. Uh, Johnny, thank you for the $3 super sticker. I appreciate that. And thanks to everyone supporting the channel today with your generosity. We do appreciate that. And I hope you're having a wonderful Thanksgiving. I know the holidays can be hard. So we just wanted to keep you company today. Commander Dante, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. I, I think that's an underrated movie. I like that one. Combat Rose loves 20,000 leagues under, under the sea. Yeah, it's a classic. It holds up. Chupa, the, the Anunnaki episode is coming. Um, it's basically ready, but so much of it was covered in Gobekli Tepe that I'm just putting a little space between it. But I'm going to talk about the Anunnaki next week a little bit with Project Looking Glass, because that's where the tech came from. Um, David, uh, will you ever cover the Billy Meyer case contactees? I mean, if enough people want to see it, I'll cover it. Tony Elbows, who does the voice of Hecklefish? Can someone tell him? There's your answer. Wait, I don't know. Um, and that, that's been a t-shirt request is who does your voice. Okay. <laughs> okay, you're going to hate this. Grind Tooth for five happy Thanksgiving. Quick hello to say thank you to the content you provide, Agent Jen. You're very welcome. Uh, Griffin. I'm glad that you're here, Osman. Canadian five. Happy Thanksgiving well, from Canada. Thanksgiving. Love the channel. I'm definitely it's picking up a heck of a fish plushie this weekend. I appreciate that shopped at thewifiles.com, and we recently took the store back over in-house. So if you haven't been there in a while, you'll see all the prices are way down. You can't charge $25, $30 for a t-shirt. That annoys me. 20 bucks. T-shirt should be 20 bucks. Bonsai fam, why is there a ladder to a small hole in the wall? I'm told it's a blanket ladder. That's what I'm told. There's Jeffy P. Hey, happy Thanksgiving, everyone. But from Ontario, Canada, I want to let you know you're about a month late for the celebration. Yeah, but, you know, the United States always falls behind Canada, don't we? Mark Lane 49 doing a show on the Tall Blondes. Maybe. If enough people want to see it, we can cover that. That's one of the, that's one of the races that uh, John Lear talked about a lot. What? WTF is a blanket ladder. That's what I said. It's not a ladder to, to my hole. Could be a ladder to Mel's hole. Uh, still, is the mic too low, or am I just moving around too much? There you go. Pumped it up for you. Bill Barkley, who does the camel's voice? She does her own voice. Who does your voice? Here's Peter Pearson, laying home with a broken leg. And I've counted down for every new app, best every week. Well, get well soon, Peter. That sucks to be laid up with a broken leg. Still waiting for an episode on Harp. I covered Harp pretty extensively um, in a few different episodes, like quite a bit. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but I covered Harp quite, quite a bit. Paradox, you have to take a drink every time I say, say uh, Mel's Hole. Bobby's World Adventures, thank you for the five. I could finally upgrade my vodka to Belvedere. No more swimming in the cheap stuff. Love the show from Springfield, Ohio. Well, thanks for showing up today. Max Seal, where's Hecklefish? Hecklefish has the guppies this weekend, so he's got his fins full. Nora Mac 499, happy Thanksgiving to the best YouTuber on the planet. Oh, that's very nice of you to say. Jen would like to see more about Area 51. You're going to get it next week. In fact, um... I'm going to do basically a tour. I'm going to talk you through the S-4 facility where Bob Lazar allegedly worked. I'm going to take you through every floor and talk about all the, all the vehicles and the contraptions that are in that building down on each level. And at the bottom is Project Looking Glass where they can see through time. It's going to be a fun one. Oh, my stomach's growling. See Morrow for five Canadian. Thank you for the super sticker. Gamer time for five dollars. Holy mackerel! You see what I did there? Thanks for dropping a couple of shekels on me, human. 
Love your deep dives. Work files b flies by when I listen. I appreciate that. And if you don't know, um, the Y Files Operation Podcast, I release two episodes every week. One is just the episode that you see on YouTube, but I, the second episode of the week is a deep dive on on topics that we cover. So those episodes are an hour long or more. And I can cover a lot of the material that I don't cover here or I can't cover here because it'll get censored. So that's the Y Files Operation Podcast. It's available just about everywhere. I think we're top 50 on Spotify this week. Chris, thank you for going live today. You're very welcome. Simon, when is cocktail hour? I'm, I, I'm, I'm really jonesing, man. I'm ready. Uh, yellow glasses, I have them, but I'm standing right now, which is a mistake. So the magnification is wrong. Yeah, it's, he, it's for here. I can see from here. So all you youngsters out there, it's comes for, it comes for all of us. I had perfect eyesight my whole life. Perfect. And then all of a sudden, Cisco Jones and for alcohol is a trouble sign. It is, you know, but admitting it is, that's the first step to recovery, isn't it? And, um, and nothing but respect to all you chip holders out there. So very thankful to my family. You all are keeping my spirits up while I'm stuck in the hospital. Love you guys from Gainesville, Florida. We'll get well soon, Von Grimm. I hope you're okay. Diana Varginha, or as I wish we would say, Varginha, is a Brazil story, and, and I covered it. That's a, that's, a, that's a fun one. Throbbing Glock. Thanksgiving from Boston. Happy to you. Throbbing Glock. Never shot one of those. Lily C., happy Thanksgiving to you. Thank you for the four ninety nine. Justin Farmer, what's a ham up? That's a uh, amateur radio. John Thompson, I spent Thanksgiving alone. Not if you're with us. That's why we're here. Crit Nature says, as a non American, I wish you a happy Thanksgiving. Curious when you're on Gary's Nerd Roddick's Forbidden Frontier podcast. Would love to see you there. I haven't had time, but, um, but I, I'm in contact with X Ray Girl, and I'd love to get on there. I just haven't had a chance because I'm so far behind everything. Michael P. Ecclefish isn't Jewish. He's, you know, he's from the Bronx, so that's why you hear a lot of Yiddish. EC, thank you for the two dollars. Happy Thanksgiving. Wins Project Looking Glass next week. JDM Hot Saki. That sounds good. That sounds very good. I am, oh, I, I am with JD. Love how neutral you are in every story. Thanks for the entertainment. Happy Thanksgiving. Same to you. Corey Norton, it's 5 o'clock somewhere. I hear you. Okay, he's not Chinese. He's goldfish. Looks like it's almost turkey time. Oh, it looks good. It's got that color. Can you, uh, can you see that? Vodka says skip ner nerd rotic. I think Gary. I think Gary does some good stuff. Buzz Darkin, did you see your picture in the opening of the show today? You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna play the opening one more time for for everyone just joining us, and then we'll get into the next episode, which is Alien Bases on the Moon. Thank you for watching the After Files live stream. This is not a professional production. We don't know why anyone watches this thing, but we're glad you do. And now, to kick off the show is everyone's favorite sidekick, the one, the only, Hecklefish. Making your way in the world today takes everything you've got. Taking a break from all your worries sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you like to get away? Sometimes you wanna go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You wanna be where you can see a troubles are all the same. You wanna be where everybody knows your name. You 
The After Files is streamed in front of a live audience. Anyone in the, is there anyone in the chat who is in that video? Because all those pictures are from people who, who, when you buy merch, about a week later or so, you get an email asking you to send a picture of you wearing the merch. So I collect all those, and those are at the end of every episode. You'll see scroll by. So if you send those in, you're, you're in every video. So, uh, so those were the famous Mastiffs in there. Zeb saw himself in there. He was the Superman's chest. Ray Koontz is now a flounder. Thank you for joining Patreon. We couldn't do this without Patreon. We, we couldn't do it. Easton, welcome back from dinner. I'm glad you're using the old end credit song, Music on Repeat. Yeah, me too. You want to smell, smell Hecklefish's teeth? Probably don't. Probably don't. All right, we're going to do alien bases on the moon. That's what they say. And before I set up the next poll, if there's something you want to see, drop it in the chat, and I'll put it in the poll. And here we go. When Ingo Swan released his book titled Penetration in 1998, he claimed to be a psychic who was employed by the CIA to remote view the dark side of the moon, specifically to look for alien presence. It sounded like science fiction, but in 2006, when the CIA started releasing documents on the Stargate project, Swan's participation in the program was confirmed. When Swan was asked about the existence of extraterrestrials, he said, not only were they already here, but they are building something on the far side of the moon. And according to Swan, these aliens aren't friendly. Let's find out why. When Ingo Swan was a child, his family noticed he had psychic potential. When he got older, he wanted to explore this talent, so he began volunteering for experiments in ESP. At first, researchers tested Swan to see if he could influence plants with mental activity or alter the temperature of an environment using his mind. And Swan was successful enough that more and more scientists became interested in him. But it was a few years later where Ingo Swan would find his specialty. In the early 1970s, Swan was part of a study for the American Society of Psychical Research. And this study involved Swan sitting in a chair and attempting to project his consciousness into sealed boxes, which contained symbols that Swan would try to read. During one experiment, he was asked to see what he saw inside of a box and Swan said he saw nothing, just darkness. The researcher was disappointed and said, oh, that's too bad, let's try something else. Swan said, no, I see darkness because the light bulb inside the box is burnt out. The researcher was puzzled. He walked over to the box, opened it, and sure enough, the light was out and a star was born. Ingo Swan's success in these early experiments got the attention of the Stanford Research Institute. You might remember the SRI from our Project Stargate video, which I'll link below. SRI had been remote viewing places around the world for years, but once they found Ingo Swan, who was extremely successful at this, they wondered if he could remote view other places in the solar system. There was an experiment in 1973 where Ingo Swan was asked to project his consciousness to the planet Jupiter. At first, Swan rejected the idea. Ingo Swan never wanted to remote view anything that couldn't be confirmed. There are plenty of frauds who claim to have psychic abilities, and Swan valued his reputation. He didn't see any value in going to Jupiter if his observations couldn't be confirmed. But the researchers at SRI told Swan Jupiter was chosen because NASA had probes on the way there right now. So Swan agreed, and he made a lot of observations about Jupiter that the Pioneer probes soon confirmed. He saw a hydrogen mantle, rotating storms like cyclones, he mentioned high infrared readings, the colors of the clouds and ice crystals in the atmosphere. The probes confirmed all this. They did. Skeptics will say all these observations could be deduced, like, of course, Jupiter has violent storms, we can see them. Same with the color of clouds, infrared, and atmospheric ice crystals. Even if we can't see this stuff, we can deduce that they're there. But Swan saw something else, something new. He said he saw a ring around Jupiter, just like Saturn's ring. But Jupiter's ring, according to Swan, was much smaller than Saturn's and closer to the planet. He said it was made up of dust and tiny asteroids. This was not something we could see from Earth or even assume was there. Did the probe see the ring? 
The Pioneer probes in 1973 and 1974 did not see a faint ring around Jupiter. Oh. But when Voyager 1 passed by Jupiter in 1979... Tell me there was a ring. There was a ring. Yahtzee! I am not this body in terms of consciousness, and consciousness can go places where the body cannot. Ingo Swam was so accurate as a remote viewer that people began to take notice, specifically the United States government. Of course. In March 1975, Ingo Swan received a call at three in the morning. He was told to go to Washington and visit the Museum of Natural History. There he should stand near the elephant in the central rotunda at noon. So he does. Right on schedule, a military looking man approaches him and hands him a card. It reads, do not speak or ask questions. This is for our safety as well as yours. Please follow me. He's led to a car and seated next to another military looking man and in his book, he calls these guys the twins. And twin number two hands him another card. It reads, please do not speak. We need to search you for listening devices. They do, and he's handed one final card. We would like your help on a project suited to your talent. Are you comfortable in a helicopter? Well, Swan takes a long moment, finally nods. The twins take the cards from Ingo Swan's hand, then a bag is placed over his head, and the car speeds away. Though Ingo Swan couldn't see, he felt that he was driven around in circles. Eventually, he's led from the car where he hears a helicopter spinning up. His face still shrouded, he's buckled in and flown to a location in or near Washington, D.C. When the helicopter lands, Swan is led to a quiet building and then into an elevator. The doors open and the bag is finally removed. Swan blinks his eyes, adjusting to the light. Then a kindly looking man introduces himself as Mr. Axelrod. Ingo Swan is obviously nervous. And Mr. Axelrod sees this, he smiles, tells him not to worry that he's in no danger, and offers him a cigar. Swan gladly takes one. It's his brand. The men go to an office, sit and enjoy a cigar where Mr. Axelrod makes a proposal. Axelrod says he represents a group who would like Swan to participate in a remote viewing project. For his effort, he would be paid $1,000 a day in cash, which in today's money is over $6,000 a day. Inflation, huh? Yep. Are we going to talk about the Federal Reserve and what a scam it is? Uh, not in this video. Order to Fed! Okay, settle down. So, Ingo Swan really needs the money. But to get it, there are a few catches. First, he can't reveal any of this to anyone and can't speak of it for at least 10 years. The other catch is for the next few days, Swan isn't to leave the facility. He'll be provided with a comfortable room, TV, a gym, swimming pool, and anything he needs but if he takes the job, he stays on site under constant surveillance. Now, Ingo Swan is quiet for a while. As crazy as the past few years have been, he's never been through anything like this. Mysterious calls in the middle of the night, clandestine meetings, subterranean facilities, and now a kind but strange man offers him a lot of cash for an unknown mission. Axelrod sees Swan processing all of this and finally asks if he agrees to the terms. Swan nods that he does. Axelrod puts out his cigar, shakes Swan's hand and says, good, get some rest. Tomorrow, we begin. And it has very distinct features of a satellite dish. It's got the dish itself, the crater shape. It's got a long spike that appears to come out of the middle. All sorts of stuff that looks exactly like a satellite dish on Earth looks. The next morning, Axelrod tells Ingo Swan that he'll be remote viewing the moon. And Swan is confused by this, but Axelrod reminds him... No questions. Right. And Swan is given a list of coordinates and goes through them one by one. Some locations, he doesn't see anything, but others he was able to view large cliffs, see craters, dunes of white powder, all the things you'd expect to see on the moon. Finally, Swan comes across something interesting and confusing. He describes seeing tracks on the surface, tracks that seem to have been made by tractors or some kind of machinery. He sees patterns that look like they were made by wind, even though the moon has no atmosphere. Supposedly. Supposedly. Swan gets the sense that there is atmosphere there. Then Swan moves into a crater, which is filled with a green haze. Something is generating light. And Swan notes that the light is diffused. And diffused light isn't possible on the moon. You need an atmosphere to scatter the light. So if it's not the atmosphere, what is it? He moves closer to the light. Swan sees something that looks like an airfield. He describes large structures like hangars, roads, 
towers and machinery, across craters and chasms, there are bridges. Evidence of a lot of activity, industrial activity. Cut into the rocks are perfectly round holes, like they were dug with large earth moving equipment. He moves to a different location and sees some structures emitting light of all different colors. Swan goes in for a closer look. The domes have windows, and even though the area was dark, he could see a fine mist inside the structures and that same eerie green glow. Swan moves closer. He goes right up to the windows. Inside, he describes humanoid figures that look almost like us. He describes this as an area of high activity. Whoever or whatever these beings are, they're very busy. And Swan continues to observe, describing everything he sees. Suddenly, two of the beings, then three, then a dozen, then more, they just stop. They turn to the window where Swan has projected himself. This makes Swan very nervous. He says, they see me. Then calmly, but urgently, Axelrod says, come back, come back now. Swan says, they're pointing at me. Axelrod tells Swan firmly, please come back quickly away from that place. Swan wills his consciousness back and slowly opens his eyes. Finally, he turns to Axelrod and says, you already know they're psychic, don't you? Axelrod takes a deep breath and says, the experiment is over. It's time for you to go home. Neil and Buzz were on the lunar surface. Neil switched to the, the medical channel and spoke directly with the chief medical officer saying, they're here, they're parked on the side of the crater, they're watching us. Though Ingo Swan's moon experiment was over, Mr. Axelrod and the secret organization wasn't quite finished with him. About six months after leaving Washington, D.C., Swan was in a supermarket. While doing some grocery shopping, he spotted a stunning woman. He describes her as one of the most beautiful women he'd ever seen. What was she wearing? Don't, don't be creepy. Hello, I'm asking for science. Well, Swan says she was barely wearing anything at all. Short shorts, bikini top, and the tallest high heels he'd ever seen. Heels tall, bikini small. She said she liked the ocean. Excuse me? Hello, Cool J. I'm going back to Cali. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> nice. Anyway, Swan was obviously very taken with this woman because the chapter in his book, it's barely safe for work. He says when he saw her, he felt a wave of electricity going through him and felt tingling all over his body. Suddenly, he felt the hair on the back of his neck stand up. And in that moment, he had the distinct feeling that she was an extraterrestrial. Now, Swan was very aware of how ridiculous this sounded, and he was about to chalk it up to him simply being smitten at the sight of her. But then he turned around and saw the twins from the moon experiment. So he panics and runs out of the store. But later that evening, he receives a phone call. And he's told to fly to New York immediately and be in Grand Central Station the next morning and wait for contact. Of course, he goes. When he gets to Grand Central, he sees one of the twins standing near a payphone. He gestures at Swan to come over. The phone rings. It's Mr. Axelrod. Axelrod asks all kinds of questions about his interaction with the woman. And Swan relays the story. At first, Axelrod is suspicious. He demands to know if he knows her, if she saw him, if she might be following him. Now, Swan doesn't understand any of this, and he starts to become frightened. He tells Axelrod he's never seen her before and has never had any contact with her. Now, finally, Axelrod tells Swan, just stay away from her. Swan asks who she is. Axelrod says, all you need to know is that she's very dangerous. Swan says he understands, and they chat for a while. And Axelrod asks him how his remote viewing success rate is doing. Juan says he's almost 65% accurate, but not quite there. So Axelrod says, when you get to 65%, write the number 65 on a note on your desk and leave it there. Tell no one, we'll be in touch. And just like that, Axelrod hangs up. And Ingo Swan doesn't hear from Axelrod for a year, but he finally gets his remote viewing success rate to 65%. And just as he was instructed, he writes the number on a slip of paper and places it on his desk and goes home for the night. Now, even though his office is locked and nobody knows the code, when he gets in the following morning, the note is gone. And on his desk is what looks like a light dusting of powder. And in the powder, someone scribbled two words, expect contact. A few days after Ingo Swan was told to expect contact, he was heading to the university cafeteria when Mr. Axelrod appeared. Axelrod walked right up to Ingo Swan, shook his hand, and asked if he could get away for three or four days. Swan said sure, and asked where they were going. Axelrod smiled at him and asked, Have you ever seen a UFO? Holy shit! I didn't need to keep it sound on his face, didn't it? Do you hear that? That whistling sound? Woo! <laughs> 
The private jet landed a few hours later. Ingo Swan wasn't told where they were, but they had been flying due north for hours, so he assumed this was Alaska. It was the middle of the night and very dark and desolate. Mr. Axelrod, the twins, and Ingo Swan then climbed into an unmarked van. Swan was given a thermalized jumpsuit and asked to remove everything metal. They drove two hours through winding mountain roads before stopping under a group of pine trees. Axelrod said that it's very important that we're as quiet as possible. It's a 45 minute hike to their destination and they can't talk or make any noise whatsoever. Swan nodded in agreement and they ventured out into the wilderness. The twins were wearing what Swan thought to be night vision goggles because he could barely see a few feet in front of him. In fact, during some parts of the hike, he had to be led by the arm so he wouldn't fall into a creek or a hole or stumble over unsteady ground. They finally arrived at the edge of a lake and Swan asked what he was supposed to do. Axelrod whispered that he should just observe and observe in complete silence and also to be as still as possible. Axelrod said they detect heat, noise, and motion like mad. Swan's eyes went wide and he mouthed the word, they? Axelrod just brought his finger to his lips as if to say, shh. So the four men sat in silence for a long while until one of the twins made some kind of hand gesture. Axelrod said, it's begun. At first, Swan didn't see anything, just a fog coming off the lake. But slowly the fog began to change. Swan said the fog was emitting light. At first neon blue, which slowly changed what he called angry purple. The fog started getting thicker and thicker and then up from the lake, a triangle shaped craft emerged. It was about 90 feet wide and emitted a pulsing hum. Suddenly beams of light were shooting from the craft, hitting different locations around the area. One of the twins whisper shouted, we have to move. So they did. Then a beam of energy hit the area where the men were, and Swan remembers hearing a loud crack like lightning. And Swan was so stunned he couldn't move. He had to actually be dragged from the area. And Swan looked over his shoulder and saw water from the lake somehow being pulled into the craft. He described it as a reverse waterfall. And on the drive back, everyone was completely silent. Swan just stared out the window trying to absorb everything he just saw piece it together. When the van arrived at the airport, the sun was starting to come up. Swan said, I finally know what's going on. Axelrod said, go on. Swan said confidently, this was an unmanned drone. And Axelrod, like always, never confirmed or rejected Swan's ideas. He simply asked Swan to continue. Swan said, it's a resupply mission. They're mining the moon and they need our water. Axelrod smiled at this. He didn't agree, but he didn't disagree either. Axelrod shook Swan's hand, thanked him, and gestured toward a waiting plane. Ingo Swan would be flying back alone, and he never saw Axelrod or the twins ever again. Ingo Swan kept his word and didn't speak of any of these events for years. He eventually published a full account of the story in his book, Penetration, which I'll link below. It's a great book. Ingo Swan tells the story with a lot of flair. So if you're interested in stories like this, it's a must read. But. Oh, here we go. But how much of the story is true? I hate this part. I, I, I know, but, but we have to do it. Yeah, yeah, I know. So let's break down Ingo Swan's story into its parts and see if we can figure out what really happened. We've got the Jupiter mission, the moon mission, the extraterrestrial woman, and the UFO encounter. So let's start with the woman in the supermarket. Ingo Swan felt that this woman was an alien. He thought that maybe an alien or android made to look like an attractive woman was following him. Now this was the chapter that was most difficult for me to believe. So he didn't see a sexy ET? I think he saw the woman, but she was probably human. He was under surveillance by the twins, who we now know to be CIA operatives. I think the most logical explanation is that she was a Soviet spy. Honey pot. Yeah, I, I think so. This was the 1970s, and during this time, the United States and Soviet Union were in the middle of what you might call a psychic arms race. We know this from CIA records. We also know that the US was full of Soviet spies. Next, the UFO encounter. This was another tough one for me. It was just a very tidy story. Mr. Axelrod knew exactly where it would appear, how it operated, what it would be doing. I mean, if he wanted Swan to confirm something about the craft, I think he could have done that remotely. I mean, if Ingo Swan could put his consciousness on Jupiter, he can certainly go to Alaska. And in his book, Swan describes light rays shooting from the UFO that actually destroyed pine trees and even killed animals. 
I think this is something that could be confirmed pretty easily, but there's no follow-up on it. Now, as for Jupiter, subsequent observations and probes to the planet confirmed a lot of what Ingo Swan said, and his discovery of Jupiter's rings is really a compelling story. We'd never seen those before, and they were confirmed by Voyager in 1979 and photographed by the New Horizons mission in 2007. Finally, the moon. And this is where things get really strange. The CIA had remote viewers projecting to Jupiter, Mars, and the moon. Even though the remote viewers' reports were highly classified, they're not any longer, and their reports are remarkably similar. The problem with the moon is that the US government simply will not allow us to confirm the details. There are reports of astronauts hearing signals coming from the moon, but those signals are dismissed as interference. We have pictures of what look like huge structures on the moon, but the pictures are fuzzy and can easily be refuted by skeptics as rock formations. What about pictures of the far side of the moon? Well, NASA has plenty of those but they're very stingy with what they release to the public. And if NASA won't tell us what's happening up there, we're gonna fill in the blanks ourselves. It's an indisputable fact that Ingo Swam was part of secret government experiments for years. If you search the CIA website, there are hundreds of documents that confirm this. And everyone who worked with Ingo Swan 100% believed he was telling the truth about everything he saw. Now Swan admitted that he got things wrong plenty of times and was always reluctant to remote view places that couldn't be confirmed. So I don't think he's a liar or a fraud or a hoaxer, but did he really see the things he described? Only you can answer that. If you don't believe in remote viewing, then the answer is easy. No, none of this could be real. These are just stories created by someone with an incredible imagination. But if you do believe in remote viewing, as the US government certainly does, then Ingo Swan might have revealed the most important discovery of humankind, that we are not alone. The best stories are the ones that make you reevaluate everything you've been taught, that make you question every truth you've come to believe. The story of Ingo Swan is one of these. Now, after researching Ingo Swan, I'm left with more questions than answers. But if enough of us keep asking these questions, one day, maybe hundreds of years from now or maybe tomorrow, we'll finally learn the truth. And the truth, whether fantastic or mundane, that's all we want. Thanks so much for hanging out with me today. My name is AJ, that's Hecklefish. This has been The Y Files. If you had fun or learned anything, do me a favor and like, subscribe, subscribe comment, comment, share. And share. That stuff really helps the channel. It does. She did, yeah. All right, next was Mar All right, Artifacts on Mars. See what's going on in the chat. Buzz, did you see yourself in the show open? P Wag, happy gobble day. Cha-ching, baby! OG says, I need to hear, uh, she put a sock on it. I'll give you one of those. I, th I think we need that t-shirt. There's Big Booty Latina for two. <laughs> Research Chateau des Armois. Very sinister stuff. All right, email me. I'll look into it. Ex Bruegel, thank you. Tell us some tips to improve our addiction and ability to tell stories as you do. I feel like I'm marble mouthed, but just do tongue twisters. Twung, twung twisters. Lecture of Magnetic Mind. AJ, it's my dream to hear you say my name, bro. Jaden. Jaden. I have said your name, Jaden. Thank you, Yeti. Kind words. Laws, good to see you. Mr. Fox, glad you found the channel. Rhonda, happy Thanksgiving. We are watching you, Kathy. Chris Bouncer, thank you for the, the two. Ocean breathes saltly. Salty? Ocean breathes salty. Do the Rain Man Donald Decker story in full all the, all the family, all the witnesses, including the cops and priest. I think you do a great job at it. Email me. I'll look into it. James Finner, tomorrow is my birthday. Can I get a shout out? There you go. Happy birthday, James. Thorn, very funny. I put a sack on it. Uh, Gab's the Brazilian. Thank you for the five. Happy Thanksgiving to Native American Heritage Day tomorrow. With love from Germany. And please consider an episode on the mysterious Indigo children. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Stacy, thank you for the 10 bucks. All right, I appreciate that. John, welcome to Patreon. We couldn't do this without Patreon. So if you want to support the channel, it's a great way to do it. Three bucks a month keeps us going, gives you access to specialty merch that only Patreon members can get, plus two live streams a week that are just for members. And they're not crazy like 
10,000 people. There's usually just a few of us in there hanging out and everyone's camera's on. So you, you get to talk with the whole, the whole crew. George C., who's the chef? Eric is doing most of the cooking. There he is. And the turkey looks good. Scott Shanley, thank you for the five. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanks for doing the live stream. Can Jen finish the Crab Cat origin story? I didn't know that she started it. Yeah, I'll ask her to do that. Crit Cal, AJ, I bet you'd do a great hecklefish impression. I tried. I can't nail the voice. I'm working on it, though. Paul, thank you for the five. Elites get off doing it in our faces and getting away with it. Historians will ask, how didn't people know? Why didn't they do anything? I think that I'm going to cover that a little bit with Project Looking Glass, Paul. The Great Awakening. Something the Illuminati are trying to avoid. Jacob L. Tarbent, thank you for 10. What a nice Turkey Day surprise. Well, thanks for showing up. I hope you're having fun. Mikey, I appreciate you. J. McCurdy loves to dance. Well, she's a camel. Camels love to dance when the feeling is right. Angelic Rogue, thank you for the 10. Hey, thanks for the tip. Animal Halls, good to see you. Final level, thank you for the 199. Find your channel less than 24 hours ago. Love it. I'm glad that you love it. This, this, what we do here, this is not a professional. This live stream is so Isn't, unprofessional. Really, what are you even doing? It's not a professional operation. Uh, yes, I'm going to cover DMT. I just have to be, you don't have to donate a thousand dollars, Michael. I'm going to cover DMT. I just have to do it carefully because it's, it would get flagged by YouTube as a promoting illegal drug use, which of course I do, but it be, you don't want to get the video demonetized and get the channel hit. So I have to keep it sciencey and spiritual. Fuzzy Logic's good to see you. Marvin Cruz is there, Yahtzee. Bodhi Gupta, I see you. J Mac, yeah, Shat, Shat was taking care of us there. Mary Alderman, 50 bucks. That's me in the fishbowl. That's me on the YouTube. Begging you for money. I need to buy a little more booze. And I don't know if I can do it. Oh no, I need 10 bucks. I haven't got enough. There's, there's where, where's Gino? There he go. Gino's gonna jump on in a minute. But he's gotta go in there. You're drinking Irish whiskey? I, I read Tell me something I don't know. Where's Gino? Oh shit, where he go? Tell me something I don't know. Where's Gino? Oh shit, uh -oh, where, where he go? Jet set and betting at the regular scenes worldwide travel fee. Mayor Alderman says, I really enjoy your videos. Very, very interesting and informative. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you for the generous donation. I appreciate that. I couldn't do this without your support. I hope we're making your Thanksgiving a little bit easier. I know the holidays can be hard for some people. No, I never made a cozy rev mirror. But if someone makes one and it's close enough, I'll go visit. I'm down to try. Levi Plin uh, for 10 PLN. Thank you for all the entertainment provided. You're very welcome. Uh, Gino's here. Hey. Hey. World. Happy hey. Thanksgiving. Because it is. You got us. You gonna do an impromptu Gino story hour? Uh, I, I I can. I'd be mostly reading it probably, but I I, I can. No, you 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 don't have to do that. People would just but ask him for you. If anyone is, anyone is interested, there is a really great uh, Thanksgiving uh, uh, alien story from 1954. Uh, but uh, so check check that out. A uh, man named Cyril Jones on uh, Thanksgiving Day met up with an alien, and uh, the alien fixed the car for him. In well, give us just give it, give give us a, a compressed version of that. So it was like an alien AAA. Well, in 1954, Cyril was working at a, at a garage, and um, and a guy comes in and says, look, my car's ha having trouble. Now, the guy looks like he's about 40-ish or, or so, and he says, look, I don't need you guys to fix the car, but I'd like to just use the station. 
And now the two other guys that are around start kind of going, yeah, this guy's going to fix a tran- tranny in the in the middle of uh, Thanksgiving. So they go outside to where the lifts are, and this guy Cyril is talking to him. And then Cyril starts going, you know, those guys outside, they're making fun of me. They're saying that I can't fix the transmission. So Cyril's going, what is this guy talking about? So he goes out and he talks to the guy. Sure enough, they were talking about that. They So Cyril's like, all right, this is weird, but maybe he's like tricky, like doing some kind of trick, but let's see what happens. And they push the car in. And uh, so now the car, car goes in and this guy starts working on the car and they're looking at this car and they go, they don't, the, the dashboard is like, has all weird instruments on it. And whatever is in his trunk also is weird technology looking, but they don't know. It's 1954. So anyway, this guy just starts working on, on the transmission and Cyril is thinking things like, what the hell old this guy is? And this guy just starts answering questions. So he's hearing his thoughts and everything like that. And like some of the things that um, the guy was saying to him was that, Hey, there, that, Number one, the pyramids were built by an alien race that left, that were, were chased out, out, out of the earth, and, and the Egyptians inherited the, the pyramids. Also, he was telling them, and again, this is 1954. This is like well before our, our phenomenon has been going on now. He was also telling them that there are beings that exist outside of our dimension that are here with us, and they are different than the beings that come to visit her. So these are so there are multiple types of things, not just all one thing that that we're uh, thinking of. And um, again, Cyril said in his head, "I wonder how old this guy is." And he goes, "A lot older than you think." I have great great grandchildren and this and that. And he came from Alaska, and Alaska wasn't even a state at that point. So uh, again, that's why like the other guys were kind of making fun of him. They're like, "Oh, this guy from Alaska is going to fix the transmission." So anyway fixes up the transmission and he's like and he said to the guy Cyril who was working there look I don't have time to tell you all the secrets but look into it and you'll see that I'm right and then takes you off for his Thanksgiving uh trip I don't know where he went after that but that was 1954 Thanksgiving that would be a good Gino story hour and the chat noticing that uh Gino story hour is, is a lot smoother with whiskey they're noticing the lubrication. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's easier when I don't have to tell an actual story, when I'm just telling you a few things I remember from one of them. Like butter. butter. And, but there is some disappointment that there is no alien erotica in that one. So you just have to add some. Just, next time you just have to add some. Oh, fair enough. I, I will make sure that the aliens and the car mechanics make out next time. I mean, I, I, we'll just add that into the story. All right. We'll add it and we'll look forward to that. All right, there, there's Gino. Next, next up, we've got Alien, the um, the NASA Mars. Co- oh, wow, he's it's a tall. He's got a tall one there, doesn't he? Do you see that? Go like this. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh oh, there he goes. Gino equals Ernest Borgnine. I don't know if that's a compliment. I don't know if that's a compliment, but. I'm glad you didn't hear that. Daniel Fry, uh, Freiberg, thank you for the $5 super sticker. Appreciate it. Dan Payne, appreciate $24.99. Very generous. Adam White said, aliens love Greece. Who doesn't? Neon, thank you for the five Australian. Professor Cockrum, four fingers of scotch. Uh, he was four fingers in before that last belt he took. But I did notice that it was a little smoother. That's... Over my shoulder is the producer of Gino Story Hour. That's Josh back there. Maybe Josh needs to bring a flask to the next shoot. <laughs> you don't have to spend five hours in, on the green screen. Laser Griff, thank you for the five dollars. Will we be doing a Gino Turkey Hour? Well, you just had it, but maybe later we can get a little Gino stuffing. Bill Jamison, appreciate the ten. You produced some of the finest videos on the web. Very entertaining, educational. Love them all. I appreciate the support. Bottoms up, Daniel K. Brick Pigeon, a pigeon has been triggered by Gino. I got to pour a drink. I feel you. Juke asking if I'm tired. I'm tired. I'm tired. But we're going to get through it. There's Pierre. Thank you so much for the 20 Canadian super sticker. Gino hasn't, isn't smoking out uh, turkey hour yet. I, I At least I haven't smelt it. Christopher Will, this, the episode mentioned things that are true, but you kind of talk about on YouTube. Can you mention that on Discord? Uh, for the most part, yes. 
I can talk about those in Discord. But I, I can't do it here. YouTube has actually loosened up the rules a little bit, but I worry about the political angle. Eric Andrew Adams Nestor, thank you for the 10 bucks. Jesse Pauly, $20. They got me in collections and garnishing my wages too. Got guppy support payments, alimony up the wazoo. They repoed my car, I'm living in a jar like a bum. Know that you got money, so why the hell don't you give me some? Mm -hmm. Tip the fish today. Please tip the fish today. Jesse, Polly, happy Turkey Day. Love your channel. Keep the videos coming. I appreciate the support, Jesse. It was very generous of you to do that. It really is. Peter Christian, $25. I'm a disabled vet who looks forward to your shows each week from the Kingdom of Nye. When you're coming up to Prump for the Art Bell episode. I don't know when I'm going to do that, Peter, but I'm definitely going to do it. I don't know, maybe for his birthday? Would it make sense? But, um, sorry to hear that you're disabled. I hope they took care of you. I hope they took care of you, brother. Trey M for 10. Who else slept work early because the machines were down? I want to come home at 1 p.m. and start drinking wine with brother and parents, nieces and nephews. Where the talk but who? This guy. Well, I hope you're having a good one, Trey. It's Nate Dog. Uh, loves the channel. Ever co cover Adrenochrome? Illuminati and Elite Conspiracies. A little bit. Adrenochrome is a tough one for YouTube. They, they, they don't like that one. Michael, thank you for the ten dollars. Jackson Kegels, 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 thank you for the ten. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Hi, Stewie, thank you for the five pound. Happy Thanksgiving from the UK. It's currently eleven p.m. Well, thanks for hanging out with us, staying up late. Conscious Universe, good to see you. Robert Marley's there. I'm a fan of your work. Ponyo eight 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 eight. I see you. Next, we've got alien bases. Uh, no, we've got the NASA Mars conspiracy. Let's, let's do it. On July 25th, 1976, a NASA scientist was studying the images of a region of Mars called Cydonia when something caught his eye. He had to take a second to process what he was seeing. He grabbed a magnifying glass. There was no doubt. On the surface of Mars, 140 million miles from Earth, was a structure in the shape of a human face. It was huge, about a mile wide, and showed two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Around the face were pyramids and structures that didn't look natural. They looked like they were built by someone. The following day, NASA held a press conference. Of the thousands of photos sent back from Mars, all anyone asked about was the face. Who built it and why? Is it a message from an advanced civilization now long extinct? Is it a religious artifact? Is it solid like the Great Sphinx or could it contain chambers like the Great Pyramid? Then NASA threw cold water on the speculation. They said there was a second photograph of the area taken shortly after. And that photo showed that the face was nothing more than an optical illusion. Small problem, that second photo doesn't exist. So why did NASA lie? Well, the answer to that question is in the other pictures. For centuries, we've been captivated by the mysteries of the red planet. The ancient Egyptians saw Mars as a god. The Greeks named it after their god of war, but it wasn't until the 19th century that we began to unravel some of its secrets. In 1877, Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli made detailed observations of Mars. He saw strange markings on the surface that he called cannoli. Ooh, I love those. It's like an Italian sweet cheese taco. That's cannoli. Delicious. Cannoli means channels in Italian, but the media thought it meant canals. And this led to speculation that the canals might have been built by an intelligent race of Martians. And as technology improved and with the space race in full swing, getting close-up photos of Mars became a priority. In 1965, the Mariner 4 probe flew past Mars and sent back 22 images. 
Even though the first pictures of Mars were exciting, they were also disappointing. There were no vast cities or canals or any evidence of an ancient culture. Mars looked like the moon, harsh, barren, pockmarked by meteors, completely lifeless. But as technology continued to improve, the idea of life on Mars became less far-fetched. Yes, Mars is cold and barren now, but years ago, that wasn't the case. Mars was once covered with vast oceans of water flowing into rivers and lakes all over the planet. It had a thick atmosphere that kept the surface warm. Mars had volcanic activity and even a global magnetic field, just like Earth. It was a long time ago, but the red planet was, at one time, a blue planet with all the ingredients necessary to support life. In 1975, NASA sent two spacecraft to Mars, Viking 1 and Viking 2. These probes each contained an orbiter with a high-resolution camera and a lander. In the summer of 1976, Viking 1 and Viking 2 finally reached Mars. Both orbiters took thousands of photographs of the Martian surface. NASA scientist Toby Owen was one of the first researchers assigned to look for landing sites. And when Owen found the face on image 35-A72, he was beyond excited. NASA released the image to the press as a way to increase public interest and attract attention to Mars. This worked, but a little too well, because the face was the only thing the press wanted to talk about. It became such a big story that NASA had to release a follow-up statement about the face, saying it was just an optical illusion, and they took another photo to prove it. Isn't it peculiar what tricks of light and shadow can do? When we took another picture a few hours later, it all went away. It was just a trick, just the way the light fell on it. Except that second photo was never produced and nobody thought to ask. Face or not, Cydonia was the top contender for the landing site of Viking 2. The terrain is flat, visibility was good, and there are interesting rock formations to explore. But a few days after the release of the face photo, Viking 2 landed in a barren rocky region called Utopia Planitia. One scientist working on the mission complained that this was like landing in the Sahara Desert and expecting to find a garden. So why the last minute change of the landing site? Is there something going on in Cydonia that NASA doesn't want us to see? Well, the answer is yes, lots of things. Monuments are not built in isolation. The pyramids found in Egypt or in Central or South America were not single structures. They were part of sprawling complexes of buildings, town squares, and temples. If an ancient culture living on Mars created a monument of a humanoid head, we'd expect to see other structures close by. And that's exactly what we see. There's a cluster of pyramids near the face that people call the city square. And near those is an object nicknamed the fortress, which appears to be a collapsed pyramid. There's a formation called the DNM pyramid, named for NASA imaging scientists Vince DiPietro and Greg Molinar. DNM is a massive five-sided, one and a half mile tall structure. This is three times the size of the largest pyramid in Egypt. But what's really interesting about the DNM pyramid is that it's symmetrical around two different axes. Now, it's easy to dismiss these findings that it's nothing more than a coincidence that all these weird looking structures and pyramids are within a few miles of the face. But then a professional satellite imaging specialist named Errol Torin started looking into it. He worked for the Defense Mapping Agency, and his job was literally to analyze satellite images and decide which objects were natural and which were artificial. He said that all the objects, including the face, were not of natural origin. But the DNM pyramid really blew his mind. The geomorphic natural hypothesis is thus left with no mechanism that can explain the formation of the DNM pyramid. This object's five-sided shape and bilateral symmetry is unlike any landform seen to date in this solar system. Torin called this pyramid the Rosetta Stone of Mars. He found all kinds of mathematical relationships between objects in the area. And as more photos came back from Mars, we found more strange objects. A lot more. Over the past 50 years, thousands of images have come back from Mars. And if you look through those images, you'll find all sorts of things that look out of place. This is an extremely tall, almost perfectly rectangular monolith. Whoa! Here's another monolith. This one stands over 10 miles high. If this were on Earth, it would extend up through the clouds. The top is so high that even the largest airliners would fly below it. This object has been nicknamed the shipwreck because it looks like the remains of a boat. Is it an ancient craft or maybe the foundation of a structure? 
In May 2022, Curiosity Rover found a doorway carved in the rock face. I wonder where it goes. Here are giant tracks on the surface. Giant. What kind of machine can make this? Now, this object doesn't look like a natural rock formation. This one is called the Martian Totem Pole. You can make the argument that erosion created most of the odd features on Mars, but this one is very strange. I don't see how erosion could do this. Curiosity took this picture in 2015. What? It looks like something is hanging onto the cliffs. Here's a dome or the top of a spear. These structures were famously called glass worms by Arthur C. Clarke. Here's an object that's definitely not a rock formation. A series of still images shows an orb of light moving around the Martian landscape. What the? Skeptics say this is a dead pixel, but dead pixels don't move around the frame. Besides, whatever this is, it's larger than just a pixel. Here's one that blows my mind. This looks like the imprint of a valve or a gear. This was taken with the Opportunity's microscopic imager. Could this be the imprint left by the piece of an ancient machine? How could this mark be formed naturally? How about this? This was taken by the Mars Global Surveyor in the year 2000. Whoa. This saucer-shaped formation or structure really stands out from the surrounding landscape. And these are just a few of the anomalies found on Mars. There are many, many more. A few years after the release of the infamous face photo, DiPietro and Molinar decided to look for the original so they could analyze it themselves. Now, at first, they had trouble locating it. Turns out, it was misfiled. Eventually, they found 35A72 labeled head in the Viking image files. And after reviewing the photo, DiPietro and Molinar felt that, despite what NASA claimed, there was more to the face than a trick of light and shadow. So they looked for the second image, the one that NASA said proves the face is just an illusion. How did they find it? Well, it was misfiled, but they did find a second photo of the face. And this one has even more detail. Vince DiPietro and Greg Molinar felt that there was more to the face on Mars than an optical illusion. To prove or disprove the theory, they would need more photos. Even though there were other pictures taken of the face, they were surprised to find that they seemed to have disappeared. Oh, they were surprised that NASA lost the pictures, huh? Uh, they must be new at this. Uh, tell me again, what happened to NASA's recordings of the moon landing? Oh yeah, they lost those too. Uh -huh. uh, NASA sure does hire a lot of butterfingers. That does seem to be the case. Uh, you know, it's a good thing the moon landing was fake. Otherwise, that would have been really embarrassing. They also couldn't find the quote-unquote disconfirming photographs that Gerald Soffin mentioned five years earlier. But even though it was filed in the wrong place, they did find a second photo of the face on Mars. And this second image showed more detail and less shadow on the left side of the face. There appeared to be two eye sockets, a nose, and even a mouth. But the weirdest thing was that the structure had two parallel and even length sides, both hundreds of yards long and perfectly straight. And the top and bottom edges were both curved and had the same radius. It looked like a symmetrical framed platform for the face itself. According to geologists and imaging experts, the face's base, if that's what it is, is different than anything you'd likely see in nature. DiPietro did more analysis and found evidence of a pupil in the left eye socket. NASA scoffed at the new findings, so the two researchers sought some outside help. And this is where science journalist Richard Hoagland stepped into the picture. He organized an independent research group and began studying the images in greater detail. Computer imaging specialist Dr. Mark Carlotto was brought onto the team. His new image enhancement techniques showed what looked like teeth in the mouth and an odd stripe pattern on the frame areas. Excited by what they found, Hoagland arranged for a briefing on the results with Carl Sagan at NASA. Carl Sagan? The, the millions of billions guy uh, with the turtleneck sweaters? Yep, that's him. Have trillions, billions, billion, trillions, billion, 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 billions, billion, million, billion, billion, trillion, billions, million, 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 billion, 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 millions, million, million, millions. At the meeting, Carl Sagan acted impressed, but he attacked the face on Mars theory in the newspapers. Hoagland pressed NASA for more photos, but NASA said it was unnecessary. Mystery solved. But NASA didn't realize that Richard Hoagland had a platform, a big platform. From the high desert and the great American Southwest, I bid you all good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be in whatever time zone, wherever you are in the world, this is Coast to Coast AM, and I'm Art Bell. Great to be here. 
Lots to do tonight. Bart Bell, host of Coast to Coast AM, reached millions of people. And Richard Hoagland was on the show all the time. With access to Art Bell's audience, Hoagland was able to generate letter writing and call-in campaigns to force NASA to take new pictures of the face and pyramids at Cydonia. Now, NASA didn't agree immediately, but the pressure was starting to mount because in just a few more months, NASA was going back to Mars. In 1993, NASA launched the Mars Observer, the first mission to Mars since the Viking days. And liftoff, liftoff of the Titan III rocket with the Mars Observer and America's return to the red planet. And NASA wasn't even going to include a camera, but an uproar from the public forced NASA to include one. There was a lot of excitement about the Mars Observer because the new camera was good enough to finally end the debate about the face and the pyramids in Cydonia. At least, that was the hope. The reality was somewhat different. Even after the launch, NASA maintained that they had no interest in photographing the face or Cydonia. The debate went back and forth until about three days before Mars Observer was inserted into Mars orbit. <laughs> the probe insertion. Don't, don't be an infant. <laughs> that Sunday morning, before the maneuver to- uh, The maneuver to insert the probe. Stop it. <laughs> the Sunday before the Observer was placed into orbit, NASA sent out the Mars Observer lead project scientist, Dr. Bevan French, to debate Hoagland on Good Morning America. Now to put it gently, it did not go well for Dr. French or NASA. We now have a set of data so extraordinary that it demands in the venue of any decent science simply testing the hypothesis. The problem is that there are some folks in NASA in charge of the next mission going back, specifically that camera I referred to, who seem less than overwhelmingly inclined to perform the simple test. They will not guarantee, strange as it may seem, that taking new pictures is on the Mars Observer agenda. By the end of the debate, even the host was asking NASA, why don't you just take the pictures and prove these guys wrong? Dr. French didn't have a good answer for that. But what happened next was even more suspicious. Less than five minutes after the debate aired, NASA made an announcement. The Mars Observer probe had disappeared. They'd lost all contact with it. Wait, what? So it didn't matter who won the debate. There would be no pictures of Mars. They lost this thing too? Yep. Uh, you know, NASA might want to invest in some air tags or something to help them keep track of all this stuff. Good idea. Uh, you know, at the end of the day at NASA, I picture 400 scientists just, just wandering around a parking lot there, you know, looking for where they left their cars. <laughs> and here's an interesting side note. Hoagland and others claim they were getting leaked information from NASA insiders. According to the leakers, the Mars Observer was still out there and running just fine. In fact, it was taking pictures of the face and all kinds of other weird objects on Mars. But even if NASA had those pictures, they couldn't show them publicly, especially if they showed the face was an artificial construction. NASA continued to claim that the face was nothing more than a pile of rocks. But since they couldn't take a photo to prove it, they did the next best thing. They created one. Five years after the Mars Observer fiasco, NASA launched a new probe called Mars Global Surveyor. Three, two, one, we have ignition, and we have liftoff. Uh, this is Mars Global Surveyor as America begins its journey back to the red planet. And even though there were newer, better cameras available, NASA insisted on using the old ones. And once again, NASA didn't want to take pictures of Cydonia or the face. But after public pressure, they finally agreed to take a few pictures. Then NASA finally made a big announcement. On April 5th, 1998, NASA finally released a highly detailed picture of the face on Mars. What the sh is this? What was released was a grainy, noise-filled image of the face in bad lighting, bad weather, and with multiple filters applied. That night on the Art Bell program, Hoagland and his team were upset. Bell said that from his perspective, the image looked like something my kitty would scratch up in her cat box. And from that moment forward, it would be forever known as the cat box image. But it looked like this image was deliberately manipulated by NASA. Lan Fleming, a NASA contractor, went back to the source data and tried to reproduce the cat box image. At first, he couldn't. But eventually, after applying 14 different Photoshop filters, he was able to do it. And he realized this could not be done by accident. JPL removed most of the tonal variation in the original image that gives the observer the visual cues to the real three-dimensional shape of the object. They added 
false visual cues to give the object its rough, jumbled appearance, inadvertently falsifying the appearance of the surrounding terrain as well. The tap box is not a poor enhancement, as it is often called. It is a crude but very effective fraud perpetrated by employees or contractors to the United States government. Even if the face is proven to be completely natural, this is inexcusable misconduct and a gross abuse of power. If the face ultimately is proven to be artificial, the cat box will certainly come to be regarded as the greatest, most malicious, and most destructive scientific hoax of all time. Ever since the first color images came back from Mars, they've always been suspicious. The colors were dominated by this weird orange haze. NASA said this is because of all the carbon dioxide and red dust in the atmosphere. Well, a carbon dioxide atmosphere would still be blue. Not a deep blue like on Earth, but a grayish blue. But the images from Mars show the sky as this weird reddish green color. So what's going on? These photos make the surface of Mars look like a weird alien world. But it's not an accurate representation of color. Nothing is so uniformly one color like this. For some reason, before releasing images of Mars, they ran the images through an orange filter. Now, in the 1990s, nobody would really question this. But modern digital photography software like Photoshop can tell if a single color is applied to an image uniformly. This is a simple calculation for software. It's how white balancing is achieved in photography and video. It's such an easy calculation that current versions of Photoshop give you a one-click way to solve for false color. The function is called, well, auto color. So look at this early, very blurry image of Mars. That looks like Mars. Well, the version of Mars that's been fed to us for years. But remember, Photoshop can correct for false color. If we auto color this, Whoa! Right. Now that's a very different image. Let's do a few more. Whoa! Whoa! Ah. NASA eventually learned that their orange filter technique was easily spotted. So recent pictures of Mars no longer have the weird orange tint. Now even NASA's pictures show a blue-gray sky and a lot of different colors in the landscape. But why would NASA not want us to know that Mars has blue skies? Some say it's to discourage people from wanting to visit Mars. The more alien it looks, the better. So Mars had oceans and a thick atmosphere and could have supported life. If intelligent life did evolve on Mars and the face and other artifacts are not piles of rocks, but are actually ruins of a long lost society, we have to ask, what happened to that ancient civilization? Well, the answer to that question could be the reason that the governments of the world have lied to us about Mars for so many years. Because there is evidence, scientific evidence, that millions of years ago, the planet Mars was devastated by a massive global nuclear war. Curiosity rover arrived on Mars in August 2012 and started analyzing samples from the surface. NASA scientists were expecting to find soil containing heavily oxidized iron, which they did. But what nobody expected to find was evidence of a massive nuclear war. Chemical analysis revealed that the top layer of Martian soil contains a large amount of xenon-129. There's only one known process that creates this particular isotope of xenon, the detonation of nuclear weapons. Now, over the course of 70 years, over 1,000 nuclear tests have been conducted on Earth. And every time a nuclear bomb is detonated, the explosion leaves behind small traces of xenon-129. The amount of xenon-129 in Martian soil is two and a half times higher than Earth. Dr. John Brandenburg is a former NASA physicist and a well-known Mars researcher. He was a scientist who accompanied Richard Hoagland to NASA to present their findings about the face in Cydonia. Dr. Brandenburg believes that a humanoid civilization lived on Mars and died on Mars. I have shown this to several nuclear weapons experts and they have affirmed that this is nuclear weapon signature. There is no other process that can create such a xenon spectrum. For so much xenon to be deposited on the surface, the nuclear weapon would have to be the size of the Empire State Building, with an energy equivalent to 1,000 megatons. For comparison, the bomb dropped on Hiroshima was 20 kilotons, so we're talking an explosion 50,000 times more powerful. And Dr. Brandenburg found two hotspots on Mars where radiation levels are higher than anywhere else. And right in between those hotspots is Cydonia, 
the location of the face, the pyramid, and the other structures. Dating the isotopes places the explosions somewhere between 150 and 300 million years ago. Mars was, at one time, a blue planet like Earth, covered in oceans and a thick atmosphere. But nobody knows for sure how Mars lost its atmosphere. A nuclear explosion of this size would answer that question. Now, this is a frightening theory, but it gets even more disturbing. If an intelligent race created the face and other structures on Mars, they wouldn't have been that technologically advanced. They were maybe an Iron Age civilization. Those people would not have the technology to create such a devastating nuclear weapon. This means the weapons were detonated by someone else. Don't say aliens. Don't say aliens. Aliens. Oh, no. At the time of this event on Mars, the most advanced creatures on Earth were reptiles. Dinosaurs hadn't even evolved yet. Maybe whoever destroyed Mars ignored us. Reptiles wouldn't pose much of a threat to them. But what if they return? Another theory is that intelligent life on Mars did reach an advanced level of technology, advanced enough to destroy themselves in a nuclear apocalypse. But before that catastrophic event, a small group of these humanoids escaped off-world. So who were those Martians that managed to escape annihilation? Well, they're us. For a show like this, the exploration of Mars is a gift that started giving in the 1960s and just keeps on giving. We've got ancient civilizations, government cover-ups, alien invasions, a nuclear apocalypse, and more conspiracies than I can count. But how much of all this is true? Well, I can't really debunk most of this episode because, well, Mars is another planet. It's not like we can go see for ourselves, at least not yet. The flow of information comes from a single source, the United States government. Well, assume everything they say is a lie. Well, that's a pessimistic point of view. Uh, what can I tell you? I've been hurt before. But let me give you some perspective. First, every single object on Mars that looks artificial could be attributed to pareidolia. That's a word you'll hear a lot from NASA. Pareidolia is the human tendency to find meaning in random stimuli, like the imperfections of a piece of wood that look like a polar bear, or a stadium that looks like a UFO, or a cloud shaped like a crab kit. Right. Feel the crab kit. Seeing animals is common, but the most common thing we see? Faces. Faces? Faces. what I say? In fact, if you look at the wiki page for Paradolia, the picture of the face on Mars is the main example. Propaganda. What do you mean? Wikipedia isn't biased. <laughs> You're adorable. But is the face on Mars an optical illusion, or is there something there? Well, plenty of scientists NASA scientists thought there was something there, though we don't hear much from them anymore. Most scientists think it's just an illusion. When NASA released their detailed picture of the face, which showed it as a pile of rocks, they thought they put the conspiracy to bed. The problem is, NASA does alter images. In fact, they alter every image they release to the public. And now Chris Martinez is introducing us to two of the artists behind some of the most iconic space art in the galaxy. NASA says this is to make the images easier to understand, or to make them more visually appealing. Yeah, even NASA uses filters on her Insta. They do. Now, I don't like that NASA has artists on staff to Photoshop images, but I understand that some photos have to be adjusted to make them more digestible to the public. But there are some really weird NASA Photoshops. Here's the famous photo of the Earth taken from Apollo 17. And here's a 3D model of the Earth released by Google and the US Navy. The model is supposed to be mathematically perfect, but the land masses don't line up, like not even close. Here are examples of NASA copy-pasting clouds on a picture of the Earth. The copy-paste technique has been used on Mars images too. These are from the Curiosity rover. Now, maybe there are good reasons for faking these images, though I can't think of any. But if you fake one image, we can't trust any of them. So when you see this picture of Mars, people say this looks exactly like Devon Island, the uninhabited island in Canada where NASA trains crew members and tests its rovers. NASA Public Relations, this is Jerry. Hey Jerry, I wanted to talk to you about this picture from Curiosity. Uh huh. This looks like Devon Island, but with an orange filter on? No, no, that's Mars. Yeah, but, but it's the red planet. Yeah, no, I know it's called the Red Planet, but I'm pretty sure this picture of Devon Island got uh, slipped in accidentally. No, 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 that's not Devon Island. That's Mars. Okay, then why is this animal hiding behind the rocks? That's not an animal. That's just a rock. Okay, but that sure does look like an Arctic lemming. What the hell is an Arctic lemming? Well, an Arctic lemming is a type of small rodent that hides in the rocks all over Devon Island. Hello? Are right, you know what? 
Thank you and your stupid YouTube channel. You could take your Arctic lemming and shove it straight up your ass. So how much you trust NASA is up to you, but I wouldn't trust them 100%. But some people go to the extreme with the Mars images. Now below this eagle is a whole city of bird and deer formations in the Sedoni area. There's that parrot look again. There's the parrot again. Now, if you're uh, looking at this area directly below the crater that has the, uh, the eagle in it. They see parrots and dolphins and all sorts of things in the pictures. Now, I don't see these things unless they're specifically pointed out to me. I think most of those images are a stretch, but I don't need anyone to hold my hand with the picture of the face. That one I can clearly see. As for Richard Hoagland, you've heard me talk about him a lot, especially on the After Files live stream. He was always one of my favorite guests on Art Bell. Very well-spoken guy, very entertaining. But he has plenty of detractors. He's been a favorite target of sites like Bad Astronomy and Skeptical Inquirer. He's been accused of exaggerating his credentials and his experience. But let me come to Richard's defense a little bit. All scientists do that. Richard Hoagland might be wrong about some things, and I think he's probably wrong about most things. But he's provided a valuable service, and it's something I don't think he gets enough credit for. He got millions of regular folks interested in the space program. And because of that, he was able to sway NASA into taking pictures of Mars that we might not have ever seen. And he's shown us that we have to keep an eye on NASA. We need people like Richard Hoagland out there. We need watchdogs, specifically watchdogs with access and with the ability to influence policy. Now, as for Dr. John Brandenburg and his nuclear war on Mars theory, Dr. Brandenburg is well-respected and well-credentialed. His earliest papers on the Mars theory was that a nuclear event happened naturally on the planet. There's a uranium mine in Gabon, Africa, which shows evidence of nuclear fission occurring naturally. So it's not a stretch to think this could happen on Mars. But after a while, Dr. Brandenburg claimed that what happened on Mars did not happen naturally. That the only way we see isotopes of Xenon-129 is from the discharge of a nuclear weapon. Now, I've read both sides of this argument and I'm not sure who's right. But Dr. Brandenburg's Mars nuclear war theory was rejected for peer review. But that's mainstream scientists, though. They're not always correct, but they always have an agenda. Right or wrong, it's an interesting theory that deserves attention and study, not ridicule. But you can't talk about Mars without being ridiculed. Yes, most everything we see in photographs from Mars can be explained, but there are a couple of things that can't. We've sent mission after mission to Mars, and I can't for the life of me understand why we haven't sent a rover through Cydonia and right up to the object that's supposed to be a face. NASA says there's nothing there, so it would be a waste of resources. But with all due respect to NASA, their resources come from we the people. And we the people want to know what the face on Mars really is. Now, until we have close-up photographs of Cydonia, close-up photographs that we can trust are undoctored, the story about the face on Mars is not going away. And not as long as it generates clicks, eh? True. And look, I completely agree that the chances of the face being an artificial structure are almost zero. But almost zero isn't zero. If there's even the slightest chance that the face and the pyramids were created by a civilization on Mars, we deserve to know. But more importantly, the people who built those monuments, they deserve to be remembered. Thank you so much for hanging out with us today. My name is AJ. You know Hecklefish. As it hanging. This has been The Y Files. If you had fun or learned anything, do us a favor, like, comment, subscribe, share. That stuff really helps the channel. That was one of my favorites. <laughs> Resident Dr. Evil, good to see you. Yo. <laughs> well, you might as well just show it, Gino. the biggest crab claw ever. Hey, Robin Fox, good to see you. Yes, thank you for doing Ked McBride, 50 bucks. I get pretty freaky. He's a super freak. The kind of fish you dream about. You got freaky dreams. I get pretty kinky. He's a super freak. But only if you pay me. Gotta pay the fish. I need a tip. I need a tip. Tip from you and you and you human you and you and you hit the hit the hit the hit the super chat super chat 
Hit the button now. Hi, Stewie. Thank you for the five pounds. Happy Thanksgiving from the UK. It's currently 11. Well, thanks for staying up for us. Snow Bunny, thank you for the 20. My brother-in-law my brother and I were kicked out of the kitchen while the big sis cooks. Happily enjoying the stream with a cocktail. Cheers to you and yours. Same. I'm glad you're spending some of it with us. Look, when I'm cooking, I don't want anyone in my kitchen either. The Dark Queen 321 from Australia. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone overseas. AJ and team from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for all you do. God bless. Including being around for the holidays for those who struggle. That's why we're here, Dark Queen. We'll be here Christmas Day for you as well. I know the holidays are hard for some. Here's Paul for two. This last episode was amazing. Peak Wife House. Peak Wife House means we're over the, we're over, over the hump. We're, we're on a downward trend. D-M-E-E-M-D. -E -E I think you palindromed me there. Happy Thanksgiving from Oklahoma City. And there's Chumley for 11.23. There's Richard Burton for two, a fan of your work. Jeff oh, hey AJ Sizzler. Is that, are you assigning me a nickname or inviting me to dinner? Malcolm Reynolds, good to see you. Jennifer Thomas. Southern Regal, good to see you. Thank you for the kind words. Randall says next peak is even higher. I hope so. It's been, it's been a heck of a year. Before I go, what other stories are in the pipeline? Any spoilers? I, I don't mind spoiling on the streams because because it's, you know, this is like the hardcore fans. But next week we're doing Project Looking Glass, which is a great story about technology that was discovered in ancient Sumerian scrolls and empowered by technology from the, from the UFO discovered in Roswell that allows the people who control it to see through time and make choices and decisions based on what they see. So it's connected to Roswell, Philadelphia Experiment, Montauk Project, all that stuff. Please cover the Michigan Lake in 1994 at some point. Please, please email me, Manuel, and I'll take a look at that. Bander ABC wants the Emerald Tablet. I have that queued up if you want to see that. What should I do? How much time? Um, we're just kind of, now everything's just circling. Everything's just circling. The runway. Oh, I do. Everyone's circling the runway. All right, I'm going to see if I can get... The Crop Circles episode up for you guys. If you haven't seen it, it's a good one. It's, it's one of those episodes that, that turned me from skeptic to believer. It is Crop Circles. Let me see if I can get that cue. There it is. Yeah, I never believed Crop Circles before. But I did a lot of research in this one. I put a lot of work into it. Looking Glass, this game called Assassin's Creed is about that. Yep. I'm playing the new one, but I'm, just, I'm not super into it yet. It's moving kind of slow. I'm bouncing between that and cyberpunk. <laughs> Ivy, AJ, you are working like the rent is due. I'm not complaining. You got you to pay the rent. Got to pay the rent. Skills one, I did a four-hour shift, and y'all are still going? Yeah, we're going, we're going to 12 to 6 today. So this, we might be coming up on the last, on the last episode, but... Uh, but I'll come back and say hi. My other sister and Thanks for the kind kind words in Denver Airport Distat. Brian El Chess, sure you can work with us. My mom Email me with what you can do. You can live your Thanks, WLS64. I am on the way out right now. Yeah, like Miles, cyber, you're into cyberpunk? Can we get a fear the crab cat from yeah. the background? What, do you want, you, right. what, like a shout? Pen and Pox, yeah, I like Rush. Who doesn't like Rush? Chumley, I didn't mean... Oh, did I skip your comment? I didn't mean to. Hang on, man. Let me find you. There you go. There you are. I'm late. Where's our furry friends? Tell them I said hi. Happy Thanksgiving. Are you talking about my wife's legs? No. Is somebody talking about my legs? No, they're asking where my furry friends were. You're so rude. Chumley. So rude. Chumley, she thinks you're rude. So I went... My Files is brought to you by Huel. In 1974, a group of scientists beamed a message into space. The message, meant to be received by an intelligent alien species, described life on Earth. Written in simple binary code and using the most powerful radio telescope on the planet, the message was...
Yeah, Aaron like prepped out. This episode of The Y Files is brought to you by Huel. In 1974, a group of scientists beamed a message into space. The message, meant to be received by an intelligent alien species, described life on Earth. Written in simple binary code and using the most powerful radio telescope on the planet, the message was broadcast to a dense cluster of stars in the constellation of Hercules. This exercise was just ceremonial, a way to demonstrate new technology in radio astronomy. Nobody was really expected to receive it, and even if they did, it wouldn't be anytime soon. The nearest star in the direction of the broadcast is 25,000 light years away. So the telescope was tuned to 2380 MHz, aimed at Hercules, and fired up. The scientists congratulated each other, shook hands, and went on with their lives. But 27 years later, something very unexpected happened with that message beamed into deep space. Someone wrote back. West Virginia, boop doop boo, doop doo, country roads, hang on. Ah, greetings, Grasshopper. Oh, I see it is mealtime. It is for me as well. Yes, I'm starving. Wait, where are you? And did you just call me Grasshopper? Grasshopper. It has been said that before asking too many questions, one must first learn the art of listening. I have traveled to the Shaolin Temple. My Uncle Irving watches the show, and he could tell I needed to reset my chi. Your Uncle Irving? Oh, yeah, he's a koi here. Hey, he let me crash his pond. Fine, can I get back to- shh, shh, shh. Be calm, Grasshopper. You are clearly out of balance. I just want to you eat You must my... nourish your body and feed your soul with a Huel's high-protein, low-sugar, plant-based meal. I know. I was about to eat a bowl of yellow coconut curry when... I when... first arrived at the temple, my Buddha buddies were also struggling with their chi. Your Buddha buddies? Hey, ain't no better buddy than a Buddha buddy, and these Buddha buddies seek a better body. Ah, so you introduced them to Huel. I, I did. 27 essential vitamins and minerals, and an easy source of fiber. It has been said that a man who does not eat enough fiber may soon find himself trying to pass a camel through a keyhole. Wait, in that expression, what's the camel and what's the keyhole? So I reached out to Huel, today's sponsor, and they hooked me up with some grub for the monks. They love it. They love the way it tastes. They love that it's easy on the environment. And they really love that it's easy on the wallet. Monks carry wallets? It's a figure of speech. <clears throat> I will not allow you to damage my calm, Grasshopper. I must keep the mind quiet that I remain in my cheese zone. Cheese zone? I don't think that's a thing. It's a thing! <clears throat> Please instruct our viewers to go to my.huel.com slash the Y files. They'll get free shipping, a Huel t shirt, and a get started guide with their first order. Huh, nice sponsor plug. Cheese zone. Okay, the hot and savory Huel is ready. I, I gotta feed these guys. We have chant practice in 30 minutes, and this group gets rowdy when their blood sugar drops. Hey, fellas, hey, now I must stay out of my kitchen, eh? What? Well, I, I thought monks took a vow of silence. Don't believe everything you see on TV, Grasshopper. You really have to stop calling me. All right, me. boys, uh, let's fuel and fuel. Hey, take it easy, fellas. Hey, wait your turn. Hey, 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 you know the rules. No kung fu at the table. Hey, hey. I heard that. Oh, you stay home with that mouth. One morning in 1966, George Pedley was working his farm in Tully, Queensland, Australia, when he heard a strange buzzing sound. He climbed down from his tractor and started walking in the direction of the sound. Then he saw a circular craft slowly rise above a section of swampland not 50 feet from where he was standing. 
The craft hovered for a few seconds, shot straight up into the sky and disappeared. When George went to investigate, he found a large circle of reeds had been pulled from the swamp and flattened into a disc. The circle was 30 feet across, two feet thick, and arranged in a clockwise swirl. Because of the swirl and the thickness of the reeds, locals called the formation a UFO nest. But what this actually was, was a crop circle. Since the 1960s, thousands of crop circles or crop formations have been found. They've been seen on every continent in almost every country on Earth. But the epicenter for crop formations is Wiltshire in the southwest of England. Crop formations range from the very simple to the very complex. Formations can be circles, stars, and other geometric shapes, but some are pictograms, though nobody knows for sure what they mean. Though every formation is different, they have a few things in common. Recognizable patterns that are created very quickly, usually at night. The creation of these patterns is always associated with some kind of light, either a beam of light or an orb of light. Whatever that is, that's moving outside. Oh my god. Though crop formations seem like a new phenomenon, there's evidence they've been appearing for a long time. In the 9th century, Abagard, the Bishop of Lyon in France, wrote about parishioners who were possibly engaged in devil worship or paganism. They were collecting seeds out of flattened circles in the fields and using them for fertility rituals. In 1686, Robert Plott, a professor at Oxford, wrote about crop circles. He even drew pictures of a couple that appeared near his home. He said they were formed by a flash of light. And once they were formed, animals wouldn't go near them. Around the same time, a pamphlet was released called The Mowing Devil. It describes how a farmer woke to see a bright light in his field that he thought was fire. When he went to investigate, he found a crop circle. It's called the mowing devil because the farmer said the circle was so neatly mowed that it could not have been done by a mortal man. John Leland served as librarian to Henry VIII. He wrote about patterns appearing in grass overnight. In 1937, a British science journal reported circles found in a field of barley and even included one of the first photos taken of a crop circle. In 1945, this photo was taken by a balloonist working for the RAF Parachute Training School. In 1952, the U.S. Air Force investigated circles found in Kansas. In 1963, Sir Patrick Moore, an astronomer writing for the New Scientist Journal, investigated a formation in Charlton. In the wheat fields were features taking the form of circular or elliptical areas in which the wheat had been flattened. One very well defined was an oval, 15 yards long by four and a half broad. There was evidence of spiral flattening. And in one case, there was a circular area in the center in which the wheat had not been flattened. One of the texts discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls is the Book of Enoch. Enoch talks about lightning leaving marks on the earth. So these formations have been seen since the beginning of recorded history. And even though thousands of circles have been found and many people claim to witness them forming, no one had ever caught it on camera until 1996. John Whaley was camping out on a hill in Wiltshire called Oliver's Castle, named for a fort that was built there many years ago. Around 3 a.m., something caught his eye. He grabbed his video camera and captured footage of several glowing orbs hovering over a field. Then, like magic... Whoa! Here's the formation from the air. Nobody can agree on what crop circles mean, though most people believe their messages. Now, this is frustrating to many researchers. They say, whoever's making these, why don't they just speak English? Well, in 2001, they did. See, the object came down and it stopped for a long time. Nothing random about it. There's no movement in the prevailing wind.
Both cunts think what that is. The definitive piece of evidence. In 1974, the Arecibo message was sent from Earth to a cluster of stars in the Hercules constellation. It's called the Arecibo message because that was the name of the giant radio telescope used to transmit it. The team that created the message was led by Dr. Frank Drake with assistance from Carl Sagan. The message was 1,679 binary digits that could be converted to an image designed to convey information about civilization on Earth. It starts with a representation of the numbers one through 10. This provides a key to the rest of the message. Next, atomic numbers of hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and phosphorus, which are used to make up DNA. Carbon is at the top because it's the most dominant in forms of life. The message shows more information about DNA, including the double helix structure. For the bottom, a figure of a human, its average height, and the population of the Earth, which was a little over 4 billion at the time. Next, our solar system starting with the Sun and moving out to Pluto. The Earth is shifted up to identify the planet sending the signal. At the bottom, a graphic representing the Arecibo radio telescope. Now, the nearest star that could possibly receive the message is 25,000 light years away. So we couldn't really expect a reply for another 50,000 years. But on the morning of August 14th, 2001, a formation was discovered right next to the Chilbolton radio telescope. Now, even if you don't know the full design, when you're on the ground, you can tell you're in a crop circle. There's structure and uniformity to it. But this new formation was different. It was a mess. It wasn't symmetrical. Nobody could make sense of it until it was viewed from the air. Holy sh A face. And three days later, this appeared. This became known as the Arecibo Answer. Ay, Chihuahua! The formation uses the same 23 by 73 grid. The top line shows the numbers 1 through 10, just like the original, but the reply shows silicon as the main element for life, not carbon. Their DNA is shown as having a third string. In the center is a humanoid figure about 4 feet tall with a large head, and their population is about 21 billion. Below the figure is their solar system. They appear to occupy three objects in the system, the third and fourth planets, and then there's another shape that could mean a planet or some other object or structure. On the human Arecibo message is a picture of the radio telescope, which was used to send the message. Whoever sent the reply seems to understand this. So what is this design meant to represent? Well, just a year earlier, this formation appeared in the same place. Is this the same object? Is this crop formation a representation of a machine used to communicate through space? Again, frustrated researchers and skeptics agree on something. Why don't they just speak English? Well, almost exactly one year later, this formation appeared. <laughs> my brain, my brain just exploded. Once again, we see a face, but that's not a human face. And just like the Arecibo message was broadcast in binary code, the disk formation also contains binary code. And for the first time, we get an actual literal message. The code was translated to letters using ASCII, the encoding standard for electronic communication. Beware the bearers of false gifts and their broken promises. Much pain, but still time. Believe, there is good out there. We opposed to deception. Conduit cl close. Whoever it is that wants to communicate with us is using many different means. In 2004, Robert Ridge was deer hunting a few miles outside of Roswell, New Mexico. Half buried in the dirt, he found a strange rock. On the rock is a geometric carving. Robert grabbed it and didn't think it was anything more than a cool rock someone lost at some point. But he didn't keep it a secret. He showed it to friends and anyone who was curious about it. It didn't take long before strange discoveries were made about the rock. For one, it's magnetized lodestone, which is not a kind of rock found in that area. And under a microscope, the Roswell rock is extremely smooth. 
There's no carving marks or indication of sandblasting. But the most fascinating discovery is that in 1996, eight years before the Roswell rock was found, this crop formation appeared. The designs match up. Some people think this design is a message. Others think it's a map. Still, others think the Roswell rock, the Arecibo answer, and all crop circles are nothing but a hoax. But who would create such elaborate hoaxes, and why? Well, in 1991, we would get the answer when a British newspaper ran a front page story with the headline, The Men Who Con the World. Oh no. On September 9th, 1991, two retirees in their 60s confessed to starting the crop circle phenomenon in 1978. Doug Bauer said the idea came to him one night in a pub. He was living in Queensland in 1966 when the Tully UFO left behind that circle of reeds. Doug thought it would be fun to trick people into thinking UFOs were landing in wheat fields in southern England. He enlisted the help of his friend Dave Chorley. All they needed to make a crop circle was a wood plank, a bit of rope, and a twisted piece of wire. At first, their designs were simple and crude, but over time they became more and more complex. And you could uh, center this through this ring, walk straight towards it, and lo and behold, you've got the lovely straight line that you could wish for. International media picked up the story, and the mystery was solved. Crop circles were nothing more than a couple of amiable old fellows playing a prank, and that was that. That's it? And the story? It's kind of disappointing. Oh, we're just getting started. Oh, go on. Doug and Dave might have created a few crop circles, but their story has a lot of holes. They demonstrated their circle-making technique, and the results were janky. Most crop formations, even back then, were much more precise. Doug and Dave's formations were out of alignment every time. The more complicated the design, the worse the formations were. During one demonstration for a news crew, Doug attempted to reproduce one of his circles and accidentally made it twice as big as it should have been. Then he just gave up on making it. And their story changed over time. They said they started making circles in 1976. Then it was 1975. Then it was 1978. In fact, they never could agree on the year they actually started. Now, they claimed to have created certain circles and then later said they didn't, but they helped people who did. And Doug and Dave said they created this famous crop circle in 1983 called the Cheesefoot Head Circle. Doug showed a diagram of it, but his diagram had footpaths in it. The circle had no paths. It had no disturbances of any kind. When asked how they created the circle without making tracks in the crop, Doug said they pole vaulted into the field. Whoa, 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 whoa. Did you just say pole vaulted? Yep. He said in an interview that you should have seen us running through the fields with our sticks sailing over the corn. Yeah, I would like to see that, actually. Oh, me too, pal. Apparently, these men in their 60s pole vaulted into fields carrying their wood boards. They laid down a perfect crop formation and pole vaulted out again. Now, Doug looks pretty fit for an older guy, but he's getting winded walking in a circle. Pole vaulting seems a little outside of his athletic range. They also added details to their story as other crop circles were found. One day, a couple of people investigating a circle told Doug they were looking for a jelly-like substance that was found in a formation. Doug told them it was probably waste ejected from a plane. Later, Doug had a story about making a crop circle, and while he was doing it, he got hit in the head with a piece of frozen waste ejected from a plane's toilet. And he called those Boeing bombs. Right. Yeah, big old frozen chunk of poopy. He stumbled back to his car, dazed with blood trickling down his face. The problem is, planes don't dump waste over that area. It would be illegal, dangerous, and disgusting. Another story came out about people finding bits of metal thought to be meteorites at crop formations. Soon after that, Doug and Dave's crop circles had little bits of iron scattered all around. So, a few things. Did Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley create some crop circles? Yes. When Doug and Dave came forward, about 1,500 crop circles had been seen in at least 23 countries. Oh, well, you can't pole vault to Belgium. Right, even Doug couldn't do that. But they inspired a lot of copycats. Soon, most crop formations were man-made. So, is there a scientific way to tell if a crop circle is not a hoax, but genuine? There is. Most crop formations are man-made. The vast majority are. And there are telltale signs of this. Sometimes spotting a man-made crop circle is as simple as finding a footpath through the field leading up to the design. But often crop formations intersect the lines made by tractors called tram lines, which can hide tracks. To spot a hoax, we look at the plants themselves. 
Man-made crop circles done by flattening plants with boards are destructive to the plants. You'll see cracks and bruises on the stalks. On the ground, the crushed plants look messy. The leaves and flowers will be mashed to the ground. Marks will be visible on only one side of the plant where it was stomped by a plank of wood. Many of those marks are creases where you can actually bend the stalk. Genuine crop circles don't look like this at all. First, the lay of the pattern will flow like water. There's a gentleness to it, an elegance. And many times the stalks are layered and even braided. In genuine crop circles, most plants aren't damaged. They'll continue to grow horizontally and then after a few days, return to their vertical position. In this formation found in May 2005, the flowers weren't damaged at all. They were somehow laid down gently. A group of clumsy men with wooden boards couldn't do this. We know this because it was tried. A group of crop circle makers attempted to reproduce this formation. From the air, it looks pretty good. But on the ground, the man-made version is a mess. The plants are trashed. A formation in 2003 was especially puzzling. In parts of the design, the plants weren't completely flattened. They were bent a few inches from the top. It's been described as like the grooves of a record. How do you make this with planks and rope? You don't. You don't. Another sign of a genuine circle can be seen, especially in wheat. In late summer, when wheat turns gold, the kernels become heavy and bend over from the weight. They also become stiff and are impossible to straighten. But the wheat within a crop circle, the kernels have straightened out and can't be bent. So what would do this? Radiation. Wheat stalks are separated by structures called apical nodes. These are like the knuckles on your fingers. In the 1990s, biophysicist William Levengood started analyzing plants taken from crop circles. His team found the nodes in crop circle wheat were elongated, and in many cases they were ruptured. Oh, a rupture on an elongated node? I think they make a cream for that. This rupture is called an expulsion cavity. The only way this could be replicated is with bursts of microwave radiation. The way your microwave oven works is it heats up water, fats, and sugar in food. Microwave energy is heating up the water in the wheat stalk nodes. The water turns to steam and then they burst, just like popcorn. Now you can't fake this. It happens to the plant internally. There's no way you could hoax that. People who claim to have witnessed crop circles being made, and there's quite a few witnesses, report seeing a mist over the pattern immediately after it's formed. This mist is actually steam coming from the plants that were flash heated by microwave radiation. While experimenting with radiation, Levengood found crop circle seed had a huge increase in growth compared to non-crop circle seed. By exposing seeds to short, controlled bursts of radiation, they grow bigger and faster than seeds not exposed to radiation. Another experiment showed that wheat harvested from within a crop circle has a much higher amount of protein than wheat outside the circle. So there's evidence that whatever energy is used to create crop formations is leaving residual traces of this energy in the area. Some crop formations are covered in a dusting of microscopic spheres of magnetized iron, specifically meteorite iron. Researchers call this a magnetic glaze. These spheres are usually found around the perimeter of a formation, and they're distributed linearly, not randomly. Because the iron particles are magnetized perfect spheres, it means they were melted and formed within a highly energetic magnetic field. When people are inside crop formations, many are affected by electromagnetic radiation. Just look at this. As part of an experiment, a woman with an enlarged thyroid sat in a crop formation for two and a half hours. While being monitored by a doctor, her thyroid shrunk by 40%. Often cameras, watches, and other electronic devices stop working inside a crop circle. In fact, pregnant women and people with pacemakers are discouraged from going near one. Now, to skeptics, all this talk about energy sounds woo-woo, but I just showed you the real effects on plants and people. Now, it's fair to say that the elongated nodes and growth rates of wheat could be a coincidence. It's also fair to say that the physical reactions experienced by people could be psychosomatic, all in their minds. But skeptics, how do you explain this? 
These are called ghost formations or ghost circles. This is when the design of a crop formation is still visible after the field has been plowed. Sometimes a ghost formation remains through the following season. Sometimes it remains for two years before finally fading. But this doesn't happen with all crop formations. Nobody knows why, but it could have something to do with where the patterns are found. A study was done in the early 2000s of all the crop circles in southern England found that year. The study showed that 98% of all non-man-made formations were over chalk aquifers. And by the way, chalk aquifers can be used for generating electricity. Everything keeps pointing back to electromagnetism. If there's an epicenter for crop formations in southern England, it's Silbury Hill. Silbury Hill was built thousands of years ago. It's 129 feet tall and covers an area of about five acres. Nobody agrees on what it was originally used for, but every year crop formations appear near it, sometimes right next to it. And by the way, the whole thing is one giant pile of chalk. Not far from Silver Hill is Stonehenge. Crop circles appear there too. One of the most famous of these is called the Stonehenge Surprise. On Sunday, July 7th, 1996, this formation appeared mere feet from Stonehenge. It's been called one of the most complex and spectacular crop circle designs ever seen. The design is a Julia set, a type of fractal. Fractals are visual representations of mathematic formulas that repeat themselves at different scales. Zoom way in or way out, the pattern is the same. Look at how close Stonehenge is to the formation. Look at the visibility. Stonehenge has 24-hour security. The guards saw nothing unusual the night before. Crop formations also appear near Avebury, which is in the same area. The Avery Henge is massive, twice the size of Stonehenge. Now, a ley line is believed to be an invisible path or energy line that connects sacred sites. Ley lines are thought to create a network of energy across the Earth, influencing the flow of energy and aligning with cosmic forces. The area around Stonehenge is on one of those ley lines. If crop formations are an attempt at communication, they're clearly using mathematic concepts. And this would make sense. Math is a universal language. But what do the messages mean? What story do they tell? Are crop formations proof of space travel? Do they offer an explanation for space travel? Are crop formations a map? Are they blueprints for a machine? Well, the answer to all those questions is yes. Over the years, crop formations got more and more complex. What started out as simple circles became patterns like this. This is the famous Milk Hill Galaxy Spiral found in 2001. The spiral consists of 409 perfect circles, a thousand feet across, spread over 700,000 square feet. And look at how clean the design is. That's not even flat ground. This formation is a hard one for skeptics to deal with. Remember, England is pretty far north. In the summer, the days are very, very long. The night the spiral was made, there was only about four hours of darkness. It would take a huge crew of people to lay down this pattern in four hours. And by the way, it was raining the night it appeared. You'd think the field would be full of muddy footprints by the army of hoaxers it would take to make this. But nope, the Milk Hill Spiral is pristine. Fractals are a common theme with crop formations. Geometric shapes and other expressions of mathematic functions are also quite common. Even complex math problems are expressed. Squaring the circle is a problem in geometry first proposed in Greek mathematics. Squaring the circle involves using a compass and a ruler to create a square and circle with the same area. Now this has been proven impossible since calculating the area of a circle requires using pi. And if you remember your math lessons, pi is an irrational number, meaning it can never be exact. So you can never get the area of a circle to equal the area of a square. But there are methods that allow you to get close. And these methods have been seen in crop formations for years. Crop formations often use other mathematic concepts, like the golden ratio and Fibonacci numbers. Here's a formation that, when it appeared, people found very confusing. Then a mathematician solved it. It's a representation of pi out to 10 decimal places. The lengths of the arcs represent each digit. There's even a decimal point and an indication that the number continues forever. But there are also designs that, at first glance, look like geometry, but not exactly right. That's when some researchers had the idea to stop looking and start listening. This particular circle resembles what's called a cymatic pattern. A 
A cymatic pattern is a shape that forms when sound waves vibrate a material like water or sand. Ernst Klodny was a German physicist and musician who documented cymatic patterns. He proved that different sound frequencies create different patterns and these patterns could be predicted and repeated. Could the builder of this crop circle be telling us that this sound frequency has special meaning? If it does, how do we apply it? Well, let's look for more clues. In 2011, this double spiral formation appeared on Windmill Hill, the location of another ancient site. The same day, another double spiral appeared near Stonehenge, just a few miles away. Dr. Jerry Croth thought these formations could represent neutron stars. And although it's very rare, sometimes neutron stars collide and form a magnetar. What makes magnetars unique is their incredibly strong magnetic fields, which are among the strongest known in the universe. These magnetic fields are thousands to billions of times stronger than those of neutron stars. A magnetar's gravity is so strong that it dramatically warps space-time around it. In theory, this warping of space-time could lead to an Einstein-Rosen bridge, better known as a wormhole. A wormhole, again in theory, can connect two very distant points in space, essentially creating a shortcut that allows you to travel to a location faster than light could get there in a straight line. Now, I'm aware this is a lot of in theory and possibly and maybe regarding these crop formations. After all, magnetars are so rare that in the entire galaxy, only 10 have ever been found. Well, 11. Because the following day, Literally, the day after these crop formations appeared, a new magnetar appeared. I don't mean it was always there and was just discovered. I mean, it wasn't there yesterday, and it's there today. Then in 2022, this crop formation appears. Two sections of concentric rings connected by a line. It's been theorized that this represents a wormhole. It shows two points in space surrounded by warped space-time and then a portal between. The outer ring represents the bending of space-time. Now, maybe this crop formation is just a design with no special meaning, but that would be rare. Almost all crop formations have a message or purpose. So let's assume for fun that all these messages are puzzle pieces, that when the pieces are fit together, they show proof of a wormhole and a map of how to get to it. But how, how do we do that? Well, that's the question that electrical engineer Nikola Romansky asked. Nikola saw this image of a crop circle that seemed to be meaningless. It didn't have a recognizable geometry. It wasn't symmetrical. But Nikola had an idea. He brought the shape into his 3D software and extruded it around the center axis, meaning he spun it around to make a shape. So Nikola found more crop formations and did the same thing. He rotated the designs around a central axis to create their shapes in 3D. And after a while, he had a collection of what appeared to be blueprints, instructions on how to create some kind of machine. <laughs> so what did he do? Well, what do you think he did? He built it. Ah! Nikola Romansky reached out to filmmaker Charles Maxwell and asked for help. Maxwell was working on a documentary about crop circles. Nikola needed help and funding to build his machine. This machine, he thought, was a vehicle that ran on zero-point energy, could alter gravity, and reach light speed. How can you not build it? So they enlisted 3D designers and machinists. They hired electricians and fabricators. It took over three years and they finally had their prototype. No! It didn't work. No. Well, they got some plasma to ignite, but they ran out of money. No. The entire process is in the documentary, which I linked below. The truth is, whatever they were building probably wasn't gonna work. But it's possible that Nikola was onto something. That the secret to zero point energy, gravity, and space time all comes down to one thing, spin. Whenever government whistleblowers describe reverse engineering UFOs, spin is always a core piece of the technology. According to Mark McCandlish, a former aerospace designer, UFO anti-gravity and propulsion are achieved by rotating liquid mercury. The infamous Nazi bell-shaped UFO de Glocka was said to use similar technology. Bob Lazar talked about studying element 115 when he worked at Area 51. E-115 is said to power alien spacecraft. And when Lazar made those claims in the 1980s, there was no such element. But in 2003, E-115 was discovered. A whistleblower came forward just a few weeks ago. He claims to have been a military contractor working on reverse engineering UFOs. 
He said their engines used counter-rotating cylinders with element 115 as the power source. Russian physicist Nikolai Kozarev believed the twisting and spinning of space-time called torsion was the secret to unlocking gravity and unlocking everything. In 2019, an engineer working for the US Navy filed a patent for a plasma compression fusion device. This is a machine that can generate a tremendous amount of power, like terawatts of power in a small package. The device is about the size of a car, but can put out as much energy as a nuclear power plant. If it's real, the energy is clean and unlimited. His invention is based on spin. The scientist is Salvatore Pais, and he currently works for the US Space Force. He's filed quite a few interesting patents on behalf of the United States government. Propulsion engines, room temperature superconductors, inertial mass reduction devices, and high frequency gravitational wave generators. This may sound like science fiction, but the US military is taking these patents very seriously. Every single one of them is based on spin. Now, I don't know if it's irony or poetic justice, but it could turn out that nature's most mysterious secrets like gravity won't be discovered in a lab. It's possible that unlocking the secrets of nature might be done in a field of wheat. Crop circles are a controversial subject. The history of the crop circle community, if that's what you want to call it, is filled with intrigue, lies, and double crosses. Today, if you bring up crop circles in any mainstream venue, you'll get eye rolls and laughter. But that wasn't always the case. At one time, crop formations were taken seriously by the media, the government, and the general population. A new type of science emerged called Seriology, named for Ceres, the goddess of agriculture and grain crops. Journals were created. Articles about crop formations were mainstream. Nick Pope spent over 20 years investigating UFOs for the British Ministry of Defense. He said the army started investigating crop circles in 1985. Then glyphs started to appear in Southern England in 1989, and crop formations were becoming complex. There seemed to be an intelligence at work. Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher asked her cabinet to find out what the hell was going on. The following summer, Operation Blackbird was launched. Blackbird was a three-week surveillance operation with the goal of filming a crop circle forming in real time. The project was planned by prominent crop circle researchers Colin Andrews and Pat Delgado. It was sponsored by the BBC and Japanese national television. Not only did the project have the blessing of the British government, but the crops to be filmed were on land owned by the Ministry of Defense. By working with the MOD, acres of farmland could be cordoned off to keep out hoaxers and prevent any genuine crop circles from being trampled by a curious and excited public. The military had every inch of the field covered with cameras. They had night vision and even infrared cameras to detect body heat. If a circle was going to form, it would definitely be seen. This was a huge event. Millions of people around the world watched. And every day, Colin Andrews would appear on TV and describe the day's events. On day two, a crop circle appeared. And Colin Andrews went on television and spoke very enthusiastically about the discovery. And then everything came crashing down. The formation was a hoax. Not just a hoax, but an embarrassing one. The design was crude and placed in the center of the circle was an astrology board game. Colin Andrews, a serious investigator and the face of the crop circle phenomenon, was humiliated. Somebody's had a laugh, they've had a joke, they've actually done none of us any good, but sets these sort of things uh, only set the research back. In the span of an afternoon, the field of crop circle research went from mainstream science to fringe theory, and it's been there ever since. Hang on. What? If the army had the whole thing blocked off and covered with cameras, uh, how come they didn't see nothing? It was a setup. It was a setup. Well, allegedly. Totally a setup. Colin Andrews believes, and I think there's plenty of evidence to support his theory, that the army intentionally wanted to discredit him and the entire crop circle phenomenon. That doesn't mean the military didn't believe in crop formations. Quite the opposite. At the same exact time the highly public Operation Blackbird was going on, the army was running a secret surveillance operation a few miles away on Silbury Hill. In fact, they allegedly had film of bright orbs flying over the fields just to the south of the hill. But this operation only became known later. It appears that Blackbird was sleight of hand. Get the public focused on Blackbird, while the real operation took place a few miles away. Even now, when crop circles or glowing orbs appear, it's not uncommon for military helicopters to show up. Not only do the helicopters patrol the area, but they'll also chase the orbs around the countryside. 
Clearly, the military believes that crop formations are something more than simple hoaxes. But after the Blackbird fiasco, none of this mattered. Crop circles were debunked, and Colin Andrews became a fringe character. Colin's partner, Pat Delgado, was so disheartened by the Blackbird hoax that he retired and gave up his research. Uh, sounds like Deep State wins again, eh? But that's not the end of the story. Go on. Colin Andrews may have become fringe in the public's eye, but he was a serious investigator, and crop circles were a real phenomenon. Even without mainstream support, he continued his work, and plenty of people supported him. Believers in crop circles were now fringe believers, but they still believed. This could be a problem for the government. They couldn't allow crop circles back into the mainstream, so British intelligence began a disinformation campaign, and to help them spread disinformation, they brought in the best. CIA. CIA. In his 1999 book, Cosmic Top Secret, The Unseen Agenda, author John King got Colin Andrews to sit for an interview. Colin knew that the only way hoaxers could get onto that field during Blackbird was if it was an inside job. When Colin made the announcement that a crop circle appeared, he hadn't even seen it yet. It was pitch black. He was pressured to make the announcement, so he did. He didn't report what he had seen with his own eyes. He reported what was described to him by the army. As soon as the sun came up, he knew it was a hoax, but there was nothing he could do. He had a deal with the military that they would provide people, equipment, and land, but he had to cooperate with them. A big mistake. You shake hands with the military industrial complex, you're making a deal with the devil. Yep. According to Colin, phase one of the disinformation campaign was to debunk crop circles with Operation Blackbird. Phase two was Doug and Dave, who showed up a year later. Doug Bauer and Dave Chorley admitted to being the makers of crop circles, and to this day, that's the official explanation. Colin doesn't think they're part of the intelligence community, but he believes they were used by and compensated by people in the IC. They were paid? Oh yeah, they were paid thousands of dollars for their story. We know this for a fact because they were only paid half up front. They had to sue for the other half. Deal with the devil. Next came phase three. A freelance journalist named Jim Schnabel arrived on the scene. According to Colin Andrews, Schnabel was CIA. Now, James Schnabel was not an official CIA officer, but he certainly could have been an agent. If you search his name in the CIA database, you'll get plenty of hits. And Schnabel's name is always connected to paranormal cases like crop circles and remote viewing. Anyway, Schnabel was conducting private interviews with everyone involved with Blackbird and with other crop circle researchers. He was driving wedges between people, misquoting them, and pushing the narrative that crop circles were debunked. Colin Andrews became convinced of Schnabel's CIA involvement during a spooky conversation. Schnabel had recorded and read to Colin the details of private conversations Colin had one evening while sitting in his car, alone. And Colin Andrews has other evidence that he was being bugged and surveilled. It has to do a lot with invoices and stuff, and I'll link below if you want the specifics. Uh, he literally has the receipts. He has the receipts. And look, it's very, very common for the CIA to use journalists as assets. More common than people think. People talk to journalists, so they're useful at collecting intel. And people listen to journalists, so they're great at spreading disinformation. You may have heard about Operation Mockingbird. This was a project where over 400 American journalists were working as direct assets for the CIA. Carl Bernstein exposed how at least 10 journalists and editors at the New York Times were CIA operatives for years. And this is still happening right now and I can prove it. But covering that and Operation Mockingbird is a full episode. And if you'd like to hear the whole story, let me know in the comments. Now, whatever your favorite newspaper is or your favorite news channel is, Assume 10% of editors, reporters, and media personalities are working for the CIA or FBI in some capacity. Yes, it's that many. Well, JFK warned us this would happen. He certainly did. Colin Andrews remembers a direct approach from a CIA operative. He met a man who claimed to have seen a crop circle being formed while he was out one night studying foxes. Oh, sexy broads. No, actual foxes. Ah. The man used this story as a way of being accepted in the crop circle scene. People got used to seeing him around. Well, a few weeks later, this man knocks on Colin's door. They go for a walk, and the man asks Colin to... ...on and on. But Colin started to get annoyed when the man was asking if he knew if the Russians were involved. At the end of their talk, the man tells Colin, you're one of us now. I said, what do you mean? And he said, and this sounds even funny coming out of my mouth, but he said, CIA. 
The man told Colin that there was a large amount of money waiting for him in a Swiss bank account. All he had to do was state publicly that crop circles were a hoax. Colin could go on researching circles all he wanted. The CIA would help him become the number one crop circle expert in the world. They would give him special equipment. They would give him a staff. They would give him a budget. But when he came across a real crop formation, he was to call this man and nobody else. Colin Andrews passed on this offer, but the man harassed him with phone calls for a while after that. Soon the calls became so threatening that Colin contacted the British Ministry of Defense, but they said there was nothing they could do. What, what? Well, they said it was out of their jurisdiction. Oh, was he in England? Yep. That is a bunch of bullshit. Yeah, Colin was annoyed, but after a short time, the calls stopped. Eventually, Colin Andrews moved to the U.S., and here he was approached by a Pentagon analyst who introduced him to a writer named Rosemary Ellen Guiley. You might know her name from her many appearances on the Coast to Coast radio show. She wrote 49 books and even hosted her own radio show all about the paranormal. Colin said Rosemary went to, in his words, every extreme to try and convince him to co-author a book with her. And she wanted to work on the book in his office which would give her access to Colin Andrews' entire database on crop circles going back 30 years. She was persistent, but he turned her down. Colin is convinced, without a doubt, that Rosemary Guiley was a CIA asset. Again, Rosemary Guiley was the perfect candidate for an intelligence asset, especially since she was a regular guest on Coast to Coast, where she would be heard by millions of people. She would be allowed to continue her work in any way she wanted, but from time to time, she would be instructed to disseminate information provided by the intelligence community. It's more common than you think. So yeah, Rosemary Guiley was the perfect asset. Uh, I can't help but notice you're, uh, you're speaking about her in the past tense. Yeah, she died in 2019 at the age of 69. Yeah, that's, that's kind of young to die, isn't it? Isn't it? There's another Crop Circles character with an interesting story. John Lundberg is an English artist and documentary filmmaker who founded the website CircleMakers.org in the early 90s. He's responsible, or claims to be responsible, for some of the more elaborate crop formations that have been found over the years. On the Circle Makers website, which is still around, there are links to the many crop formations that the group takes credit for. There's no doubt that the Circle Makers created complicated and often very beautiful crop formations. But Crop Circle researchers Robert Hulse and David A. Caton think there's more to John than meets the eye. But in our opinion, the, the whole Circle Makers website and Lundberg and co are all part of a disinformation campaign, yep. possibly funded by government. Robert Hull said at one time, the Circle Makers website had a recruiting link that took you directly to the recruitment page for MI5, British Military Intelligence. Hulse believes that the Circle Makers group is funded by British intelligence and was specifically created to spread disinformation. Hulse believes the Circle Maker's goal is to muddy the waters and confuse serious crop circle researchers to make it as difficult as possible to determine what was and wasn't a genuine crop formation. Now, there's no hard evidence that the Circle Makers or its founder are connected to military intelligence. But in 2009, researcher Richard D. Hall dug into Lundberg's background and found a lot of interesting information. Lundberg got his master's from the Slade School of Fine Art in London in 1992. At this time, Slade was next door to the then-secret headquarters of MI5 at 140 Gower Street. It was literally next door. The two buildings shared a courtyard. Hall makes the point that intelligence agencies often recruit final-year college students. That's always been true and is still true today. Lundberg started making crop circles immediately after graduating. Hall notes that if you view the HTML source of CircleMakers.org, the second keyword is MI5. Now, that was in 2009, but even today, the site's keywords contain entries like MI5 and CIA. And something I just noticed while researching this episode, why is alleged CIA asset Jim Schnabel a keyword on this site? In 2004, the Circle Makers website teased Colin Andrews, who at the time was raising money for his research. Circle Makers said that if the fundraising fails, Colin could just join MI5 PSYOPs and retrain to be a crop circles maker. Now, PSYOPs is short for psychological operations which is the use of psychological techniques and tactics to influence the perceptions, attitudes, and behaviors of a group of people. And this is a type of strategic communication used by military intelligence and government organizations all the time. It sure is, just turn on the news. Well, that's true. If you spent an hour reading the news today, you consumed government intel. Believe me. 
Now, Hall acknowledges that these references to MI5 seem just too blatant, but he believes they're a double bluff. Meaning, if we sarcastically connect ourselves to the intelligence community, people will think we're joking. Nobody would be so obvious. But this is absolutely a real and effective PSYOPs technique. Hall found that the website was hosted in Pittsburgh. Now, at the time, and even today, to some degree, it's uncommon for British organizations to host their sites in the US. And Hall found that the administrative contact for the domain belongs to a colonel in the US Air Force. Now, it could be a coincidence, but the man has an unusual name. Now, I'm not going to name him here, but I'll link to Hall's research down below. Richard Hall looked into Circle Maker's finances, trying to figure out how they pay their bills. Lundberg had registered a couple of companies, but they were inactive. But there was an interesting quote on the Circle Maker's website. You'd be surprised how expensive running a successful website can be. Don't panic. We're not going to ask you for money. Our retainer, from sources we'd rather not disclose, has kept our virtual head above water. What does that mean? A retainer? From who? Who's financing them? Making crop formations is technically a crime. It's trespassing, vandalism, destruction of private property. What investor would fund that and become complicit in those crimes? Plus, there could be civil liability. If you create a crop circle and a bunch of strangers show up and tear up my field, I could sue you for that. Even if they're minor crimes and rarely prosecuted, it doesn't sound like a good investment. Hall did a land registry check on the apartment where Lundberg was living at the time. He found that technically, there are no apartments listed on the deed. Hall dug further and found that there are four apartments, including Lundberg's, that have their rents paid by the local government. So did Richard Hall reveal that John Lundberg is in fact an asset working in media whose job is to spread disinformation about crop circles? Well, the evidence Hall provides is purely circumstantial and coincidental, so there's no way to know for sure. In fact, some of Hall's evidence is so far-fetched, I left it out of this episode. But a few years after Richard Hall conducted his research, Lundberg directed a documentary. A documentary that I've referred to multiple times on this channel. It's called Mirage Men. Mirage Men covers Richard Doty, a retired special agent who worked for OSI, the United States Air Force Office of Special Investigation, Air Force Intelligence. Richard Doty is, according to Mirage Men, one of the chief architects of the military's campaign to disseminate lies to the UFO community. In other words, to spread disinformation. Doty's job was to muddy the waters, so UFO researchers wouldn't know what sightings were real and what were hoaxes. Now this is, according to Hall, Hulse, Caton, and many others, exactly what the circle makers have done and have been doing to the crop circles community for years. There's a reason why John Lundberg would make a great intelligence asset, and Rosemary Guiley, and James Schnabel, and countless other writers, journalists, and media figures. They already work in the paranormal community. They're trusted by that community. They continue to do their work, but every so often they spread a little bit of disinformation to that community. A little nugget to steer people away from the truth. This is why you shouldn't trust anyone in the media. Whether it's your favorite news anchor, TV show host, podcaster, blogger, or writer, be wary of anyone with influence. These media personalities may seem trustworthy. They may seem like they have your best interests in mind, but some of that is just a performance. Not all of it, but some of it is a performance designed to sway your opinion or even alter your entire belief system. The intelligence community does not want you to know the truth about crop circles, UFOs, secret space programs, or alien technology. That's a fact. Millions, perhaps billions of dollars are put into black budget programs designed to distract and confuse you from the truth. When CIA needs to spread disinformation, they look for trustworthy people with large audiences to deliver their message. So keep your eye out for clues. An intelligence operative, an agent, an asset could be anyone. Thanks so much for hanging out with us today. My name is AJ. You know Hecklefish. Hi. How are you? This has been The Y Files. That's gonna if you do have fun or learned anything, do us a favor, like, comment, subscribe, share. Like, that stuff. subscribe, and share. That stuff really helps the channel. Well, I hope you guys had fun. If anyone was alone for Thanksgiving tonight, I hope we brought a little, brought a couple of smiles to you. That's why we're here. I'll be here Christmas as well. Nobody should ever have to do it alone. JT, good to see you. Retro monger. Sees much. HP, HP is an asset. Okay. Paul, you caught that, did you? I don't know.
Uh, Donnie for 199. You really make my day, AJ, and loves Hecklefish. Thank you for the super chat. Thanks to everyone for super chatting tonight. Your support really helps. Um, please consider joining the Patreon for as little as three dollars a month. You really help out the channel, and you become part of a a great community. I and mean, you get two extra live streams every week just for you, where your camera's on, so you can talk to you can talk to everybody yourself, and it's not as crazy as this. Purple, good to see you. Marilyn and I had fun too. Now I'm stuffed. Now, now I need a nap. There's, there's, there's Jen. Final level for Dollar Nine Nine. Hell Illuminati also love from Phoenix, Arizona. All right. John Waltz, thank you for the twenty. Linda H, thank you for the ten. I agree, Don M. Nice way to end Thanksgiving. Thank you, no one. G Humphrey says hi, Jen. The uh, it, as soon as Cody, if you were here earlier, as soon as the stream went down and I had to restart it, now the audio is working perfectly, like a charm. Thank you, Carol. That was very kind. Dar nineteen ninety nine. I just want to say, support your well researched and well presented videos you post. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for your support, Dara. Oblivion, I th make, make Atlantis great again. That would be nice in a red hat. Make Atlantis great again. I'm, I'm MAGA, man. I'm MAGA. Make Atlantis great again. <laughs> There's me, me. Hey, we love the show. Chico, my doggy, wants to be on the show. We got a Hecklefish talking plush toy. Took a picture and sent it to the site. Well, maybe if you sent it in, you're probably at the end of the... Where's the most dangerous place to be in Vegas? Standing between Jen and a camera. <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Uh, Jay, that's, that's Jen waving. There she is. And there's Josh, there's Gino, Eric, and Chris to my left. All right, folks, thank you for the super chats. Hope to see you on Patreon. Another great way to support the channel is shop.thewifiles.com. Shop.thewifiles.com. I keep the gear cheap to make it accessible to everybody. Get our Black Friday sales tomorrow with all our new merch. Black Friday sale tomorrow with all the new merch. The dangler. The dangler. Cards. Cards. Sweaters. Dangler is keychain. It's called the dangler now. Sweater. The ugly Christmas sweater. Slippers. And the slippers. We have the slippers handy, don't we? Yes. I showed them All right, we'll, we'll, stay, we'll stay on one second to show the, the Hecklefish slippers. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, got, you have to have those. You have to have those. All right, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. I'll see you in a couple of days, and Hecklefish will sing you out. Turned off monetization. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The final okay. curtain. I thought you were My right. friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I swam down each. Each and every highway And more Much more than this I did it my way I've loved I've laughed and cried I've had my fill My share of losing And now as tears subside, I find it all, it's all so amusing. Do you think I did all that? And may I say, not in a shy way.
tonight. And take care of those waitresses, will you? All right, everybody get home safe. This is Hecklefish. And you know what? I did it. My.